start? Okay. So, uh, good morning. Th thanks for coming. In this talk, I'm going to talk and, and hope we, we all talk at the end with questions uh, about uh, SAST, uh, doing effective SAST, secure code analysis, CI CD. Uh, this is what we are going to see, uh, not going in a lot of detail here because we, we will see during the, the, the presentation, but just a, a high level view. Who am I? Uh, I'm Florencio. Uh, this is my email, uh, Twitter account. I work at Red Hat. I'm a secure uh, architecture team lead. Uh, I work with the product security uh, um, architects uh, that work with all product services in Red Hat to try to help with the, with the security. I'm, I'm a principal product security architect. I'm in information security science 1999. I saw a funny uh, Twitter thread, uh, I think, uh, yesterday or the other day, telling, okay, tell me your age with a command. So this is my age, adding plus plus to this uh, file. So the people who know will, will know. Some background. Uh, I, I have, since 1999, I have done a lot of different things in security. Uh, always, yeah, in, 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 in cybersecurity. Pen testing, had my own startup for some years, doing pen testing, forensics, expert witness. I attended like, attended like 10 trials defending my forensic analysis, IT, not opening corps. Uh, I was also an auditor, third party auditor, ISO 27001, GDPR with Thai. As ISO of a big company in Spain, supermarkets company, and now proud security, proud security architect at, at Red Hat. Just a bit of, of, of context. Well, now, what is SASTI? This is an acronym for Static Application Security Testing. When we talk about static, uh, we talk about analyzing an application without running it. So usually, uh, very usually, very frequently, we talk about analyzing the source code. I'm going to focus on analyzing the source code. But we can also talk about the static analysis when we analyze the binary without running the application, right? In fact, there are some mechanisms, strategies to analyze uh, binary code statically for sure. Uh, but here we are going to talk about testing uh, the source code and testing it to find security vulnerabilities or potential security vulnerabilities, right? We want to analyze the source code of an, of an application to find security vulnerabilities. This is one of the core practices in the secure development a framework Red Hat is, is working on. You have more information there and there. And I'll share the, the slides after the talk. Benefits of doing SAS. Why communities, why uh, companies, why orgs would uh, want to do SAS -T? Because at the end, any security activity we do uh, needs time, right? Needs time, needs effort, needs resources. So why uh, a community would want to do SAST? It allows to identify vulnerabilities early in the development process. It points uh, to specific lines of the code where the vulnerability is uh, versus other kind of uh, security analysis, dynamic application security testing, for example, or a pen test. Maybe you, we know that there is a, a vulnerability because we see the results of sending some payload and see the, the, the error or the behavior of the application. With SAST, we know the specific line where the, the, specific, where the vulnerability uh, is present. It is developer friendly if it is implemented correctly, and this is a lot of the reason of this talk, right? SASTI can be implemented in many different, in many different ways, and there are some that are uh, very, let's say, developer friendly, and some ways of implementing SASTI are not. Uh, it has a low entry barrier, right? It's, it's not expensive. There are open source tools and free open source tools that we can use to start, at least start doing SASTI. Um, it, high, it has a high coverage. Uh, SAST is usually done uh, with a lot of automation. There, there is manual work for sure to analyze the results and, and act upon them, but uh, the scan itself 
can be done automatically against uh, thousands of lines of code covering 100% of the, of the code, right? So no other kind of testing uh, does not have that coverage uh, in the same way with, with, that, with that level of effort. Also, it's easy to, to extend, and not only to extend, to adapt to the company. Uh, when doing SASTI, we have the possibility, and we will see, of uh, customizing the rules to the way the company develops. So that way, uh, we have better results. Also, in general, and this is true for any, uh, uh, any activity that, that improves the source code of an application. Uh, we are not talking only about confidentiality, right? So why does my front-end uh, need to do SAST or why my this application uh, needs to have better security if uh, this is not going to be used by the military or the NASA or whatever? But more security is also uh, more quality, is also more resiliency, right? We cannot have resiliency, we cannot have a good quality software if we, don't, if we don't have security. When we improve the security of a code base, we improve uh, the reliability of, of the source code. So, a lot of, of benefits if implemented correctly. And now, this is the other side. So, if this is so good, why not everyone is doing SASTI? Right? It's easy, 100% coverage, we know vulnerability, so we have solved the security problem, right, with, with SASTE. N no. Why? Because we have many problems when we implement SASTE. In general, uh, too many false positives. Uh, we run a SASTE application and we have uh, 100 findings that have to be reviewed. Uh, and many, many are false positives. Okay, this is not a security issue. The tool does not understand what we are doing. We have methods, functions that are cleaning the data. Uh, so the, the SASTI tool thinks here there is a SQL injection, but it, it, there is not because previously there was a function that we have coded that cleans the, the, the data. Too many out of context detections. Uh, a bit different in the sense that in this case, it's true that's a pattern that can be dangerous. We are using MD5, right? Uh, 50 findings of MD5 being used in different places of the application. Is that a security issue? Well, it depends. If we are doing the hash of the password and storing it, it does not sound like a good security practice, right? But if we are using it, maybe because we are uh, implementing a, ha a hash table ourselves and we need this identifier that is unique, it's okay, right? We, we can assume we don't need a better hash algorithm for that. So we may have many findings that are not security issues just because the application, the SAST uh, tool says there is a vulnerability there. Uh, because many times we implement SAST uh, without integrating it, uh, integrating the tool in the developer's workflow. If the developer needs to go to another application, to another dashboard, uh, to see the results, or needs to do an effort, a great effort to analyze the results, uh, maybe it, it depends on, on the company, right? Uh, right? But uh, they probably they will work on that the first weeks, but slowly, that friction in the process uh, will do that the developers stop using the tool. Okay, yes, we are doing SAST because we have these results there, but who, who is reviewing the results and acting upon them? That happens a lot. Or maybe we are using the wrong SAST tools. Uh, we cannot customize rules. They are uh, a black box, black box for us. That's, that's a problem to optimize the process. Rules are difficult to understand, they are there, but we cannot understand them. It's difficult to create, modify, remove the rules of the SASTI tool, or requires com compiling the source code before we can start doing SASTI. This is not really bad. Uh, there are great, great SASTI tools that require that the code compiles. Usually, they require that the code compiles because they have a, a way of working that reduces the number of false positives, which is really fantastic. So it's a trade-off here. Uh, 
I prefer to start doing such thing uh, since the first line of code uh, or when the code is incomplete. Uh, but there is a, a legit approach that is using this other kind of, uh, of tools. But that can be a problem for the company if their workflow does not understand that the code needs to be compiled. I'm going to talk about, uh, about a tool just because uh, I, I'll explain the characteristics, but any, any tool with these characteristics will work, would work, right? It's, it's not the tool, the important thing here, uh, what I want to transmit is that the process is what is important. But why, for example, this kind of tool? It's open source, uh, we have uh, the opportunity, well, you know, uh, the, the benefits of, of that. It's fast when scanning, can be, run, can be run since the first line of code. It's easy to write rules, modify. We can, we can have even our own rule set from scratch, uh, but they provide many open source rules already, which uh, once we can start and can be integrated very easily in, in I, I guess, any kind of CI CD pipelines. Trivial also to, to, to install and to execute. This, this is just an example of an execution. Uh, this is the rule set uh, we are using, uh, an OWASP top 10 rule set just for, for the example. It is provided by the uh, by the community, and there is also a company behind this, this tool. Uh, it's about security, because what this tool does is analyze code, and it also has other, other kind of rules, like linting rules, quality, best practices. Uh, I'm going to focus on the security rules, and that's why I'm using this rule set. Um, it is, we are indicating that we want Sarif results. Sarif is a, is a uh, it's a kind of format, it's JSON, right? But with some specific attributes uh, focused on security. And it's becoming a standard. If we have our results in Sharif format, uh, it's quite probable we are going to be able to upload directly to ingest this, this file in a, in a different tool. For example, Defect Dojo, to, to manage findings, to uh, manage defects, it can be ingest by, by defect dojo and all the data is parsed and put in, in the correct uh, places. So it's as easy as uh, cloning a repo and executing, installing and executing this command ag against this repo. This is the first thing we have in the, in the output. Uh, it is, so here it is indicating the kind of files uh, I'm using for this example, uh, PyGoat is an open source vulnerable application written in Python, so it is on purpose uh, vulnerable. So I wanted to have findings for sure, uh, and I use that as an example. And here, uh, Semerek is saying, okay, uh, I have 140 rules for Python, 65 rules for JavaScript, and so on, so go, so and, and see, and this is, and for the rest the same, on this number of files. So I have 100 files in HTML, 53 files in Python, right? So at the end, uh, 597 uh, tasks. I think uh, this was run in like one minute, two minutes. Uh, not a very big project for sure. Uh, and it found. Uh, 20, 23, 23 findings. So, how are the, this is a uh, This is a, a section of a of the of a Sari file of the output. This is the kind of results that we get with a SASTI tool. Uh, we get a, a hash. This hash uh, identifies the finding and can be used for managing false positives, right? If we, if we have this, for example, this has, we put it on a, on a file and we use it like a post process, just remove these findings uh, from the SARI file the next time because we already know they, they are false positives. That's a way of managing false positives, right? We have that information in one. In number uh, two, we have the place in which 
folder and file, the, this vulnerability, this is a section for one finding, right? One, one potential vulnerability. Uh, in this case, pgoat introduction APIs, right? Uh, then we have the exact uh, place in the code, a starting line, end line, 59, from 9, 59 to 65. This is the code. Here is not well uh, mm, uh, parsed, let's say, so we can see the code directly in the, in the source code, but we, we know the exact place. And then we have the, the text of the vulnerability found a user control request, so a request data that comes from a user, and it is the direct, directly used in a write function, right? Sounds like a security issue. Something that comes from the user is dirty, and it is used without cleaning. That's the kind of vulnerability uh, this, fi this, uh, this finding is about. And we have an ID of the rule Python Django security injection, blah, blah, that identifies the specific uh, vulnerability that has been found. This is one of the 23, for example, in this, uh, in this execution. As it is JSON, we can uh, process the file quite easily and, and work with it. And something maybe you miss is the severity the tool thinks uh, or the tool assigns to the finding. In this case, it's an error. Many rule sets in, in SEMGREP uh, has a severity of error, warning, and informational. Not that, good, not that good in my personal opinion. I would prefer like critical importance, something like that, but that's the rule set. If we don't like it, we can, we can do a different one. So we have executed a SAS tool. Are we doing SAS-T? No, we are not doing SAS-T. Right? Just running a tool against a source code, a code base, is not doing SAST. Just by running a tool, we are not improving the security posture of the application, right? So uh, we need to do something else. SAST is a process, right? To implement SAST, for, for it to work, it sounds like more effort. But if we don't establish the process, the workflow, uh, we won't get the results, and if we, we do, uh, don't get the results, uh, we will uh, stop doing this very fast. So, how an ideal SASTI process uh, would be? We, can, we need to do these scans automatically. Uh, uh, if we want to put the results as close to the developers as possible, and is what we want, uh, we, would put, we would do SASTI for each merge request. Maybe for a smart request, we don't have a lot of context of how the application works, but for sure, uh, uh, the findings are close to the developers, and we will have more probabilities than the people are acting upon them. If not, we also can do, for example, whole code base uh, scans and schedule intervals. It's another approach that maybe works uh, as good as uh, putting the scans in merge requests. Then we need to analyze the results. There is no way we can avoid this step. Uh, we, need to, we need to understand what is the finding, and we need to classify uh, the findings depending on the severity, right? Because it's not the same to have critical issues like uh, low impact uh, res results. We need to track the results, and this is also a key uh, thing to do if we want a successful SAS program and not a failing SAS program, right? We have to put the results as close to the developers as possible. And this is where we need to adapt to the company, to the org, to the community, uh, where we want to, to use SAS-T. Uh, is the community using uh, GitHub, issue, GitHub or GitLab issues to manage the findings, to improve the code? Then there is where we should put the, the results of SASTI. Are they using Jira? Are they using Baxilla? Uh, any other kind of system? We need to put the results where the developers work. That's essential if we want that this, oops, that this works. And we need a final step uh, that is improving the process. We need to 
remove the false positives and modify the rules. These two parts are essential if we want a successful SASTI program. If we don't have an easy and agile workflow to add, uh, add, identify false positives, uh, so, okay, maybe it's okay to have 100 findings the first time we run SASTI and 90 of them being false positives. Maybe it's fine for the first scan, but not for the second. For the second scan, we need to have classified these 90 findings as false positives so developers don't get these same uh, findings again and they need to review, triage these 100 findings uh, once. Uh, if we try to do that, that process uh, with time uh, uh, will stop. Also, we need to adapt the rules, right? Sometimes we cannot just say, okay, this is a false positive. Uh, identifying false positives in the code is some, sometimes uh, complex because uh, how do you identify so, so, uh, a finding? We had a has, okay, it's true, but that has is probably related to the place, the lines in the code, uh, the, the structure, and maybe we add a line and the has changes. So it's difficult to, to always say, okay, this is a false positive. So the other option we have is uh, uh, to remove the rule or change the rule. So for example, maybe in our project, it, it does not make sense to have this rule that identifies MD5 as a vulnerability. Or maybe we want to reduce the severity of that one uh, to low because our uh, context. We need to be able to modify and work on the rules. That's uh, also very, very important. So now I'm going to show briefly some examples of uh, GitHub and GitLab are already providing to communities the possibility of doing SASTI quite easily. It's just enabling these options and knowing how they work and start working with them. So try them on your, on your own projects is my, my suggestion, let's say. Uh, in, in GitHub there is an option, uh, just set up code scanning in one. Uh, it, it is a, a, a workflow and at the end in GitHub it means a GitHub action. They even have a, an existing uh, GitHub action for, uh, that in, uh, uses uh, SEMgrep. This uh, GitHub action that we are enabling um, and uses uh, SEMgrep behind, uh, we can just also write it, right? Customize it. Uh, if we need more functionality, because at the end GitHub has, has uh, some different licenses and it offers more things in one license and less in others, but we can use our own GitHub uh, action with our worker that uses SEMgrep or other static analysis tool and does whatever we need to adapt to the process of the, of the community. That is what is really, really important. In GitLab, very similar, they have included uh, really a, a static uh, application security testing, uh, just when you create a new project, and you have the results automatically for the, each merge request, you have a SARI file, and GitLab by default again uses SEMgrep. Well, not in, the, in GitHub, it was not by default, it, it was if you choose it, but in, in GitLab uh, uses uh, SEMgrep in this case. And we can also write our own integrations. For example, if we have a community that works in, in Jira or an org that works in Jira, it's trivial to parse the, the Sarif results and using the Jira API, just create an epic uh, with, all the, uh, with all the findings uh, extracted from the Sarif file, right? The, in which file? Uh, a summary of the vulnerability and, and which line and the content of each one, more, more information. So the, the important thing here is to adapt uh, to the way of working and put the results as close to the developers as possible. Uh, managing false positives, it depends a lot on the, on the tool that you finally use. 
Uh, same grep has some options, ignoring files and folders, for example, if there are files and folders that we don't uh, want to scan because, uh, for example, are um, vendor, uh, code that comes from, uh, from a dependency, for example, and we don't want to analyze them, or examples, or testing code, we can ignore those folders, or we can do something custom to, to remove the false positives from the SARI files. This is just uh, syntax from Sengreb. Um, and listing, having the false positives identified with the hash is something that the uh, uh, Sengreb uh, open source uh, option does not include, but we can do something custom with, uh, with the code. About custom rules, that is very important and a strong point in this kind of, of tools. In this case, they have, um, they have some uh, commercial uh, rules, but they have uh, some open source rules with LGPL uh, in a repo. We can fork, mirror, and work on that uh, to remove, add, uh, whatever we need to adapt to our, our case. And this is, for example, this is the syntax of the of SEMREP rules. As you see, really, really easy. It is, uh, they are YAML files with a, an ID. The languages this rule applies. This helps to, for the scan to be faster because uh, SEMREP only applies the rules to the language. Uh, they are four. We can have also generic rules, but in general, it's better to have rules adapted, the message. And the pattern, the pattern is the most important part of the rule. Here is like, like a trivial rule. Uh, it says, it's not just, just a grep, right? Although it has grep in the name, it, it has a, a parsing, let's say, a functionality. It says, here's some, this is a placeholder for any vulnerability. A, a, a constant token is, so the, the, the word is, and then the, this, is, this means any valid st statement in Python. So if we have a variable is and any valid statement, this uh, rule triggers a finding. This is a more advanced rule, and the key why we need, um, or, or the, uh, a kind of rule that shows how we can adapt this to our custom code. Uh, here we identify, uh, Patterns that are sources, so a source mean, uh, means wh where we get information from the user, so the, so the result of that is uh, dangerous, right? So if we have this, monitor the result of this. Then we have the sync. If we get something, some data here and we use it directly here in one of those patterns, we have a vulnerability. So if we get some data with this and use it here, we have a vulnerability. But if the result of this pass through this function, it's okay. That's not a vulnerability, right? We have sanitizing functions, cleaning functions. So this has this functionality, this is called tainted analysis, that if we use our own framework, our, our own cleaning functions, we can customize our uh, rules to reduce the number of false positives, right? Let's see it with an example. Sembre has a playground. This is the rule. This is an example code and another example code. In this case, we get some data. This data is dangerous, but it is clean here. So when it is used here, there is no finding. In this case, this is highlighted because data is get here and used here without sanitizing. We have we have a highlight. This is a finding, right? This is the way we can uh, create our own rules and um, and reduce the number of false positives. So this is last slide. Uh, then uh, we can do some questions uh, if there are. Uh, so at the end, we, we, we have bad SASTI and, and good SASTI. Bad SASTI, when results are not processed, good when they are processed and we act upon them, so we really reduce, uh, the, we really uh, improve the security posture of uh, our application. But when results are far from developers, 
uh, stored in a different application, good when they are close to the developers, uh, bad when there is no a, way, a clear way of managing false positives, uh, good if we give that possibility to, to, code, uh, to programmers, rules are hard coded or difficult to change, that's bad, good if we, we can customize, uh, bad when it is slow, so two days or 12 hours uh, to stop a merge request, we, we cannot do that, right? Uh, we cannot stop a merge request for, for being available uh, hours. Uh, we are talking about minutes. If we want to do this in merge request, a uh, good SASD when it is fast, a uh, few, few minutes. And in general, bad SASD when we think SASD is deploying a tool and having results somewhere. And good SASD is when we have results that we use to improve the security of our application. Much, much more better, less results that we use to improve the application than many results that we, that we don't use for anything, right? And thank you. Uh, that's it. No. Yes. So the question, repeat the question, yes, and also to see if I understood it. Uh, the question is if we can use it for, uh, for other languages or other use cases. Yes, totally, uh, for uh, uh, infrastructure as code as Terraform, there are already existing rule sets. It has already rule sets, and for sure we can use our own custom rules too, yes. Uh, I, would, I would say it's semantic, semantic grep, but uh, not official answer, I'm not sure. Yeah, is it possible when you create the rules to differentiate between the role levels? I mean, something blocker, critical, minor? Yes, we can establish our own uh, severity for the rules. And Yes, that, that should be, that is not only about the tool, but the, let's say the process that uh, is something that GitHub or GitLab should allow us to, to do. And in fact, they do, again, depend on the licensing, but it's exactly how I think it should be done. If it is critical or maybe important or critical, maybe block the merge request, and if not, uh, let it uh, go. There is another approach that is very interesting and some uh, orgs do, that is having two sets of rules, the mature and immature ones. So the mature ones are they directly used by, by the developers and the immature ones are only used by, by few uh, security people. So, the, so they don't generate immature, generate many false positives. So we have, there, uh, there is a process to, to promote rules from the mature set to the mature set. So when they stop generating many false positives because they are tuned, they are moved to the mature set of rules. That way we reduce the, no, the noise in the developer, uh, developer's team. If there is a security and, and developer's team, to separate that. If everyone is developer, like many cases in, in communities, it's maybe it's a different approach, but this is also done sometimes.
Yes. So, uh, as I understand the, quen the question is, uh, what happens if we, we have uh, to analyze, let's say, we, we see a false positive in, a, in an area of the code, but, but then uh, we have the same issue in another area, and also what happens if uh, code changes, if we, can, we should analyze, if we can analyze only the difference. Uh, um, okay, we, we are just uh, finished this one. Uh, we are out of time. Just um, if it is a false positive, uh, it can mean it is a false positive uh, in this specific section, and we use we 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 do that. We stop saying this is a finding here, but in other place we say it is a it is a finding, and it's okay. If it is uh, that the rule is not working, it says it's a vulnerability, but for us it is not. It is. Uh, it, the option we have is modify the rule or remove them. So we don't have that result anywhere. And yes, uh, we can do a partial scans of the things that have changed. That's, for example, if we do the scans in merge requests, that would be the approach, to scan only the, the thing that changes. Please send me any questions to email or catch me in the hallway. That's totally fine. Thank you.
Well, all right. Uh, thank you very much, everybody, for joining me in this uh, talk. Uh, it's called on Content Ansible. And I'm, you know, introduced first myself. So you know me. Um, my, my name is Guillermo Gomez. It's kind of difficult for the Czech people to pronounce. So uh, I decided to go for the Nick Gizmo. So if you go to TPVC and ask for Gizmo, that's going to be me in the Technology CB Park, OK? Uh, I'm from Venezuela. I have a master degree in electronics engineering. That meant six years in the university back then in Caracas. And I started my career as uh, working with the telco company Alcatel. Probably you know them. And I worked for Alcatel six years. Then I worked for another company, a German company uh, that was based in Berlin, Portsmouth, and London. There were three sites. And they produced um, internet appliance. That was my first touch with Linux in 1999. Okay. Um, if you want to know, I got my degree in 1994. So I stopped doing the math, yes. And uh, after going with DICA and the in Internet Linux Appliance, I really got interested in the Linux world. So I start, you know, embracing the movement for free open source. I, got, I tested all the distros as you probably did in your early stages on, you know, open source movement. Uh, we fought the wars, okay, so we won, okay. And uh, I spent a lot of time with Fedora. I was even part of the Fedora board during the 2011-2012 uh, period. I went through translator, package, uh, packager, writer, ambassador, speaker, blogger, blah, blah, blah. I did it all with Fedora except developing software, OK? Most of my efforts in Fedora were based on uh, Latin America. So I pushed the communities in Venezuela, Argentina, Peru, Colombia, even Brazil. Okay. So that's me. Um, and I started using Ansible, switching from uh, Ruby-driven uh, technologies after Python kind of uh, started killing Ruby. And, uh, I'm a Rubyist, but I decided to go with uh, Ansible as a strategic decision in my career. So it was a good decision, okay? So I, I, I decided to go with Ansible and OpenShift, okay? So those are re good recommendations for anyone in their own careers. And I've been working with this, uh, automating anything I can. My previous role was as, as a sysadmin in Red Hat, for developers, I mean, I was in charge of um, maintaining internal platform for developers. In short, we were in charge of about 35 to 40 OpenShift clusters. Different architectures, different sizes, different platforms, bare metal, bare metal virtual, open stack. So it was very complex environment. So. For me, my success in PSI, okay, dealing with OpenShift, was just based on Ansible. So barely I use OC commands with OpenShift during my time in that team for more than two years. And there is my, you know, my new engineer colleague, Adam. He started an internship with us, and we develop a lot of Ansible code for testing those 35 clusters to know their status. Uh, probably many of you are going to ask, well, what about Prometheus, Grafana, Splunk, and all those specific platforms? Well, those platforms all, always, they were not consolidated in an easy way. So they were not easy to consume. So for us, it was not really useful. So it was really useful just to test, can I create a project on this cluster now? Can I create a deployment on this cluster now? If it fails, I know something is wrong. So that was my job. 
Then I decided for another role. Now I'm a technical account manager. And now the challenge is, is different. Now I'm not dealing directly with the clusters because I have no voice, no keyboard to get into those clusters that are owned by my customers. But my customers has problems with them. I'm a technical account manager. In the end, that means support them. They have an issue. How can I support them? So my automation now is not dealing with the open shift that I control, but the open shift that I can simulate okay, in a laboratory and test the configuration of my customer and try to reproduce the problems they have and make this as quickly as possible. So this is my background. So you can uh, uh, ask me about this. So this talk in particular uh, is about how Ansible is related now with the containers world. So I'm gonna try to get you engaged in the, in the talk and ask you about what is that you understand what is a container and what is the problem that the container is trying to solve Solly, maybe you have an answer to this. Someone, what is a container? Nobody knows? Please, come on. A container. Is it a new concept for you? No, it isn't. It's a technology to encapsulate processes in their own environments. Okay, what problem does it solve? Well, deployability. Deployability. What else? What does it exactly mean? All right, I will add on that, that's great, okay? That, for example, I just switched my laptop, my previous laptop uh, went expired the warranty, so Red Hat offers me the laptop, you know, with a very small cost, okay? So I decided to go for it, but in the process, I got wiped out my operating system, so I got my new Fedora installed. What you're seeing is the new Fedora 38, it's not the CSB, it's the standard Fedora uh, 38. The problem that I'm facing now is that, okay, I'm gonna do my presentation tomorrow and I need to install Ansible and I need to install all these things. And you know what? Between my Fedora and my RHEL, I started to have problems with the dependencies. So the container basically is solving a very old problem that is, in the end, very simple. You need to package all your dependencies in one of these little piece so you can be sure that you have what you need to run the piece of software that you want without colliding a neighbor. So many people come from the world of virtual machines. Virtual machines did the same thing, let's say, but in a very, very heavy way, okay? very heavy, so you had to emulate the hardware, you have to emulate everything, on top you have to put the operating system and so on, so you had a whole machine. Of course it had some little benefits, okay? But that's what the container is. So how Ansible relates to this? That's what's the introduction about the tools I'm gonna talk about, because in the end I'm gonna fly through the slides, okay? It's more important what I'm telling you right now that what is on the slides, okay? So, in the previous iteration of Ansible through the web from Red Hat, it was, what was the name? Tower. So how Tower resolved the problem to solve, to actually run the playbooks, to run the work, uh, flow job templates, to run the job templates, it was, um, what was the name? Uh, virtual environment from Python. You needed, you know, those, kind of a vessels with the dependencies you need to run your playbook, your workflow, your job template in a consistent manner. So uh, Tower evolved, but in the end it, it, got very, it got really complex to keep up with this. And in parallel, the container wall started to, you know, raised. So it was obvious that we got to ditch you know, the virtual environments from Python and start 
using containers for running our playbooks. So this is the very basics about the presentation I'm gonna make. So you can see in the slide where I'm talking about the dependency problem, the virtual environment, the problems when you need to patch the OS, okay? So there are two new tools that are based on containers that I'm gonna talk about. Those two new tools are Ansible Navigator. Who knows Ansible Navigator? Do you know a bit about Ansible Navigator? Okay, thank you. And the second tool is Ansible Builder. And even though I'm gonna through all this life very fast, concepts are pretty easy. Ansible Builder is gonna let you create an image for you to run your playbooks. An Ansible Navigator is basically a text user interface for you to run your playbooks and any, you know, playbooks that you had developed before. So I'm gonna switch right now. Uh, anybody has used before Builder? All right. Uh, who hasn't? Why? <laughs> I, I mean, it's, it looks like everybody already tested it. So I, I just, I just, uh, I mean, I don't know if I'm, I need to switch to the terminal right now, but the idea of Builder is, you know, kind of uh, uh, the tool just to create your image, whatever image you need. Basically, uh, based on the OCI format, even though it does support the Docker file, the Docker format also for the containers, okay? No, no, that's another world, too. Uh, the good, what I do like about Builder is uh, it supports script format, scripting format. It means you create a simple bash script and you end up with an image. You realize that or you're always using a Docker file? Who had used a script for creating an image? What is, the, what, what is the virtue of using the script? Repeatability. Repeatability, what else? You can do whatever you want because it's a script. It's not just a Docker file. So you can, you know, do whatever what is you do right now with your knowledge based in Bash. And on top of this, you create your image. So that's what Builder is. Okay, I'm not gonna go into the terminal. You don't have the time for this. I'm gonna review a little also flash about what are the commands that we have in Ansible? Uh, we have a, a lot of them, okay? Probably some of them you never tried before. I'm not gonna count of them. And then we have it finally, Ansible Navigator. It's a text UI. The analogy I came up with is the M MCLI. So we all are used to, in the old times, IEF config, interface config for network, and then IP something and all the, you know, the parameters, it's very complex, it's very powerful, but at the same time, it's very hard, okay? So the, the, the text UI kind of uh, fits in the middle to solve day-by-day -day problems. So nowadays, for example, and, and, and that was a surprise, I showed this, uh, at an engineer at Red Hat, and I show NMTUI, and he say, hey, I never saw that before. <laughs> really? All right, so, cool. But for me, it was obvious, okay? You don't, you don't, you don't have a, a graphics user interface, you don't have a genome shell, you just SSH into your machine, then you, this kind of tool simplifies that you don't know all the details about the commands of IP, you know, Details. So Ansible Navigator is like this, and on top of this, it adds some functionalities. That's where the analogy ends. So this is the command, and then where the problem starts, actually. 
This is where the problem starts. So I, I, I got into the dependency problems trying to solve the dependency problem. You see how, 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 how painful this is. Yes, so I, I tried this in the Fedora. I got, a, I got an Ansible core version, blah, blah, blah. I, got, I tried this on the RHEL 8, and I ended up with another version. It was a mess, OK? Still a mess, OK? And then I'm trying to figure out. But in the end, the goal is to get an image that is going to work. Oof. So when you get it installed, this is what you're going to get, OK? You can run all those commands like collections, config, doc, help, image. There is a lot of functionality here. So the main point of Ansible Navigators is to consolidate to make it easier to consume all these things that actual Ansible provides you. It's not a replacement. Again, it's like the Network Manager CLI. It adds, it adds some new features and it makes it easier for you to run some stuff or to debug some stuff. One of the, for example, interesting features is the line number four, uh, 13, which means replay. Ansible navigators give you this option that when you run your playbook and something goes wrong, then you can actually replay <laughs> the run without actually running against the target but just in your machine through the logs. It's like a dump. So it goes through the dump and shows you all the other steps, and you can, let's say, trace every step on your playbook and debug it without actually touching the target system. This is one of the very nicest features that you can uh, use on Ansible Navigator. Uh, this is the help. This is basic information regarding the releases. I'm going to make available the presentation for you, so you're going to have the links. I guess you can pretty much get that information uh, easily. So for example, just to run like a regular playbook, you can just call Ansible Navigator run my playbook. And you can run it in a non-interactive way. Actually, exactly with adding in minus M S T D out. So it kind of behaves. This is the regular Ansible playbook. Output, you know this. And this is the Ansible Navigator run output. It looks pretty the same with the same playbook. Nice. But if you run it without the non interactive, you're going to get this. And when you get this, you can press zero, which is the uh, play number zero in your playbook. You're going to get the Tasks list one by one, zero and one. In this case, you just have a playbook with two tasks. So task number one, got in facts. Second task, print something about my laptop. But then you can press again zero or one on the left. And this is what you get. You're going to get all the details of your task. Run your step here. You see? So you don't have to go and rerun the program, include the verbosity or whatsoever. It's everything already there, OK? And when you run for the first time Ansible Navigator against your playbook, this is what happened. It's going to try to pull an image. So this is the key part for you to understand. Your playbook is not running based on your operating system installation of Ansible. It's going to run inside that container. You're going to spawn an image. Uh, you're going to pull the image. You're going to run the container. And you're going to pass everything in there. It's going to run. And then you're going to pull out all the, all the details out of it. In this case, this screen, uh, screenshot shows that uh, by default, at that time that I create this, it was pulling Ansible to measure platform 2.3. EE, EE means execution environment, uh, supported rel, blah, blah, blah. So now you can uh, uh, look forward that the new Ansible automation platform is based on this. So the new Ansible automation platform is based on the execution environment, which is a base image. So this whole talk is about on containerized Ansible. 
So the idea is you're gonna create images or you're gonna consume images to run your playbooks. So uh, this is, here's a quick mapping between the Ansible CLI and TUI. And, and TUI. Not very important. Uh, new functionalities. One of the uh, cutest thing is about inspecting collections. Uh, the replay you already mentioned. Now about the configuration. You can actually run Ansible Navigator config. So it's gonna start gathering information about your actual configuration. And this is a nice thing because again, when you try to run your playbook, you're wondering, ah, how is it configured? What is it configured? Well, you know, all those things that you maybe you're not aware about at the moment you run your playbook, when you run Ansible Navigate Config, you're gonna get all the information in your screen, what values are you using, what source it's pulling this configuration parameter in. So in this case, all the green lights, green lights, lines are just telling you that it's using the defaults. And the two lines that are not in green is where uh, they were changed somewhere, okay? Here. Then, of course, you have some configurations that you can tweak. For example, uh, obviously you can uh, have a environment variable telling what is the uh, config file. You can use the Ansible Navigate.yml or in the home folder, the uh, not visible Ansible, not Ansible Navigator YAML. There you have, it's a YAML, it's a complex, I mean, there, is a, there are a lot of parameters that you can tweak. One of these is about the execution environment that you're gonna use, okay? So I mentioned already execution environments. Uh, three things is when you use uh, Ansible Automation Platform, obviously you're gonna consume uh, base images provided by Red Hat, certified by Red Hat, so you're gonna get support on those, okay? You can uh, use other images or you can create your own. In this case, I took uh, just a screenshot on what is being used now in my Fedora installation. The image is called creator-ee, and that's the version. And that's an example of using a different image from the CLI-EEI with my image. Maybe your image, now I'm just putting very simple examples, but imagine your image includes the Kubernetes modules that you need. Or you're including you know, many other modules that you need to use in your playbook. Uh, what else? Settings, my image. Collections, again, when you run the command, you're gonna get all the information in your path. The recommendation is when you create your new Ansible automation project, if you create a path, you put everything in there, your configuration uh, files, your Ansible CFG, your Ansible Navigator, YAML, and so on. You put everything in there. So when you run Ansible Navigator collections in that path, you're gonna get all the information that your environment is seeing. So you're not gonna get confused at all what it's available for your environment at the wrong time. You can actually explore them. You see the index on the left? So if you press, uh, I'm going for Ansible POS6, Ansible POS6 is the number five and then I get all the modules that include in the Ansible POSIX. And if I press again one of the index on the left, I'm gonna get actually a lot of information about that module, even the examples. Okay? So you don't need to go Google, blah, 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 Ansible module, no. 
You're going to browse your collections. You're going to be able to look at the modules that are installed in your environment. And you're going to be able even to see who to email and blame about something, OK? <laughs> That's cool. That's it about Ansible Navigator. Um, of course, there are a lot of more things there. This is just a kind of eye-opening uh, presentation. I'm going to fly through Builder because I just have 10 minutes more. Uh, I already told you this is about creating new images for Ansible Navigator or Ansible Automation Platform. Okay. I just installed it yesterday, and the current version of Ansible Builder is 3.0.0 in Fedora 38. It doesn't match with my RHEL 8. That was all the mess up started. This is the basic help online. It works based on a YAML definition. And right now, the key point here is the version. Right now, it supports three versions, one, two, three. And you have to go through the documentation exactly what every parameter means, but it's kind of a readable. Dependencies, Ansible Galaxy, base image, Python things that, are, that need to be included in your image. And here are some examples of the files involved. So for example, the requirements, YAML, my list, the collection that you need to be installed in the image, the bin depth, it's uh, about the system. You need the binary git in your image available. So you, you can specify, you will specify like this. And there you're going to specify your Python libraries needed in your environment. After you make this, well, this is one of the extra uh, slides that I need to put yesterday. I was trying to make this uh, presentation shorter, but I figured. So this is important about the versions. Version 1 is supporting all Ansible versions. Version 2, 1.2. In version 3, version and version Ansible Builder version 3.0. This is a typical run. In this case, I'm just adding minus V3 just to block everything in my screen to see how is it working. You can see that it's actually using podman build command to create your image. And if you, this is the result after all my, my uh, plays with this. The uh, Ansible execution environment was the custom created with Ansible Builder, the meetup, UBI minimum, it was created with the Builder script, and the UBI minimal is the base image from, from Red Hat, from UBI. So that's it. I made uh, the 10 minutes for you to start shooting me at, uh, for question and so on. Thank you very much. Thank you for the patience. And uh, now it's on you. No. No. no that's a package. He has to repeat. Ah, I need to repeat the question. Oh, my good friend, your name? Andrea. Andrea is asking about the uh, software distribution packaging for Ansible Navigation and Builder. And no, they are only available through uh, PIP. And I think they distribute some zip files uh, from the Git repos on GitHub. And that's it. So it's an opportunity for packagers. If they're willing to do that. Okay. Other questions? Proceed. Really? It was so clear. So it's a success. Thank you very much again.
I can get started. I can start. Good morning. And I'm extremely happy to see so many pe people in the Zoom. Uh, normally, the Zoom is full when either the talk is AI or, you know, it's Dan Walsh. So I am I'm none of that. But uh, I'm, I'm here to give a, a brief talk about what secure development is and uh, what secure development uh, is from an open source point of view. Uh, my name is Josefa. Um, I am a lead security architect. I work for secure development in product security. I am a Fedora contributor for a very long time, probably for the last 10 or 12 years. I have been speaking at DevConf. Uh, I have almost spoken at all DevCons except the last one, I think. And I normally speak about security. I speak about security practices. I've spoken about hard bleed, shell shock, and you know I've spoken about those to those topics. So, why why are we basically here? We are basically here to talk about secure development. And uh, when people talk about secure development, they normally talk about you know how I can write my code in a way that is secure. But that's not really always the case, right? Secure development is not only secure code. But it's, it's the process of making sure that your, your system is secure, your project is secure, from the time when you design the project to when you actually write the code to when you build the project, when you run the project, and when you develop your code, when you deliver your code and the bi binary to the customers. So the, 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 the question which most open source projects will usually ask us is that, you know, uh, people think that secure development is, 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 for, is for large companies and, and enterprises like probably Red Hat or IBM because, you know, their developers and their customers are normally asking about security. But that's not real, really the case, right? Because most of the projects uh, will start small. So if, if you take the example of, say, OpenSSL or, you know, if you take example of Mo Mozilla or Bash or, you know, whatever, most of the projects really start small. It's just a few people who, you know, get together, there's an idea, they work on it. Uh, in, in some years, it's, it's common to see these projects being used everywhere. So if you take example of Bash, Bash started quite small. But if you look at where Bash is used now, nowadays, Bash is used in a lot of projects which you can't e even imagine. Uh, when we were wo wo working on some Bash security issues, we figured out that, you know, Bash is used in network attach attached storage devices. It's used in your television set-top boxes. So, you know, the, the cable operator can give an instruction to the set-top box and, you know, you, you can see those, those channels. So, the moral of the story is a lot of projects start really, really small. So, when, when you start working on a project, it seems that, you know, my project is not, not big enough to have a secure development process. But that's not really the case. And when the project is small, when you're actually trying to work on a project and design a, pro a project, that's the right time to work on secure development. And by, by the time your project is very, very large, right? So if you take example of OpenSSL again, if, if when your project is very, very large, it becomes really difficult to inject security into the project because, you know, the design is set in stone. You have developers and, you, you know, you have, you have cus customers and everything. So the right time to do secure development from an open source point of view is when you are actually trying to start the project. And, and, and remember one thing, security sometimes can be expensive when, it is a, when, when you try to add security later on in the project. So when you start the project, that's the right time. At that time, security is cheap. But you know, as the project progresses, as you have customers, as you have users, it's really difficult to have sec sec uh, security after that. Uh, small, small projects, right? Uh, small projects don't have the inclination or don't have the money to do security because the general thought is that you know security tools are very expensive. So if you look at off-the-shelf security tools like Coverity or you know these kind of scanners or something like that, these scanners are extremely expensive. So if you're a small-time project, it's very difficult for for you to have that kind of money or you to have that kind of man manpower to have the security uh, uh, process. So at the end, what happens is that you you reach a process in your project in which your project is mature enough, you have people who use the project, but there is no, there is no security at all, which is a big problem. So we, we, are, we are trying to look at those, pro uh, those pro problems. So what I can do to fix this issue, right? So there are three things which I can do. And you know, when, when I say I can do, it means basically if I, if I have an open source project, 
uh, I have a few developers, I have a few users, uh, may, maybe I don't have a lot of money to, and I don't have a lot of manpower to invest on security. There are three things which an open source project can basically do. The first thing is learn, learn what secure development is, learn what, how secure development can, can be done and learn what I can do as a leader of the project or what I can do as a developer of a project or you know if I am the QE person for, for, for the project I need to learn what I can do. The second thing is change the mindset. Security is a lot about changing the mindset than you know doing the actual work. Um, like, like, like I mentioned it's a mindset and not a process. There needs to be security in every stage of your software development life, life cycle. And very, very important, observe what uh, other people are, are doing, right? There are a lot of people who are doing good open source security. Try to understand what they are doing, what resources they are, they are using, and how I can adapt that to my project, and how I can, uh, uh, how I can use that for, for, for my software. Last but not least, there are, there are immense amount of free tools which are available. Right. You don't need to, you, you need to go away from the mindset that, you know, I need to buy this or I need to buy that. There are immense amount of open source and free tools which are available which you can use. And you can use that to do a lot of things. Uh, in the rest of the talk, we'll probably look at some of the tools and we can, we will see how those tools can be useful to us. Uh, there are a lot of other open source projects which are available. Like, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll take a brief look at Google OSS first and how you can use that to improve the security of your project. So there are huge amount of learning and application resources which are available to work on, on the security of your project. Um, so trying to re reiterate what, se what secure development is. Secure development is not just code audit and patching and stuff like that. It is, it is security of the entire life cycle of the, pro of the pro pro project, right from the design phase to you know, when you develop and you know, all, all of those things. And think of security from uh, what I mentioned earlier, think of security from design to the delivery phase, where, when your project goes end of life, what happens after that? Do you tell your customers that you know, on so and so date, my project will be end of life. So if you are still trying to use it, use it at your own risk. So all of those things are related to secure, secure development. Now. Uh, they, they are eight things which I'm basically going to talk, talk, talk about. And I know we, we don't have a lot of time in this talk, but they are eight things which a normal uh, open source project can basically do. When you design your project, right, get security, no, get security no, no, uh, knowledge as, as much as you can. And a lot of this security knowledge is free. There's OWASP, there are other resources also, which I'll probably talk about later on in, 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 uh, in the presentation. Uh, know what a threat model is. Right, and we'll very briefly talk about threat, threat model later on. Know how a threat model can be done. There are various free tools available to do a threat, 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 threat model, so know that as well. Uh, when you're storing your code, right, know where you want to store your code. If you want to do it on GitHub, if you want to do it on GitLab, what are the risks which are, which are associated with that? If you want to create your own Git repository on the internet and you want to do it over there, know what are the pros and cons of doing it. So know where the code is being stored and what are the security aspects associated with storing the code at that particular place. When, when you write the code, this, this is the third, third part, right? When, when you write the code, learn what secure code development is. Learn how code can be written in a, in a secure way. If you are using mem copy, is, is it safe? Should you be using something else? If you are using string copy, is that safe? Or should you be, you, should you be using some, so, so something else? If you have multiple projects who are working with you, if, the, if there are multiple people who are working on a project, see if you can get a peer review before you, com you commit the code, right? There are a lot of people out there on the internet who are willing to help you and criticize you both, right? Which is pro probably good for, for your code. So if you write code, see if somebody is, is, is able to help you trying to review your code, trying to review your pa 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 patches and see if there are any is issues with that. When you build your code, Right. Then SASTI is very, 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 is very, very important right before you build, build, build the code. My, my colleague uh, Florencio gave a very good uh, talk on SASTI and SEM, SEMgrep, right? There are uh, other tools available as well. Uh, we'll talk about some, some of them. There is a lot of integration with GitHub, GitLab, which will allow you to automatically scan your code before your code is being built or you know, after your code is being built, while your code is being built. So there are a lot of, again, free tools av available which can do static analysis. 
uh, understand what secure compiler is, what are the secure compiler defaults which you want to use. So if you are delivering your code in the form of a binary, to your customer or to the user, know what secure compilation is and you know what are the different defaults which you can use. Uh, when you deliver your pro project, uh, whether it is in the form of a source code or a, bi a, bi a bi binary, uh, figure out if there's a way to sign your source code, if there's a way to sign your binary so that your customers or your users will, will know if there is a compromise. Uh, around 15 years back, I'm not sure if you, if you, if you remember, VSFTPD was compromised, right? The source code was compromised and somebody inserted a backdoor into VSFTPD. If you give a smiley command to VSFTPD, you will have full root access. And the person who did, 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 did that, he got onto the VSFTPD uh, servers, he put in the backdoor, he recreated the tarball and he put the tarball back onto the server. And the problem was at that time VSFTPD was not signed. So anybody who used that tar tarball probably got, com com uh, got compromised as well. Uh, the good thing was that uh, the author realized this in a couple of hours and he could remove the back door and you know, from, from that point onwards he made sure that the tarball was signed. So you know, all of those things are very, this, very important when you deliver your code to your customers or users in form of either source code or, or, or binary. Um, Supporting your code, okay? Make sure that you clearly advertise on your website where security issues need to be reported. If somebody needs to report a security issue, then please use this email address. Do you prefer the emails to be encrypted or you do, do you prefer plain uh, text emails? What is the timeline which the customers and users are looking at? All of those things are very, very important so that people know where the, uh, where the security issue needs to be reported and how fast or slow you are when those security issues are reported to you. Uh, when your project is end of life, this is what I discussed earlier, make sure you clearly mention this on your website. Log4.js is a typical a example, right? The earlier version was end of life, it was mentioned on the website in very small words, nobody cared, people still used it and, and then you, you know what, what happened after that. So clearly mention on the website in clear words that my project is going to go end of life December this year. If you continue to use it, then use it at your own risk. There will be no security patches which will be applied after that. Last but, but, but not least, what I mentioned earlier, there are a lot of free options available. So research them, there is OSS Fuzz. If your project is applicable for OSS Fuzz, then it's a very good tool. It does fuzzing for you free of cost. And you know, if you know what fuzzing is, then fuzzing is very expensive. So if, if somebody is able to do it free of cost, then that's an added benefit to you. So uh, we don't have a lot of time. So I'm just going to talk about things which are very, very, very important. Threat model is number number one, right? Threat model basically means you try to decompose your application and put it on paper, try to figure out where data is flowing from one end of the component to the sec second end, and what are the threats to the model, to the design of your application, uh, in, uh, threats from inside, threats from out uh, outside. So we are trying to fi uh, figure out what the threats are. Uh, there are many ways of doing it. OWASP has got a lot of exhaustive information available in threat, in, for threat modeling. OWASP has got a lot of automated tools as well. Right, so you can use those tools. Uh, there is a curated list on this GitHub site. So you can look, look, look at that. It contains books, it contains resources, it contains free tools which, which you can use. So the threat model is not impossible. You don't need a lot of security knowledge to do threat, threat, threat model. So that is some, something which really can be done. Again, when you write secure code, learn, audit, and repeat, okay? The, the trick is to be paranoid with all the input. Any input which goes into the application, please be very, very paranoid with that in input. You don't know what will happen, especially if that input is, is not processed, if it is not sanitized in the way it should be, then you should be very, very par paranoid with, with that, that input. Uh, understand that everybody in your project is not at the same technical level as you are, or probably you know you are not at the same technical level as everybody is. So if somebody writes the code and if you feel that code is not written very well, then make sure you tell that person so that you know any few future code which you write is written in, in the right way. Learn from each other, do code reviews, do code, code audits as, as much as you can. Uh, use SASTI, 
right? This is very, very important. It's static analysis can be used to find flaws and even bugs in your code. There are a lot of free stuff available which can do SASD. GitHub has got free SASD which, which is integrated. There are like 40 or 50 different scanners which are available. There is a, uh, GitHub has got its own free language called CodeQL. Which is which is there by by default, but there are a lot of other scanners which you can also also enable. Uh, I think it provides you some 1,000 seconds or 10,000 seconds per month or per week or some some something like that, which you can use in GitHub Actions. So we, you can run these tools with 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 that. Uh, provides very easy integration with CI/CD pipelines as, as well. So if you are using CI/CD inside GitHub, then Sasti gives you very, very, and GitHub gives you very, very good integration. Uh, for fuzzing, like I, I mentioned earlier, all the cool kids are, are doing it, but uh, fuzzing is computationally very expensive. You need a lot of computational power to do for fuzzing. Signal to noise ratio is very, very low. Which basically means that you know, if you fuzz for a couple of hours or a couple of days or a couple of weeks, you probably find one or two flaws, because that's how fuzzing basically works. But there are a lot of again free tools which are available. There are free resources which are available. If your project is eligible for OSS Fuzz, then nothing like like it. Uh, what OSS Fuzz basically is is a Google project, right? In which you know uh, you give your project to Google, and you know they fuzz at their their ends. They have a high-end fuzzing cluster which 20,000 nodes or 40,000 nodes at their end, and whenever they hit anything, they will automatically file a bug in your bug bug system, and you can look at it, right? So there are a lot of free, free tools which, which are available. Uh, there is Hong Fuzz, and you know there are a lot of free free fuzzers also available. The only catch is you know those things need to run on your machine. But if you use OSS first, it runs on Google infrastructure, so you know it's win-win for, uh, for 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 everybody. Uh, like like I mentioned earlier, make your security stance known. Okay, clearly notify on your website what the security address is, who is responsible, whether uh, this project is only your part-time project and you will get to it when you have free free time. So you know whatever your security stance, make sure it, it is it is available. Secure code is money in, in in the long time, right? If 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 you if you write secure code, more people will use it. Probably you can pro pro productize it, you can monetize it as well. But if you write crappy code which is insecure, then you know probably nobody wants to use it. That's my talk. Yes. I will ask about the probable last quote you said, the security is money, because this is, in my opinion, a long term problem of security when you, when, you, when you do a startup. At the beginning, features is what, what customers buy, they don't buy security easily. Yep. So, do you feel like this has changed or it's still the same, but uh, uh, some of the customers might see the, uh, the outcome of unsecure code in their premises? <laughs> Yeah, I, 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 I think the question is that, you know, uh, what I mentioned earlier, that secure code is money. So um, especially for startups where customers are more interested in features and probably less interested in, 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 in security. So the question was whether the landscape is changing, right? Uh, I think it is changing a, a lot nowadays, right? And uh, the thing is that, you know, if you have a startup and, you know, if you have a project or some, something like, like, like that, which your cu customers are buying or you know they are going to buy there is going to be a time probably in the near few future when your customers realize that you know your project is not as secure as they, they would like to or you know they are new uh, threats which are uh, which are there in your project and by by that time it's going to be too late for you to go back to the drawing board and to change the design and you know to change the code and stuff like that so I think the customer mentality is ch changing as well plus uh, what what you need to understand is that you know uh, what what secure development basically means is security baked into your life cycle which means you don't really need to spend additional resources or additional cy uh, cycles trying to do security you don't need to hire security engineers you don't need to get your code audited by a third party auditor who is 
probably very very expensive and is going to char- charge you a lot there are a lot of free resources and there are free workflows which are available like i mentioned github earlier GitHub has got integrated Sasty, integrated malware, integrated Dasty, all of those things GitHub basically has. And you just need to enable it, right? And it needs to be a part of, of the work, workflow. While you, are, while you write your code, uh, wouldn't it be, it be great if your IDE, your integrated development environment tell, tell you that, you know, uh, you know, you just wrote a function on line number 50, but uh, that's not safe. So would you like to revisit? So it's a part of your de- development process, no additional cycles are required later on to, 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 to look at it. And from a startup point of view, if you feel that, you know, there is no advantage for me to do security right now because the customers are not asking us or, you know, because my priority is to uh, have more f- features than, than, than security, it may hurt you in, in long term. And, you know, we have observed that with a lot of, of startups that initially customers buy your product because you know it's a new thing in the market and you know they want to do it but later on there's some other startup which is doing the same thing but they they basically say that you know we are doing the same thing but we are more secure so it it hurts you in 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 the long long term i think yes when you have a lot of money. <laughs> uh, so his, his question was, um, do you feel that a bug bounty program is useful from, uh, from a security point, point of view? Uh, there are a lot of conflicting views on that, right? My personal op- opinion is that, uh, like what I mentioned earlier, you need money for, for, for bug bounty pro, uh, program to run. There are a lot of companies who give you free Amazon vouchers or some, something like that if you find a bug. Uh, there are not a lot of hackers who would go for that that kind of thing, right? Or no, people normally need the m- need the money. Uh, you can be associated with a bug bounty projects like Hacker One and stuff like 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 like, like that. Uh, they are useful for a particular kind of thing when you are consumer project, right? So when you are a project which is a web app or something like that, or you know a mobile application or something like that, it may be useful. When you figure out that you know there are a lot of security flaws in my project. Uh, but you know my my team is not a, a, not not able to find out what what, what those security issues are uh, al- also remember uh, bug bounty hunters are you know af- after money they are not after improving the security stance of your project so you know uh, if you if you have money and you know if if you feel that you know that's going to use, be useful i know a lot of companies who started bug bounty for 6 months or 10 months and they realized that you know it's a waste of 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 effort because you know the researchers they write 10 pages of uh, research reports saying that you know with screenshots and vi- and videos and you know stuff like, like that and it was not very useful for them so i think if you have the resources uh, maybe you you can you can give it a go and you know see if you get any valid things but then it, it really dip, uh, depends on how much resources you you basically have probably with that money i can buy a good security buy, i can hire a good security engineer and I can get more output out of him than you know trying to get it from a bug bounty pro program. Yes, Hubert. Uh, you mentioned to look to other projects for inspiration or like what to do. Uh, what would be the first step you suggest? Like, uh, give an example for that. So a couple of projects which I, I have been I have been working on. Okay, the 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 question was that I mentioned that um, you can look at other open source projects for 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 inspiration, as you know what those projects are doing. Uh, I have been working with a couple of projects in the last ten years, and uh, uh, some 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 of them which I would like like to mention is Glibc. Okay, uh, Glibc is currently doing a very good work of you know trying to. Uh, they they have uh, some 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 time back. I, I I saw a white paper which is I think public on the internet, which talks about all the security features Glibc currently has, uh, what their roadmap is, what they are trying to basically implement, by when they are trying to Im- implement those those features, and you know wh- what are the resources which are uh, which are required. So this this is a good thing, right? I mean you are basically talk, uh, talking about what current security features you have, what you want to do, what your roadmap is, so that your users clearly understand what your security stance is. 
Jilipsy uh, al also has a page which I think OpenSSL also has, which says that if you find this 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 kind of report, it is not security. Please don't b b bug us with it. Right, which is very, very important because, you know, people will tell you everything that, you know, I found a DOS and this is security. I found this and that is security. So this is very, very important because it, 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 it increases your signal to noise ratio. There are less people reporting stuff which may not be secured. I think that that's one very, very good example. OpenSSL, uh, after Heartbleed, is doing a lot of good security now. They are doing fuzzing with uh, OSS fuzz. And they are doing a lot of useful things, things, th things as well. They are doing, they are, they are doing auditing as well. Uh, Mozilla is one very good example. Uh, Mo Mozilla runs a bug bounty program as well, so that that's a very good example as well. But you know, those are those are large projects. They are very small projects as well, which which are uh, which are doing good work, I think. <coughs> yes. Okay. Uh, yesterday, I spoke with a person who is who is writing a lot of code in Rust, and he told me he he is creating a a, a collection of how you can write insecure code with Rust. Right. So the the general understanding is that because I'm using Rust, I am uh, I'm not affected by all the classical issues which normally C C plus plus or you know these kind of lang la languages have. So. Uh, I, I, I think even if you try to use a, a secure language like Rust or something like that, you should still understand that you know you can write insecure code with 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 Rust, right? And you you should be familiar with all the different compile time, runtime things which can be enabled or or or, or disabled, irrespective of what kind of lang uh, language uh, you basically run. Come on, there, there, there has to be questions. <laughs> so my, my, my teacher used to tell, tell me, if you don't have questions, it either means you have understood everything or you have understood nothing. <laughs> yes, thank you. I, I, I would like my, my government to spend more, more money as well on these kind of things, which, which is great actually. You know, uh, the, the thing is non normally government agencies are not really aware of, you know, that, you know, there is open source, number one. Uh, there is open source security as well. Uh, even though, you know, a lot of open source is being used everywhere, including government installations and, you know, their, 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 source, their servers and everything. So this kind of awareness is really, really important. And if, if there's a government which is doing it, then it's, it's a really great, great initiative. If you are running an open source pro project and if you, if you are eligible for, for this kind of incentives, then you should definitely, definitely use it. I would love for other governments and, you know, other government agencies to be aware of these kind of things as well. And to be to be able to spend uh, this kind of money to uh, to support these people, it, it's a really great 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 initiative, I think. Yes. So your question is, uh, how safe is it for us to use code written by AI? Uh, your question is, how safe it is for us to use code written by AI? Kind of? Yeah. 
yeah so how 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 easy or difficult is it for pe- people to understand you know and you know kind of review what ai is doing uh, w- w- wouldn't it it be great to say chat gpt please fix all my security issues right so i i i think the the the, the thing about ai is that you know it really depends on uh, the data which is used to teach coding to that particular model right and if you if if you if you look at if you look at code on on the internet and if you know if that kind of code is is trying to teach ai how how, how to write code then i i don't think the ou- output would be very very good very good as well right but that that being said i think there are a lot of projects a uh, lot of security projects for which ai can be put at very good good use and one one thing is you know for for example when you do sas sasti scanning okay uh, one thing about sasti is there are a lot of false positives which come out of sas sasti it would be great to feed those false positives into a, a, a ai model and uh, ai model be easily able to figure out if there are any future false positives which come from from your scanning right you know so that, that that would be great right so it's a it's a feedback cycle in which you feed the false positives into the model the model f- figures out that you know if this kind of information we get in future from sasti scanner it's a false po- positive as well so it feedback feeds back into the uh, the sasti d- database so these are some of the useful things which you which you can use but uh, right now the state in which i think most ai models are if there's a code which is generated by ai and if you want to use that code i would be very careful about trying to use that code i i would my personal opinion is i would have at least one human look at the code to figure out that you know it it, it has been done in the correct way yes so uh, what i feel about sas sasti tool is that it's 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 like an antivirus right if you if you if, if you scan your system with one antivirus it it may not be able to detect something which other antivirus can so i i i feel and this is my personal opinion i feel that a combination of sasti tools for your project may may be more important depending upon the complexity of your pro- project what code base your pro- project basically has plus my second observation is there is no sasti tool which can scan all languages it's very difficult to find a tool which will do, uh, which will scan everything in the same way so a tool which can scan c c++ probably won't be able to scan ruby py python Go, golang java something like that so in, in the end if your code base if your code base is very complex and consists of mul- multiple different languages you may end up using different tools because you know one tool is more efficient in this language the second tool is more efficient in 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 this language so right now i i i think the the right recipe is a combination of different tools if you have the resources for it would 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 be much better than using a single dedicated tool uh yeah one 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 pro- problem with using multiple tools is like you know you have duplicate number of issues which are which are reported by each tool and then for the person who is looking at the issue it becomes very difficult to figure out what the actual issue is right uh there are there are there are a lot of tools available on the internet free of cost paid d- different kind of things right which can do something called de- deduplication and what deduplication basically means is that you know it sucks things from the scanners right and it is able to figure out that the same issue has been reported by scanner 1 scanner 2 scanner 3 so instead of showing three issues it will show you one 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 issue so you know those kind of things are are, are, are really important because the the thing with sasti tools are, is that uh, the output is very chatty which basically means that you know there there are there are, there are lines there are pages and pages of logs so for a, for a developer or or for a, for for somebody who's looking at those logs it may be very very difficult for him to understand what is actually going on that is number one thing number two thing is, is the if the code base is very large so if you are scanning kernel libreoffice mozilla or something like that you have like 10000 uh, flaws or 20000 flaws so it's very difficult for one person or or even for a team of three or four people to be able to actually look at it and try to figure out if something is wrong 
I'm out of time. Thank, thank, thank you very much for, for coming. Uh, I'm there in the conference. If you have any questions, then we can probably meet in the hallway and we can chat. Thank you.
keď pôjde týpe, tak si, si hodný a ešte má prípadne to je redukcia a prípadne to na dokonalé to mali ísť. Jo, takže až přijde tak... O, to je ten nový speaker, hej, áno. Jasne, až přijde nový speaker, tak mu dám mikrofon. Ne, ten má, ten má tady a řeknu mu, ať se připojí tady na to, všechno to na notebook, tam dám potom session a zapnu to. A keď prvne na notebook, on by to mal presne vidieť to isté, čo na svojho, čo bude projektované. Jo, jo. Dobře, dobře. Keď, keby náhodou si niečo nesidelo, tak vyskúšaj sa vypíkať a ja ty robiť. Jo, dobrá. A myslím, že to, to je pohodečné. Akorát neviem teda tá hlasitosť. Ja neviem, no. Ja to tiež neviem, čo si spraviť. Sem tam tu párkrát prídu tí asi z audiebe, ktoré je čo mám
Hi, can you hear me? No? Yes? Hi, ah, it's just for screaming. Okay, streaming. Okay, so, hi everybody. My name is Iker Pedrosa. I'm a senior software engineer at Red Hat. I'm very glad to be here and to see some faces that, well, I didn't know in person. It's very nice to be, to be here in Breno. So, um, I work for the identity management where I'm part of the SSSD team where we do the client side authentication. And I will do this presentation about FIDO2 authentication for centralized uh, managed users. So, the agenda for today is that I will start with an introduction of what FIDO2 is and what, why this is interesting for us. Then I will explain a little bit the reality that the organizations and the customers that we have are facing. Then I will do a little uh, high level overview of what the, uh, this uh, implementation that we are going, doing is about. Next, I will do a little demo and I will share the testing playground that you can use to test this environment on your uh, laptops. Then I will speak about the future lines and what this, uh, this uh, new implementation holds for us. And finally, I will, will have time for the Q&A. So let's start with the introduction. So why FIDO2 and WebAuthn is uh, interesting? First of all, because it's passwordless, so you don't need any password. Uh, there's a public key cryptography involved in it, and the, uh, we are using the public key to authenticate the user. Then uh, it's also interesting because it enables a strong authentication, as you will be able to use multi-factor authentication for the authentication. It also reduces the risk of a data breach because we will not be reusing the passwords uh, between sites. And finally, it reduces the phishing threats. So what are currently the workflows that are enabled for FIDO2 and WebAuthn? The first one is the user authentication in a website. This is the most common one and the, the, the reason why this, uh, this protocol was born. Then we also have the local user authentication in a Linux system. Uh, for that, we use a pam u 2 f module from Yubico. And then we have the Azure AD user authentication in Windows. Uh, so remotely managed users in, uh, for Windows can use uh, Azure AD hosted environments to authenticate. But we are missing one of the uh, workflows. And the objective of this uh, workflow is to do FIDO2 and WebAuthn authentication. Uh, we will use the passwordless part. Uh, we will also uh, enable the remotely managed users. They will be uh, stored in an LDAP server. Uh, more specifically, if you are using the free APA uh, server, you will have a better integration. Then we have the local authentication, as we will use the uh, FIDO2 key to authenticate locally. And finally, we will also be uh, enabling the uh, Kerberos part, where you will be able to remote uh, to do a remote authentication to other services and places in the network. So this is uh, um, uh, the, the workflows that we'll be enabling, enabling here. So we have a user with a FIDO2 key. Uh, you will have to connect this key to the client where SSSD is running. And then there are two different workflows. On the one hand, we have the, um, the remote authentication with the free API server where we send the information from the FIDO2 key to the server and uh, the Kerberos part is able to authenticate the user. But also, in case the free API server is down or you are using some other LDAP server like uh, Active Directory or DS389, we also have the uh, client-side authentication, which is local. For this case, it says what we do is we obtain the user credentials from the server and we do the authentication locally. So. Now let's speak, let's speak about the reality. So uh, in January 2022, the US government released a memorandum which is titled Moving the US Government Towards Zero Trust Cybersecurity Principles. And uh, the idea behind this is that we should move towards uh, more secure uh, environments. And um, the idea is to have these implementations finished by the end of 2024. Uh, so the guiding principle between the, uh, for this uh, zero trust model is that no actor, system, network, or service working within the security perimeter or outside of it is trusted. 
So all the, uh, all the communications must be encrypted and authenticated as soon as practicable. This way, the users can use the uh, applications uh, from anywhere in the world or in the internet. Well, this is a high-level overview for this um, zero trust model, but let's focus on the part from the memorandum that speaks about uh, user authentication. So, uh, briefly explains, explained the, the memorandum uh, explains uh, several things. The first of all is that we should have the users uh, centrally managed, and then that we should use passwordless and multi-factor authentication to authenticate the users. Apart from that, the users should be able to sign in once and then use uh, the services or applications that are available in the IT infrastructure from this uh, company or agency or government. So the, the memorandum specifically mentions two different protocols. Uh, the first one is PIF, which are these smart cards that uh, SSSD and FreeAPA already uh, enabled, enabled some time ago. And then it also mentions uh, FIDO2 and WebAuthn. And this is the uh, new implementation that we are working on right now. If you'd like to know more about this memorandum, it's available on the internet. You just, yeah, you just need to check for the title that I mentioned in the previous slide and you will be able to read it. So now let's speak about the high level uh, technical details. So for the FIDO2 uh, workflow for remotely managed users, we have two different uh, workflows. The first one is the registration and then we have the authentication. For the registration, we need to connect the FIDO2 key to the device and then use the SSSCTL command provided by SSSD to uh, register the user. This will output the um, key mapping data. This key mapping data needs to be stored in the LDAP server and for that, we'll be able to use uh, some specific commands from PIPA or in the case of uh, Active Directory, the graphical interface or if you are using some other server, uh, LDAP add or LDAP uh, modify uh, commands. In the case of the free API server, you can do both uh, steps uh, with a single command. I will show you later out this command. And then we have the authentication part where we'll again need to connect the, the key to the system and uh, we'll use, well, some graphical interface or the terminal to authenticate. In the case of the free API uh, server, the Agarbelos ticket sorry, will be issued alongside the authentication. Thank you. So what are the technologies involved in this uh, new implementation? On the one side, we have the FIDO2 and WebAuthn for passwordless and multi-factor authentication. Then we have the LDAP server to store and manage the uh, remotely managed users. Then we have the Kerberos part. Uh, well, as I already mentioned, in the free API case, uh, you will get a Kerberos ticket alongside the authentication. And finally, we have the SSSD to manage the client-side authentication. This is, it is in charge of integrating the uh, communication with the FIDO2 device, the LDAP server, and finally, the Kerberos uh, ticket request. If you'd like to know more about this, uh, this implementation, you can check the following three uh, design pages. The first two are, out, are from SSSD, and the last one is from FreeIPA. We divided the SSSD part in two because it's kind of, uh, kind of complex, and in the first part, we spoke about the uh, local passkey authentication, and in the second part, uh, we defined the uh, Kerberos integration. So now let's uh, do the, the demo. Uh, will the uh, people in the audience be able to hear me if, if I sit? No. Okay. So first of all, I will uh, authenticate as an admin here. Okay. Um,
Okay, so I guess we'll have to skip this part. Uh, don't worry. <laughs> yeah, you know what happens here in the demos. Uh, I will be able to show you later with the graphical interface how to do this. So just in case you want to um, to play around with this environment, it uses uh, containers, so it's kind of quite easy to do to to use. Um, the first link here it uh, it's a blog post that I wrote explaining all the steps to do to set up this environment, and in the second link you have uh, the the copper repository where all the packages are are stored. So if you already have some environment with free APA and SSSD, you can just use this uh, copper repository to install the packages. So now let's speak uh, about the future lines. I will also show you how, how, how it works. So this uh, part of the presentation is about all passwordless authentication mechanisms. So currently in the department we are working not just on P2 authentication, but also in external identity providers. So let me show you here. Okay. So I need to redirect the Pidochu key here. Um, so now let's uh, select the Joe user, which is the one that has the pass keys or Pidochu keys assigned. Okay, the first message here has insert your passkey device, then do something. The message is cut. So this is one of the things that we are working on right now with the desktop team to improve. We'd like to show the complete message here, which would be then press enter. Apart from that, you are also, is also able to input some data here, but we aren't expecting anything, and we need to improve this. <laughs> Next, you are requested to enter the pin, which I'm doing right now. And finally, the Fido Chuki uh, LED is blinking. Uh, this means that you need to input your, uh, your fingerprint here. As you can see, we've been able to authenticate locally. Um, but there's a problem here. In the case of the free API case, um, we are also uh, re um, requesting a Kerberos ticket. But what happens if we are offline or the network is down? In that case, we'll be able to do our uh, local authentication, but we'll not get the Kerberos ticket. So we need to uh, notify the user somehow that the user experience might be uh, affected by this uh, lack of the Kerberos ticket. So our idea is to show some message here while authenticating, like this welcome to Nomi 444 message, or maybe uh, show some notification in the notification toolbar. But uh, as I was already mentioning to you, uh, this isn't just about uh, passwordless, uh, this, is just a, this isn't about Fido2 authentication, but about other passwordless methods. And the other method that we are implementing here is external identity providers. In that case, um, the, the workflow for authenticating and authorizing the user is kind of uh, complicated. I will need to show some instructions in the login page, which currently isn't possible. Apart from that, um, the user needs to use a web browser to uh, authenticate. The problem is that, well, it's kind of risky from the security perspective to have a full web browser in the login page because the then some malicious user can go to the computer and start doing some nasty things. So we need to restrict the access to the web pages that the, the user is able to access. So I recorded here uh, the, the part for the Fido2, but I will not show in it. And before I forget, um, we also have some some general uh, requirement here is that we would like, since we are implementing the new workflows in the Nome login, we would like to show the same user experience to them or a similar one when possible. So that's all from, uh, from my side, and now I'd like to hear from you your questions. Something that can be used to, let's say, uh, 
Sorry, sorry can you repeat the last part uh, loudly? So um, the question is that if we, we have enabled some way of uh, do mass enrollment for this uh, FIDO2 authentication, and the answer currently is no. It's a good feedback because, well, we'll have to think about these big organizations where there are thousands of users that would like to authenticate and register. So yeah, it might be a good idea to have some way of uh, doing this mass enrollment automatically. Thank you. Um, it's two-factor in the sense that uh, you have the, the key and you can, you should, well, or you can enter the PIN or the fingerprint to add an additional factor of authentication. But the Kerberos ticket is more related to being able to identify yourself in other uh, network services or applications so that you don't need to sign in more than once when you are on your computer. Okay. Um. I don't know whether you will be tricked or not. Yeah. There is a way to do um, a mass provisioning, but it's not related to all of this work. Uh, if you use any of the um, OLAP services that the um, user by assistance gives you access uh, to positions for these keys, um, then it's just a text entry there. How you produce this text? Thank you. 
contacts on, on, the, on the key simply bear out. From, from user perspective, we did have some provision in, in IP. Uh, what Peter did not say is where you can get this. No. Uh, so this is, in SSSD 290, already in Fedora raw type. You can use it if you have a corresponding IP version, which is not released yet, but it's in the Git master and in the proper wrapper there. So you can install it and play with that. Then you get Kerberos ticket. For the rest, if you store it in some existing LDAP store, like uh, Active Directory or uh, just a normal LDAP server, then you get authentication, but you don't get Kerberos tickets. You have a very good transition into, uh, wouldn't be able to do single sign-on into other network services, or into sudo and other farm services on the same machine. That's another um, but um, even with that, um, it's kind of self-service already. What we need to solve before we can give this to users by default is uh, a bunch of SLINUX-related problems. <laughs> this is no. hardware <laughs> access for uh, an application that runs in the background uh, of your system. Uh, and then you have to access it to enroll, you need to have access to the hardware, you need to give that access to these demons, demon running devices, and so on. So we want to improve on this side uh, of, of it before you stumble. Over it. Better. Better. Thank you. And now, Alexander, you've made my life very difficult because I wouldn't know how to <laughs> summarize everything here that you said. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, any more questions? Uh, 
information that basically makes this key useless to the person who has no idea what to feed for free. This is something that can be enforced by the admins. So I've entered the pin code, now I uh, press or touch this thing and I will feed. And I logged in and now I show that I have a purpose in here for my whole creativity installation. So now I can use this progress if it's for other operations. Um, if I'm offline, like I was when I logged in into this laptop just now, um, I wouldn't get the purpose in here, but I would log in. So this will be offline logging still uh, following the same requirements that admin set. Um, the, um, the thing here is is device differ a lot. And knowing which one works which way is something that administrators and users will, will have to discuss. But this is unfortunately nothing on our side that we could reverse, except improving the user experience. So showing nicer messages, um, showing as much as possible of these uh, hints there, here and there. One hint that we are uh, debating currently is um, how not to leak uh, enough information to attackers who try to understand whether this key works or not before you log in, but still providing enough information to the user that they didn't get to the feedback, for example. They cannot enjoy a single sign-on afterwards. Um, so these kind of things, they actually need, at least in the graphical environments, they need some extensions and some additional work of, uh, of non -tool. For shell login, yeah, we can we can do some crude messaging there uh, already, yeah. but we we'll also want to improve on it and have working with more things. Again, passkey, uh, what they call passkey, uh, we choose to call it passkey as well, just for the sake of yeah, not not focusing on the technical uh, details. Finally, what is important here is this is just one way of get passwordless authentication. You already have smart cards. Smart cards is another network that basically similar to this one, just uh, um, existing for probably like 10 years now. Thanks to you.
Okay, so the first question is related to uh, other protocols that are able, uh, available by YubiKeys like TOTP or HOTP. And if the, the, the requester wants to know if this memorandum is just about FIDO2 or these other protocols. Uh, the question is, the answer is that it's only about FIDO2, nothing about other codes or anything like that. And the second question is about, uh, if I understood it correctly, about using some uh, crypto algorithms, specifically, or? Um, I'm just wondering because, you know, in other areas, the US government is saying soon you will have to use post-quantum algorithms. This doesn't say that. No, th there isn't any reference to, to, to crypto algorithms that I'm aware of, but I guess since, since you are using, uh, since you are working with the US government, you will need to follow their recommendations for crypto algorithms. So even if it's not here, um, the government already requests you to use some specific algorithms.
Hi everyone, welcome to the talk about DevOps for Ansible Lightspeed with IBM Watson Code Assistant. Um, my name is James, James Wong. Um, I'm with Red Hat and before the start, I would like to, uh, so which button? Oh, not this one, sorry. Come on, no? It's, it's live, right? So, um, first of all, I'd like to introduce a little bit about myself. Um, that's my uh, Twitter. And I'm fascinated by two things. Uh, first of all, uh, things of scale. You know, a system that process huge amount of data or request and with a sustained um, performance and all these factors, that's, these things fascinated me. And the second thing is I love automating things. Um, I hate people doing tedious tasks and made mistakes by, because they have to do these kind of boring stuff. And from another aspect, it's also about scale. I love to scale up teams, you know? Once you get rid of all these tedious, boring, easy to make mistake things, the team can move much, much uh, faster. Now, so, okay, so that means I need to raise my voice, all right? Okay, um, is it better? Yeah, all right, cool. So I need to know a little bit about you too, because I need, I need, hopefully I could adjust my presentation a little bit according to the audience here. How many of you are a software developer? You write applications. Okay, good. And any automation engineer? All right, cool. So I see double uh, raising two times. Those people are that loves people, I think. Anyone write Ansible playbooks? Awesome. Anyone write uh, Terraform, uh, Puppet, and things like that, Chef? Yes, okay, cool. Any machine learning engineers here? Okay. Any data scientists who tune, train models? All right, cool, nice, okay. Um, so this is the agenda. Uh, I'll try to uh, sh uh, uh, share a little bit what is Lightspeed, and then we're gonna go through a little bit high level architecture, and then we're gonna talk about the platform that runs the service, and then the pipeline that we built to um, carry out the, from PR all the way to production. And then lastly, we're gonna talk about lessons learned, some highlights, and then if, hopefully we have time for Q&A. Make sense? Yeah? Thanks. Um, disclaimers. We try to focus on the engineering perspectives here, uh, and only on the stack that is serving the forthcoming free technical preview, all right? So anything I said about future architecture changes, product updates, feature launches, do not trust me, all right? Here, what is Ansible Lightspeed with IBM Watson Code Assistant? It is two things. One is the Ansible Lightspeed, and the other one is IBM Watson Code Assistant. Combining two, it's an AI service, and we do two things. One is to help users, like all our automation engineers, to build automation code with consistency and with quality. And then the second thing, uh, not obvious, but actually very important. We try to do content matching, meaning we try to credit those who contribute all these code to um, where the mo which this model has been trained on. So what I'm gonna do is a quick demo to show you the two functions that this Ansible Lightspeed is doing. And then what you will need is a VS Code and a, the Ansible plugin. Uh, you need a GitHub account, and you also need to sign up for closed beta. Any one of, of you have signed up for the closed beta? Oh, awesome, so you probably know what I'm doing here now already. Um, all right, let's go to the demo. And, and this is a live demo, and I hope, but they won't be able to see me. <laughs> Okay, so that's fine, that's fine, I can stand. Um, so here, this is the Ansible plugin. Um, 
And after you set up the plugin, you go to the settings, you type in light speed, and it will filter out these three options for you. Enable these two, and then also type in the, um, the, the API uh, endpoint here. Then you go here, you're gonna see this Ansible icon here. Click on it, you have a connect button. All right, go through the normal process of going through um, login. It's a GitHub login, authorize it, and then you go back to your VS Code, open up. Now, you see here, it shows me as logged in as James. And then you could take a look at here, you could sign up from here if you are done with it or you don't want it to keep it. Once it's done, now you can actually go to do your um, Ansible Lightspeed uh, code recommendation. So I pre-bake a empty or a template file here. Now, you, if you check your status bar, you're gonna see Ansible is detected, detecting the ammo file. And there is a Lightspeed icon here. And you're gonna see this icon spinning when it's doing the uh, inferencing. So here, a simple task, let's say, I wanna create an AWS S3 bucket called full. Enter it. Sorry, the font? Oh, oh yeah, sure. Better? Uh, don't ask too much. Okay, here, uh, okay, see, okay, now it's already up here. You distract me, <laughs> sorry. Um, so this is, you see the content right here, right? Now the recommend, recommendation comes back. Uh, it's up to the user to accept it or not. If you want to accept it, hit the tap keyboard, uh, key, and then it, it's in now here. Um, so the next one, I kind of vary it a little bit. I, I don't use the call, but use name to bar. I want to show you that this is a language uh, model that could you know, interpret, even though you vary the, the language a little bit. Um, again, see the spinning light speed? Oh, it's very fast. I couldn't even move, move my cursor to it. You accept it, and pay attention to the lower, lower window here. This is a, um, the content matching output here. It shows you um, the, the, the model recommendation is based on these inputs. Uh, from the, the, the three entries here. Now, if I come to the another example here, mount the volume to uh, media shared, and you're gonna pay attention here, you're gonna be changing after I res accept it, okay? Let me tap key, oh, oh, did I miss that? Sorry, let's do one more time. Okay, I accept it, and then you're gonna see this be refreshed. Right, so it changed. If you open them up, they're gonna give you the URL uh, of these content coming, of, coming from. All right, the network's a little bit slow, but you get the idea, All right? So, yep, that's, that's the uh, demo for the Lightspeed itself. All right, I hope you feel useful. And uh, now, you're gonna go through the high-level architecture. I would walk you through through the two workflows that we have just demoed. The first one is the code recommendations. And from the left-hand side, when the user hands on their VS Code, they type the Ansible task description, step zero. You know why it's step zero? Because I forgot to put this step in and I hate to shift the number, so I put the number zero here. It enter the task description, you hit enter, the plugin will send a request to the API endpoint. And this API endpoint, first of all, you would do, it would talk, it would talk to the Redis cache, it would talk to the Postgres database to do some kind of housekeeping work. For example, user validation, for example, rate limiting, because it is gonna be a free service, we wanna make sure everyone have a fair share of usage of the platform, among other things. After the housekeeping where it's done, it will forward the request to a inference service, which is a running IBM Watson runtime, serving the models. From there, it's gonna return you the recommendations, and the API would do some more uh, post-processing work. One of it is anonymizing the input and output, and we're gonna be collecting them into a data, data analysis um, service, uh, we're gonna be using those to analyze the input output and also potentially use them to further retrain the models for better better recommendation. 
And then we return the combination back to the VS Code that you see showing up there. And then it's up to the user to decide to accept it or not. A little bit more on the, this API endpoint for the code recommendations. One of the post-processing we do here is running a service called Ansible Risk Insights. Basically, it's a set of rules that we run it against the recommendation. And then, because we want to make sure the code are consistent, the code have good quality, the Ansible kind of approve it off. And this is, I think this is something that stands out because we have this huge Ansible community. We have this uh, kind of knowledge of how well a Ansible playbook or task should be written uh, to guarantee a, a, a risk level low and also a um, good quality of work here. So now the next workflow is the content matching. Here is after you get back the recommendation, if you should hit tab, accepting the results, it, the VS plugin would talk to the another MP, API endpoints, which is we name it as attributions. It tried to do a, um, the content matching. So it will encode the um, input and output uh, and, and using the encode the key to do a, a hit a elastic search that we built. And that will return what you have seen on the screen that they match the content, you know, attributing or trying to credit um, those uh, who have contributed to these um, codes. Okay, so that's the two workflow here. So basically, you're gonna see, you, you have seen that we have API services, we have model serving behind scene, we have um, database, Elasticsearch, and we have some outside uh, third party services help us with the um, um, event processing and, and, and analysis. Now, coming to the platform. So this is the platform that is running the service. Uh, down below, that is the OpenShift, and it's, it is a managed service running on AWS. We call it Rosa. And then on top of that, we have the Red Hat OpenShift AI. Uh, it's the upstream of this project, of this product is the Open Data Hub. Anyone use Open Data Hub? All right, cool. So um, among other things, um, the one that we are mainly using in this stack is the um, KSurf and uh, it's running the IBM Watson runtime. So because that platform allow us to put in different runtime, um, whichever that match your usage. And then the other component here is a Red Hat Advanced Cluster Security. Um, the first thing we, we want to make sure is that we are running on a secured uh, platform. And this uh, service will scan the cluster for vulnerabilities and send us alerts if they, there are some that's been discovered. And on top of it, we run Ansible Lightspeed there. Uh, why we use these components? Make a good guess, anyone? Why we pick these? Yeah? Because what? Because Red Hat. Because Red Hat. Yes, right? Okay, that, that, can, that can be it, and, but any, any more, any, any others? Okay, so it's really depending on your team. So our team is small, and we want to keep the team lean, and we also want to keep the team focused on building the service. So we look for system components that are managed, that are supported. And we believe that we let people who are good at doing their things, let them do it. Let them do it the best way that they could. And we focus on things that we know better. And then the second is that we want to find something that's hybrid cloud ready. Because today we offer it as a cloud service. We own everything, right? But if later on we decided to have a on-prem offering, you know, some customer may, may want to run the whole stack in their own data center. So we pick the components, you know, try to fit these two criteria. Make sense? No? Yes? <laughs> okay, so now the platform, I want to talk a little bit about the CI CD side of it. So we, the three major components here, the first one is Ansible, and we mainly use Ansible to do the infrastructure creation. 
for example, creating the cluster, creating the VPC, the network, the RDS, Redis cache, we use Ansible to provision those. Um, and then the second component is uh, GitHub Actions. And that is mainly for the CI, um, the PRL check, uh, uh, testing, unit test, uh, t uh, static analysis, things like that. And the last one, it's a very uh, key component in our whole stack is the Red Hat OpenShift GitOps. The upstream of it is the Argo CD. And we enjoy, we love using this Argo CD. It's a one of the components that bridge all these from PR all the way to uh, deployment into the production. So now I would like to talk a little bit on the pipeline. The pipeline would carry out this task from a PR all the way to production. Uh, we try to do this thing. We try to shift as much of the testing to the left as possible. So at the PR stage, we would like to do as much full testing as early as possible. So in a PR stage, we would like to have it's a full stack deployment that is as close to the production as possible. And then we could, and we also want to automate the process to set up this so that at the PR stage, either the developer or the QE engineers, they could already start testing the PR in its whole in, uh, full stack integrity. And then by the time when someone clicks, say, we're going to merge the PR, we are pretty confident, high confident, that the, once this is merged into the main branch, the main branch will still be very production ready. All right? So that's our goal. Here, this is the pipeline at the beginning of the pipeline, the PR check. So for each of the PR, it will go through the regular, normally you would do, unit test, you know, uh, code coverage, um, static analysis. And then it will build, if it passes, it will build the image and push it to Quay. Once it's done, it will trigger a deployment. And this deployment will deploy to the, uh, a dev cluster and it will have the whole stack of what I just show you, the architecture. We have the Lightspeed service, we have Postgres, Redis, and the Watson runtime behind it. And then we can carry out the test. We could do ad hoc testing. You could run your automated test against it. You could use this stack to develop your testing suite as well. And now bring us to the whole pipeline from end to end. The left hand side you see is the PR checks uh, step that we just have talked into a little bit more detail. So once the developers decided, hey, let's merge it, you merge the domain and it will build a release candidates image and push to Quay. When this is done, it will trigger the deployment to the staging cluster. So this staging cluster is almost a mirror to the production cluster. So once it's deployed, we have two set of tests. One is the post deployment testing. So it's the regular test suite, full stack, hitting it. And then the second one is a performance testing. Um, this testing will be aiming to make sure that what has been changed won't change the performance portfolio or, 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 or the nature of the performance of the stack too much or you know, surprisingly. Once these are all passing, then we will deploy to a production environment, the cluster. Again, in the production cluster, we have production uh, testing suite hitting it, and we also would have performance testing hitting it. So some of these are not automated yet. For example, the performance testing, at this moment, we're still doing a manual step carrying out, but we are moving uh, trying to automate as much as possible uh, moving forward. Now, some of the highlights that we have learned, a um, couple of them, uh, a few of them. Uh, the first one is that to automate or not to automate. Uh, the team established uh, at the beginning of this year, and we really have just a few months to productize it. We had a demo during last, uh, I think it was October uh, summit, uh, Red Hat summit. Uh, but that, at that moment, it's really just a demo. And the, for, for the last six months, or less than six months, we try to prioritize it. Um, so uh, for purists, see, you want to automate everything, right? You, want, you don't want to do, like I said, I, I love to automate everything. And you want to keep everything as code, right? 
inf infrastructure, your testing, your process, your deployment, everything in a code. You want to do that. It's lovely. It's great. But pragmatists, they would have to think about something else. They want to make sure that we can make it to the market. Time to market is a pressure. It's a value that, is, that a lot of time trumps you know, something, ideal system you want to create. You would want to have a MVP, minimum viable product created as soon as possible, and then you want to really get it going out and allow people to start testing it and collecting feedback so that you could adjust and you could pivot. So what happened to us is it's really about whether to automate or not. It's about when to do what. So we set our priority. Uh, the first thing we want to focus on our, our effort, uh, engineering effort on automating is those daily operations, those frequent operations. Because these work, it could drag down the team, you know, spend their effort, precious effort on doing daily or frequent. So these are things like, for example, the testing framework, uh, the PR checks, the deployment mechanisms. So these things we want to automate um, as soon as possible. And then the second uh, priority is, in the priority list, is focusing on the security. For example, secret management, secret rotation, vulnerability monitoring, all these things are also on the top of the priority list. And don't take me wrong, we didn't do this on the first sprint or second sprint, no. We make progress on every sprint. And we, uh, at the same time, creating features, and then we adding all these automations uh, along, the, along the, the sprinting. So there are some other tasks we kind of decided to postpone them. For example, automating the infrastructure creation. So these things are not being done frequently, right? So for example, creating the OpenShift cluster, creating, setting up the VPC or RDS. We don't create them, do them every day or every sprint. So we decided to use manual step to carry them out at the beginning, and we document it. And then once we have the documented list, uh, we, so for example, you see we have multiple clusters. Then we will allow different team members to go through the manual steps to validate that that step works. And these documents are useful because when later on you actually want to carry out your automation, that steps, those playbooks, many playbooks, it's what you're going to be targeting at to automating them. And what we are aiming at is try to get to the state of a thermal production. We want to come to a state that we want to uh, click button, create a cluster, and deploy all these components, and then the service. And then we could throw away uh, the other cluster if you think that is too, uh, we're already done with it, we already, or we want to exercise DR, all these things like that. Or we want to carry out a blue green deployment up to the top level of the whole architect system architecture. Now, the second lesson I would like to talk about is about the machine learning service. So the model testing, it's, it's quite different from regular application development. I have done, I've helped teams to, um, uh, to uh, move their whole pipeline to continuous deployment. That is when user, when engineer click the merge of the PR, it will all the way go through the staging test, uh, deployment uh, testing, and then if testing all good, it will automatically be deployed to production and serving the end users. I've done that before. But machine learning, it's quite different. Um, the testing of it, it's quite, it's fuzzy. There's not easy to say black and white. Oh, this testing came back to be positive, and that's good. Now let's move on to production right away. Because a lot of time we figure, we found out that a new model version, it can be one step forward for certain aspects of it. And then it could be two step backward for some other aspects. So we have to make a judgment, hey, is this worth to move forward, to move this to a production or not? So it's not easy to judge by a test suite, or at least not now, you put it this way. It, maybe it's our lacking of understanding the nature and come up with a solid logic to make a decision on it. Um, so the approach we adopt is we have multiple uh, models simultaneously deployed. And then we use feature flags, and we use the deployment model of blue-green canary to do that. So at the beginning, we have only one Argo CD application that have 
every component that you have seen on the architecture in once one uh, application of Argo, C, uh, of Argo CD. But now when we move along the development cycle, we figure this out, we break them up, break it up into multiple applications. So the individual uh, components in its own can be evolved independently and also can be scaled independently. Now also for machine learning service, uh, one thing we learn is, uh, is that we have to identify the clearly uh, work workflows or GPU bound work workflow or a uh, workload or CPU bound. Once you identify that, you could effectively pinning this workload on the corresponding um, compute node types. You know, GPU node is expensive, CPU node is much cheaper, and you want to make sure you're running on them effectively. And you also want to learn a little bit more understanding on the runtime, uh, the GPU batch processing, and the time slicing. You know, how effective, how efficient they are really for you, and whether they match the response time pro uh, profile that you are looking for. And the last one is observability. So it's very important. Um, some people mistake that observability is when you are running a production environment, you want to monitor it. So it's not just for that. During the development testing cycle, you want to have a good observability into your system because that helps you identify bottlenecks, that helps you identify code quality issues. Um, the, the tools that here list is what we are using. We're using for metrics is the Prometheus, Grafana, and Dynatrace is coming. Uh, we're gonna be adopting Dynatrace for that. And uh, for tracing, we use Jaeger, and we actually just recently enabled Jaeger tracing, and it's done by an intern, okay? That's pretty cool. And the, uh, the, for the logs, we use, use CloudWatch for now. Yep, so this is observability. Now, um, any questions? I, I can't, uh, so uh, can, can you, sorry, I, I can't hear exactly. So yeah. when do I, re, do I retrain the models do when you user? When end user modify the playbooks, yeah. do we train a model at that? Yeah. So, um, so as of now, my, so okay, let me make it clear. The model training belongs to the IBM Watson uh, code assistance team. So my, uh, I don't have entire detail into how they carry out that, but my understanding is that they carry out the training on the Galaxy. So when you are doing it yourself, you, you wouldn't be directly or real time in training on that. But we do collect some of the, like I said, those inputs and batch process it and being trained the other, in the other round of the, the training trip. Yeah, does that make sense to you? Yeah. Okay, cool, thanks. Any other questions? No? Uh, how much time we have now? Uh, oh, one more question? Yes. What's the plan for the future? What's the plan for the future? Okay, you are, you're asking me to say something you don't want to trust me. Um, so the, the next step is to open this up. So now it's closed beta, right? You have to sign up. Um, forthcoming, we're gonna have a technology preview. So everyone have with a GitHub ID, you can go in, sign up, and try it. And um, the, then after that, uh, we would, hopefully, we would have a commercial, commercial offering um, that hopefully will pay the bill, right? So, but all these just me talking, all right? And like I said, Potentially, some customers say, I want on-prem, right? I, I want to train on my own data. Like, for example, we have um, Automation Hub, which is the private uh, or the um, a private version for corporations, right, of Galaxy, right? So they want to train the model on their own, you know, data set, their co uh, playbooks. That, that could be, you know, forthcoming. Does that 
help you? Okay, yeah. Oh, sorry, just one more that. So at this moment, you see that the automation, the, the recommendation is on task level, right? So hopefully, we'll come to the point that we could recommend the whole playbooks level, and maybe later on, whole module collection, something like that. Yeah, and, and our product manager is dreaming that one day you tell the system, and then it will come out. You don't even need to touch the playbook. It will just run it for you. That would be awesome, right? But OK, yes, sorry. So, so, so the question is that when we are typing the task description, would, would more detailed input at that help you, uh, help the recommendation engine to perform better, right? So I think yes, uh, but not necessarily yes, because again, like I said, models is still kind of fuzzy in a way. And when you type the task, we do not just submit the task description. We submit the context as well. So for example, the beginning of the overall, the other task, we will submit them as well. So the model would judge from the context and then give you the recommendation. So that's why you, if you try, try, on it, try it, if you have a different context, you might, be, might get back different recommendations. OK? Yep. Thanks. Sorry, I think you first. So the question is, is that uh, do we have statistics about how users are satisfied with the recommendation and how do we compare with Copilot? Um, first of all, I do not have the statistics or, or I do not have it handy. You know, we, we, do, we do have a gauge of the sentiment. We actually allow you to also send back the survey, not just from the, um, the, the code completion. And we do try to um, you know, access that and use that as hopefully as input to the model training team, the data scientists to get them. But I, I do not have that yet. But and versus Copilot is quite different because we also, like I said, you know, we try to make sure the code is up to the quality and consistency for the Ansible you know, best practices. And also we try to attribute to who contribute that, which Copilot doesn't do as far as I know. Okay, any, there's another one, right? Yeah. Yeah, so, 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 so the question is that comparison to Copilot, I think I, I tried that one. And the other one is that enterprise corporations, they have their own roles, right? So is there any chance to, to train on them? I believe so. I could tell you that that's one of the direction we are trying to, to go forward. Um, you will be able to train on your own. But as to details on when, how that can be done, like I said, do not trust me. I, I, and we do want to go to that that way because you want to customize it, you know, for your own. Yeah. So, out of time. That's it. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. If you have question, you can uh, tweet at me or you can talk to me afterwards. Initially, I have a I have a demo for the PR standing up using Argo CD, but I'm out of time. Maybe next time. All right. Thank you.
Okay, so hello, my name is Jan. Hopefully all of you are here for a bug bounty hunting talk. If not, you still have like a minute to leave. Otherwise, this probably will be uh, a bit too boring for you. Uh, nice to see you all, thanks for coming. Uh, this talk, uh, you should expect just like a light begin beginning talk. Uh, we should not dive into like any too technical details. Uh, though feel free to interrupt at any point, feel free to ask any, any questions. Uh, I'm perfectly, perf perfectly fine with saying I don't know, I don't know what you're talking about and we will just continue or I will try to answer to the best of my, best of my abilities. Uh, so yeah, uh, my name is Jan and this will be a bug bounty hunting talk. Feel free to come in guys. Uh, also, if I'm not uh, loud enough for the recording, uh, by the way, hi guys, we're online, then, then just tell me. Uh, right, okay. Yeah. Thanks for the doors, that would be disturbing. All right, so uh, what's in front of us? Uh, first, I would like to give a bit of my background on how did I end up bug bounty hunting. Uh, what uh, things did I manage to maybe do or find? Uh, then I will tell you a bit more about today today uh, things that you do as a bug bounty hunter, where do you do it, how do you do it. Then I will tell a bit more about things that you actually are expected to do and things that you are not expected to do. By the way, maybe just let's start show hands who uh, knows what the bug bounty hunting is. Okay, good. Who is a bug bounty hunter? Okay, that's good as well, so I can say, or was there a raise hand? Okay, 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 sure, sure, that's good, that's good. Uh, and then I will try to give you a bit of a demo, or it won't be a live demo, the technical, uh, technology is failing me today, so unfortunately I cannot do it live, but maybe it's for the better. Uh, first, uh, what's my background? Well, I, oops, and this. <laughs> okay, perfect. What did I do? So I pressed different button and, and things. <laughs> That's a great start. Okay. So let's just start the presentation again. Perfect. Cool. Things break. That's why we can hunt for bugs. So that was <laughs> unplanned demo. All right. Uh, so at the end, I would like to uh, end with a, with a demo, just like to show you uh, practical reports that might be interesting for you. Uh, what's my background? I did some mathematics. I'm trying to, or saying this because you can come from any, any background. It doesn't, doesn't matter what was your original, maybe uh, what, what did you pursue originally. But don't worry, there won't be that many equations. Uh, every equation in slides is bad, as I heard, so let's not go there. I worked for some corporates. I worked for smaller companies. And uh, I also did some uh, forensic analysis, not this type of forensic analysis, rather this type of forensic analysis. So just looking into bits and bytes and try to get some uh, meaning out of them. And uh, right now I'm doing a PhD at Crocs uh, at a different faculty. So if you are confused about where the venue of DEFCONF is, there are two faculties in Brno and the, the other one is, is my alma mater. Um, and I ended up doing bug bounties roughly uh, two years back during, during COVID. And I worked on various programs or companies, so you might recognize GitLab or GitHub. Maybe you don't, you don't recognize this one. I think it's Ivan or some like, different company. Uh, I also find something uh, during COVID uh, in one of the U European Union projects for uh, digital COVID certificates. Uh, there are also programs or companies that uh, do not disclose that they are running bug bounty program and that uh, those programs are considered private. So some of the things that I will be telling you about, I won't be telling uh, precisely in details. Uh, what, what, what's the company, for example. Uh, word of caution, just a disclaimer, I'm not inviting you or giving you the, uh, the right to just like go hack on the internet, of course, like that's up to you and your responsibility, so just so that the lawyers are satisfied. Also, um, everything that I'm saying is on behalf of me and not, not my employer. Uh, right, so bug bounty hunting, founding bugs, founding security issues, vulnerabilities, is it actually ethical? Uh, well, the, the state of the things evolved, but thankfully nowadays, 
there are ways how you can just go hack on someone else's software, meaning that you just like go uh, as, as much as you can, go deep, go wide, try to find issues, try to uh, leak data from, from the website, try to do remote code ex execution or whatever, and still remain ethical. So it's sort of like a win-win situation. You will learn something, you might get uh, or gain some bounties, the companies will eventually get more secure. So that's uh, that's where we are at right now. It wasn't always the case, so I'm quite quite happy about this. Uh, I'm not sure what are your expectations, even like from this talk, but it's like, okay, I want to see whether I should get into bug bounty hunting. I feel like often the misconception is that it's some kind of like a get rich quick scheme that you just like, okay, I'm, I, I know software, right? I will just like sit down and play around and find bugs and some, maybe some RC and suddenly like I, uh, I will make a lot of bugs. So, I would discourage this approach just because like it might take you a few months before you find actually something reasonable uh, that someone else on the other side of the globe will be willing to pay you for uh, even though you two have never met before. Uh, though to sort of start on the more uh, nice side, yes, it is possible to, to make some bucks. And I'm worried to press another button here because I would like to show you, is this, is this the laser, do you know? Let's give it a try. Okay, that's a laser. Cool, cool. So, uh, what are you looking at? This is a GitHub page of Shopify. That's an e-commerce platform that allows you, within like just a few clicks, uh, create your um, e shop and you can sell goods or whatever to to customers. So, a lot of money flows maybe directly through Shopify or indirectly from some from some other other banks that are involved. And I mean, that's a good company, right? They have GitHub, so they must be like a good software-wise. But uh, only as long as not a guy like Augusto shows up and, and just like throughout other project that he's working on, he stumbles upon some repository that maybe he want to use or something. And so he's like looking into the code and suddenly like there's, oh, there's a .n file. And you're looking at the report that he created for Shopify. And so he was going through some, some uh, Shopify's code and suddenly there was that end file. It's like, that's a configuration file, right? So first he was like, I'm not interested in that because I'm looking for the functionalities of the code. But then like, it contains GitHub token. And what's the point of GitHub token? Well, you get read or write access to the repositories, right? So to all the things that I was showing you here, this is one repository, but to other repositories as well. So, just like he stumbled on it maybe as a, uh, just by chance, but it's quite critical, right? Because now you can do backdoor of all Shopify products. It is even authorized because you are using GitHub token, right? So it's like you are not hacking through the software, uh, through the server to, to change the production software. And, and what's the payout? Well, it's 50 grand, right? So like, that's, that, that's a sum that probably people would be willing to switch jobs for and just go hunt bucks. But again, like, uh, especially finding valid GitHub tokens, nowadays it's, 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 I would say, quite rare. GitHub scans for all the code. The tokens nowadays are not just like some random byte strings, but they are also annotated or there's a tag like this is GitHub token or Shopify token something, and so you can just grab for them for every commit. And so finds like these are quite, quite rare. Nonetheless, they still happen, but don't go into bug bounty just, just for the money. However, what I can promise that you will get out of bug bounty hunting uh, is uh, learning or, or knowledge. So uh, I cannot stress this enough. Like this is basically infinite amount of uh, sort of opportunities or possibilities to learn interesting so, uh, things. So if you are into this and you say, yes, please, I want to learn, uh, then Definitely, definitely go go ahead. You can basically go as wide as you want, as deep as you want. If you have like a language that you would like to work on, uh, you can just find a project that is a program uh, listed as a bug bounty program, and you can just spend your time there. And not just you learn, but you, if you find something, you can go then report it and maybe get get a few few bucks out of it. Uh, there was one thing, like what maybe your motivation should be. Now, I don't want to offend anyone, uh, but I, even though we are sort of developer community and there are like, we have points that we feel strong about and we are um, on the same boat, I would still try to convey that f for hackers, the, the intentions are quite different. Uh, I know people, often I want to reinvent the wheel and they want to create new projects and so it's like, ah, yeah, new features like, 
project manager will be happy, customers will be happy, but like that's some kind of bug fix, like I don't care. Like the, the bug shouldn't be there, right? But it's, it's, uh, it doesn't bring anything new. For, for the hacker, that's like precisely where, where we want to look. And it's like if you read documentation and you write as a developer, this endpoint is authenticated, like I don't trust you. I don't care that you, that you want this endpoint to be authenticated. I will just like make few curl calls and, and see whether it actually is. Uh, if you say uh, you cannot enumerate uh, whatever emails through the reset password feature because we are rate limited uh, or it's rate limited, well, have you tried that it's actually rate limited? Maybe you are running through some, uh, uh, some uh, cloud fraud or something and the rate limit breaks in, uh, in the in the path, so uh, just uh, hackers will go and test all the claims that you have, so they basically uh, uh, have this uh, as their motivation. Uh, over, uh, all right, so if you want to go and actually start hacking, uh, hacking ethically, there are a multitude of programs, so there's HackerOne, there's Integrity, but Crowd as well. Maybe another question, is there anyone from a company and that you know that you have a bug bounty program so that Okay, two, cool. So basically, maybe you are using like one of these platforms as a company. Uh, it's basically a game of, of three entities. Me as the hacker, uh, the companies, for example, GitLab or GitHub that are running the program, and the platform itself. The platform is sort of like a, a mediator between those three. Because you can also imagine, and that's a question that I often get, like how do you know that they will actually pay you, right? You, you spend like weeks and weeks, you are finding all those like good vulnerabilities that, that you can exploit, but then you just like leak the information to the company. They fix it and then just like, oh, like we knew about it and, and like we, we won't pay you a thing. Uh, so that's why, or one of the reasons why, why it's good to have the platform as well, because the platform sees the communication between the company and, and the researcher, and they can say, hey, like, you, you are claiming that, that you are not obliged to pay, but we have this in the terms of conditions in the contract with the company that, that you are supposed to pay, and we will, we will make sure. So that's, that's uh, what sort of enables this to actually be, be practical. Also, for the company, it's much easier. They just, like... Uh, I haven't run a program, so I can't like uh, this necessarily go into the details, but I imagine that the company just gives a bulk of money to, to the platform, and the platform then can just like pay to the researchers, uh, so it's uh, it's quite smooth process. Uh, all right, again, if you have any questions, feel free to stop me uh, as, as I go. Uh, so if you go to the platform, you make an account, and you want to uh, go check a program, so what programs do we have? So there are public programs and private programs. The public programs are usually like the, the big players do have them, right? Everyone knows there's a GitLab, GitHub, Facebook, uh, Google, whatever. So it doesn't make sense to hide the fact that they have a program. They are also quite big so that they can manage the program. If you imagine that just like the whole world goes hack uh, on GitLab, it will create so much potential noise for the company to go through. Uh, so. The big players are public, some sm smaller companies are private. The, one of the reasons it's not like they are trying to obscure the fact, but they simply are starting the process. So if you are in a company and you are thinking like, is bug bounty program something for us? Well, there's one way how you can get into just have a private program, just uh, say to the platform, okay, we expect only like few tens of reports because we don't have the manpower to, to go through all of that. Uh, so this is sort of the uh, page for, for the program. There are some statistics, like how many reports have been resolved. This is not really uh, up to date as, as of today. So uh, don't take it as a, as a fact for now, but there are at least 1,000 reports on GitLab. One nice thing, for example, is the uh, response efficiency, because you can imagine that you spend weeks finding bugs, then you report, and then you just sit and wait. And here, you would expect it's probably better than in some open source project that only one person manages, but I can tell you that it can like, take weeks, or, or uh, and now you're sitting on possibly like remote code execution, and just like nothing, nothing happens. So 10 hours for GitLab, that's, like, that's exceptional. Uh, and of course, like we are interested probably also in the, what are the categories and what, what amount you can, uh, amounts you can actually actually get. And so there are low things for just a few hundred bucks. So if you find just like uh, something like, oh, you leak email address here and a few addresses here and slow, nothing that important, that's probably like a low. If you get remote code execution, SQL injection, things like this, it's, that's critical. Uh, that's another, another program. Uh, 
that can be private, for example, but uh, this one was just reducted uh, for the purpose of the talk, and it's, it's GitHub, actually. They also get a good, good response efficiency. Uh, another important part or aspect is the policy. So what actually makes this legal or, or ethical? So as part, of the, as part of the page that you've seen, there is also just a policy, just straight up text, like you can do A and you cannot do B. Uh, I'm not from the USA, but I know about the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, which basically, to my understanding, says like, if it's not yours, don't touch it digitally, like, yeah, like you're not authorized to do so. But GitHub uh, has especially, or the programs do especially say, like you are authorized to do this as long as you follow this policy. Uh, though if you violate, so, sorry, violate certain restrictions, uh, you suddenly go, beyond this policy and it might just mean that, okay, we are interested in the report but we are not paying you anything or we ban you from our program or we ban you completely from the platform or maybe uh, even more severe consequences. The policies differ quite a lot. So this is GitHub, that's quite nice. Like GitHub is a software company, right? So they understand a lot of the things. Uh, PayPal, on the other hand, has something in the policy that can even this uh, sort of make you not want to uh, report to them. You don't have to read the whole thing, but basically they say, if you report to us, you hereby grant PayPal, and not just PayPal, but basically anyone we choose to, like subsidiaries, affiliates, customers, uh, irrevocable right or license to the things that, you, that you've given us, okay? It's non-exclusive, so hopefully it still, is your, it still is yours, but we can publish, distribute, we can sell, offer for sale, and do whatever. And this, like, for, for some researchers, this is like, well, I, I don't want to get into this. Like, I want to just submit a report. I'm not giving you a license to just go sell it suddenly. Uh, and they even explicitly say, like, well, don't submit to us if, if you don't want to. And I can, uh, I can tell you, like, this, this uh, was one of the reasons not to submit to, to PayPal, for example. Uh, so that was sort of on the high level. And uh, now what you can do and cannot do so the next thing, it's the explicit listing of things that you can hack on. So those can be any assets you imagine. Those could be IP address ranges, just like from this range to this IP address, you can hack whatever, you can scan, you can run automatic tools. It can be just the GitHub repository. It can be Android, iOS app. It can be like a hardware product, maybe hardware wallet that, that you can hack. And with those things, like do whatever you want, like green is good, but those are, those are things that like you cannot touch. Maybe the company acquired like a small business, so now you know that it's part of the bigger business, but they are first going internally, trying to fix all the issues that, are, that they are able to, to fix. Uh, and you can really break things, as you can probably imagine, if you like try a remote code execution on a pro production website and, and you, you break everything. Uh, the next thing that's important is, is impact. Maybe you are, like, if you want to contribute to open source, like, people care about, like, typos in documentation, small things, small bug fixes, like, things like these. But for bug bounty hunting, it's like we want something that's actually practical, that there is an impact. Like, if you leak one email, uh, maybe, like, we don't care that email probably exists on the, on the website somewhere or on the internet somewhere as well. But if you leak, uh, like, the whole database or if you have remote code execution, like, yes, we do care. And this differs per program, so it's not like you get a denial of service on GitLab and GitHub will pay you the same or even more. That's, uh, that's what I experienced, like GitLab said, yes, this is high severity, we want this. <laughs> GitHub says, well, oh, denial of service, sorry, we don't care, like, uh, that's, that's not, even, not even low. And so, for example, self cross site scripting, meaning that you can save on the website your JavaScript, but it only affects you. So, for example, it's in your, I don't know, like bio that only you see or something like that. They don't care. It's, it's XSS, that's good, but it's, uh, it's not impactful. impactful. Uh, right. So, uh, again, if you have any questions, feel free to ask. Uh, right now, I would like to get into more specific reports. Uh, unfortunately, the, the ones that I uh, reported are not disclosed, so I cannot go through these, but there is one guy, William Bowling, that uh, does seriously good stuff on HackerOne, and it's all disclosed, so we can just look through the reports, and hopefully you will see as, like, how good of a resource the, the activities are. Um, so 
one thing that I have mentioned is that the platform sort of gamify the whole experience. So right now there, there are things like rank. Okay, for William, for some reason, he doesn't have a rank assigned, but basically you can say like, oh, those are the top 10 hackers in this year, the top 10 hackers on this, on this program. There is some kind of general reputation, like this guy knows what he's doing. There is some impact. So like if he reports, it's really impactful, okay? It's not like just some rubbish that maybe uh, would cause something, but not, not in general. And then there is a signal, like if he says something, it's not noise, like you should go and listen to his stuff. Uh, you can see that uh, Vax, by the way, if, if he ever listens to this, thanks a lot. That's really good research research and the resources. And uh, for him, it just works to, to uh, go direct to GitLab and to specialize on GitLab, because it's not a, not a small feat, right? I'm not sure if you are familiar with Ruby, Go, all the backend stuff you, could, you can deploy different Docker instances and see how all these things interact together. So it makes sense to just like go specify on, on GitLab. Uh, I also said that like you should uh, not go it, uh, for it uh, in it for the money, but you can see that for Wax it, it kind of kind of works nicely. He has several arbitrary file reads. So if you have a server, you have slash etc slash password, you can get it. You have remote code execution, stored cross-site scripting, another remote code execution, another one, another file read, etc. Uh, so that's uh, that's very very good stuff, uh, and we will go through one of uh, one of these. Uh, I suppose all of you are familiar with GitLab. I don't have to explain. You you share code, you version code, you create issues, so you can write some text, you can get the XSS. Uh, that's uh, that's just for the examples. But now remote code execution when removing uh, metadata with exif tool. So who knows what exif tool is? Okay, so. Imagine you have a JPEG, you, you take a picture, and it stores also GPS location, timestamps, what kind of device took this picture, right? If you imagine that you would have access to all the data of all the profile pictures of GitLab, you would know basically the location of like several thousands of people, right? So that's, that would be an issue. So what GitLab does, it take exif tool and run it, uh, run the images through this tool and it strips the metadata. It can strip the GPS location, oh sorry, uh, it can strip the GPS location, it can strip uh, whatever, what the device took the picture. And so what they do, they have a runner, GitLab Workhorse, and whatever you upload for images, at least conceptually, it goes through this tool, it strips the metadata. But there is a clash of like what GitLab uh, expects and what the tool expects. Okay, GitLab just goes, uh, and maybe it would be best if I show you the, the code. So let's see. Okay, so we have something like this. Uh, you upload an image, and it goes to uh, some part of code that asks, is this exif file? So should we run it through the exif tool? Well, there are some regex. That's, that's always good for web bounty hunters if there are regexes. So we just check, is this JPEG, JPEG with E, or TIFF? And if it is, we mark it as, as a, something that we, we should uh, take care of. Uh, the next thing is, uh, the problem where, okay, so GitLab thinks that uh, based on this code that you should go through it, but once you go through exif tool, it doesn't check the extension, but it checks the header of the file, just like reads through bytes and see like what kind of tool it is. And so you might actually end up with a different parser that parses DJVU. And I have no idea what that is, but as a hacker, I don't really have to care. But my point is that I'm able to uh, make this clash of what you expect and what the tool expects. And so you suddenly can feed any file and make it parsed by this kind of parser. And unfortunately, it's possible to get to a state where even though there is some check, so there's maybe, again, some regexes, but the, the JPEG file that will get parsed will suddenly end up being evaluated. So if you've been to any basic 101 uh, faculty course on, on uh, security coding, secure coding principles, like do not write evaluate or system calls or whatever, because suddenly it, they can end up here and the file that Wax has uploaded will get uh, evaluated. And the payload, sort of, the file that he uploads is not that complex. You can just see it down here, so it's just uh, this thing. So you get some metadata, uh, some copyright, whatever, then this is the crucial bit. You escape a new line, suddenly all the checks break, and then you can just run arbitrary parallel. So you just echo vax into slash temp slash vax, so just like a proof of concept. This is, by the way, a very good example of how you can 
prove to them that this indeed works, for example, on GitLab.com. You just create a temporary file, no harm done. You don't touch any ATC password. You don't try to like, oh, like I'm such a good hacker, like I can remove something from the database. No, 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 you just like show them I can run echo, that's it. Like now they know, and now you have a report for, for 20 grand. Uh, the whole sort of steps to reproduce are only those two five. So just download this payload, you create a new snippet on GitLab, you uh, attach the file, you select and upload, and suddenly the file will appear on, on the server. Nothing too complex. There's lots of text to sort of describe, but this is, those are the reports that, that if you want to learn things, just go to hackerone.com slash hacktivity and find these, these reports. Uh, maybe one uh, more that I can show you that's also, so this was a remote code execution, right? So this is, it, that's very good but maybe you can just get arbitrary file read and how this can happen. Uh, again, it was critical, there was some path traversal, traversal, meaning that our input hit some code that can traverse your file system and maybe retrieve file that you weren't expecting uh, the user to, to end up with. Again, serious bounty for that, if you are into that. Uh, actually, one thing that I haven't mentioned, like. The people that read this on the other side are not necessarily like as good as the researchers as you are, right? And so sometimes it's just nice to attach a half a minute video of like what actually can happen. And so thanks to that, we can try to watch this. Basically, again, we have a GitLab. I'll just comment it. So there is some GitLab. Uh, you don't even need to like have access to some special, special project. Uh, you only need two proje projects that you can create yourself. Uh, you create a new issue. So whatever, some issue, and you paste a special payload. So if you know Markdown, this is like a link or attachment A, and it goes to some slash upload slash 1111, and then now we see the path traversal, or at least the, the attempt. So we are jumping into the parent directories. Oh, hey, and now we have the ETC password. That's the, that's the file that we are uh, up to. And this is just like a comment in snippet, right? Like how, how can this have any, any effect? So you save the issue, uh, and now you have the issue, and what you can do with GitLab is you can move issues between projects. So you just say like, oh, this was the wrong project, I want to move it to a different project. So let's see what happens. So you move it to some different Vox project, and suddenly, yeah, it worked. So you have issue, there is a sudden attachment with password, you can download it, and uh, if you view it, that's it's etc password from GitLab.com. Uh, so again, all credits uh, to Wax for, for this very nice find. Uh, is it hard to recreate? Well, you just saw, like, just create projects, add an issue, copy paste this, where you change the file that you are interested in. Uh, this markdown is broken, but just like move the issue to the second project, and that's, that's it, three steps, and, and you have your file. Uh, however, finding the issue is, is, the, is the crucial bit. And, and that's, that's, that's hard, but if you as a company run bug bounty program, you incentivize researchers, hackers all over the world to just like go spend some afternoon or maybe more afternoons because understanding GitLab will take some time, but because, or thanks to it being open source, you can just like, it, it's out there, like you can just go and, and see and try to find issues like this. And, and basically, that's, uh, that's about it. To wrap up, uh, a few things. Okay. So those were the slides for the issues. Uh, what things can you hack on? Well, there is also Internet Bug Bounty program where basically the big players put money into one big bag and then you can pay out for different smaller projects. So if you find something on Rust or Rails or Curl or LibSSH, Nginx or OpenSSL, and not just like the software projects like the ones we know, but for example, Extra, which is a project between uh, different countries in the uh, northern part of Europe, so Estonia, uh, Norway, etc. they are using this as a data exchange layer, so they also run a bug bounty program. And not only these things, but also European Union cares about things like Mastodon or LibreOffice. So you have on integrity, you can just like go hunt, go hunt on these. Uh, Google, of course, they have a whole platform for themselves. 
They can, by the way, support also researchers for uh, just like they give you budget. If they, if they trust you and your knowledge and you say, okay, I'm going to fix this open source project for maybe a few weeks. So that's also another possibility. Uh, I haven't talked much about tools. Like you can imagine, you can do all sorts of analysis. You, you can automate all different things. Uh, one thing that I would stress is like you find a bug. The platform or the program tells, yeah, we fixed it. Well, then you just go and check whether they actually fixed it. This was probably the easiest money that I ever made. I just re-ran one curl command and said, like, no, no, you, you haven't fixed it. And within a few minutes, I get a few hundred bucks more because they just saw that, like, the, their fix was not working and they got this immediate response. Uh, so, yeah, there's a bunch of tools. Uh, no time to spend uh, talk about those. Uh, there are nice resources that you can have a look around. Uh, the activity on HackerOne, there are nice podcasts, critical thinking, zero day, or more, if you are more into cryptography, there is a security cryptography, whatever podcast, very nice one. And I will also suggest one of my friends, which is Mr. Problemo. It's a Czech podcast, not really about bug bounty hunting, but rather about various ways how to think about things. And I think that's related because you sort of have to step out of the regular developer creating issues or features writing code. You want to really understand how things work and interact. And so be careful because there is a user input everywhere and it can get very nasty. It can be quite easy as, as we've seen. And stay safe. Uh, that's basically all from my side. And if you have any, any questions, uh, hit me. And also, we'll stay around in the hallway if you, if you want to discuss. Uh, with that, thanks a lot. Uh, that's it. OK, so the question is, how do the private programs work? They basically work the same way. You have to be invited, so after you report a few things that actually make some sense, they have impact, you will suddenly start receiving emails from HackerOne saying like, yeah, we want you to hack. Interestingly, interestingly you only have like a week to, to actually uh, uh, submit the, the or, or respond to the to that uh, program. And there are various things also, like people just have a like, window of two weeks where you can get like twice the, the payouts for, for the issues, and it differs per the programs. You can also be kicked out of the program if you don't hack on them. OK, any other questions? Yeah, there's a very nice question. What do you do if the company that you found bug in doesn't have any program? Uh, I would say they should have. So as, it, as soon as you do uh, any website or whatever, at least have your email there that you can access. If they don't have, uh, it sort of depends. Like I've been in cases where I found various tokens that, uh, for example, for GitLab, if you find uh, uh, active token, you can just query one a API endpoint and see whether the token works. So sometimes you can like check whether it's a valid find and uh, you get the email address of the one uh, who, to whom the uh, token works. So you can just submit to them directly. Uh, sometimes I just try to just search for security at that company or just like any, any email. Uh, and sometimes you just don't get any response and like that's it, the, the end of story and they, they probably don't care. Yeah, it's sometimes hard. Uh, we have one more minute for questions. So last one. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Nice question. Yeah. Nice question. Thanks. I, I, think I, I think I get it. So basically, how do you start? Do you go through various services? Do you just hunt for one buck? Uh, the one thing that you suggested, just like if you are good with, I don't know, networking or like TLS, just like go try to uh, like go for Nginx and try to see how the code behaves there in, in the areas that you do understand. That's, that's a good start. If you just like don't know, there are Capture the Flex games where you can just like play around and you will get the, uh, get the results or like you will learn more easily because the things are prepared for you to learn more. 
more. Uh, if you know a little bit more and want to find the good stuff, go read the Hectivity reports and then try to recreate them. Uh, and, but it's like, it, it varies. Like for example, I didn't know PHP, but I wanted to just like see what are the bugs in PHP about. And so I was just going through PHP projects and learning PHP and uh, finding things there. Uh, it can take time. It can be like months before you actually find something impactful. Okay, uh, I think it's, we are out of time. I'm not sure whether the chair agrees. If so, then. <laughs> Okay, if you have any more questions, I'll be around. Feel free to ask me. Uh, otherwise, thanks for listening and have a nice rest of DEF CON.
Okay, so I think we can start. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, as you can see, I'm Miroslav Řeznik, if you don't know me. I'm uh, working at Red Hat for the product security compliance and risk team. That's like uh, our way how to try to, you know, concentrate everyone who's doing anything with compliance and especially related to security to one bigger team so we can, you know, talk, cooperate and so on. So, and uh, what I do, I cover the government certifications. So I will explain you what government certifications are about, but I will also talk a little bit about the commercial certifications and other, other stuff. You can see I call this, you know, talk from security to compliance and back. I will explain why, because one thing is like, you know, I, I will try to answer is if compliance really, you know, leads to a better security. And if you have this, you know, security and you are compliant, if you are good or not. So I will try to answer this question and you will see later. Uh, I had a very similar talk, I think like two weeks ago, and uh, after the talk I was told that it's a pretty depressive topic. So if you have sugar, Snickers, whatever, you know, just, you know, pump some sugar into your brain because, you know, it might be no depressive thing, and that's my life, so I'm trying to hide all my gray hair under the cap because compliance is not easy, and you will see it's not easy. Yeah, so... What we will talk about is, the first thing is now, I will try to explain what compliance is and not only what it is, but why we are doing it, because it's important uh, thing to answer. We will talk a little bit about commercial certifications, uh, more about the government certifications, because it's where I live, and then we can stay here for, I was told this is the last talk today, so we can stay here by, I don't know, 10 a.m., sorry, 10, 10 p.m., and we, can, we will have enough you know, to talk about. Uh, then uh, we are in the EU, so there, are, there is some you know, new regulation coming in the European Union, so I will touch that thing too. And especially this is a developers conference, so I expect people are more like this, you know, looking into another you know, practice, how to do things over, you know, the theory. So I will try to give you some, you know, like overview. Okay. More people are coming. Welcome. So I will try to give you more like, you know, these, you know, hints and tips, what to do, how to do things. Like, uh, I think I do this for like eight years now. So I believe I have a pretty, you know, good understanding what needs to be done. And then at the end, I will try to answer this, you know, question. Does compliance lead to better security or not? That's the question. Okay. So first, why we do some compliance, why we do try to comply to some standard. It's in the word, we need to comply to some standard. There are, you know, like different ways how we can look into this. It's like you might be you know, forced by your customers because customers want to see the stamps you have and if you have more stamps, then it's kind of like the you know, competitive advantage over your competition because you have, you know, more stamps there might be legal reasons, especially, you know, like recently you can see there is you know, a lot of like supply chain attacks, uh, vulnerabilities, hacks, whatever, you know, data breaches. Uh, the regulation is getting stricter and stricter, not only in Europe, not only in US, everywhere. So there is, you know, the executive orders by White House for supply chains attacks and so, Compliance is becoming not only like the nice to have, you know, to be able to compete with your competition, but it's basically like the legal requirement. In the past, it was okay to wave, wave it like, hey, do you have FIPS? Uh, you know, we don't have FIPS yet, so okay, we want your product to use. We, we will, you know, wave it. Now, <laughs> it's impossible almost because everyone, you know, cares about compliance and everyone will check that you comply to the standards that are required for procurement and you will even not get to the list, like the, what's, for example, the government list, this is the software you can buy. If you don't have, you know, right, you know, standards, right certi certificates, you will not even get to the list. And the customers, the, especially the government customers, will never ever, you know, like, consider that they can, you know, buy anything from you. So it's important. And of course, you know, as I said, more stamps, it's like, you know, having more Pokemons. Like once, you know, received an email from some, you know, like product manager and he was like, he said like, please, you know, do it like a 
playing a Pokemon, like give us you know as many stamps as possible. So yes, I'm trying you know to collect Pokemons. It's, these are my Pokemons. Okay, so then you have like this you know different certifications. You can take a look on certifications from different angles. One, how you can you know, split it are these you no know, commercial certifications. I will talk a little bit more about these, like the ISO 2700, SOC, PCI DSS, and other things. Then you have this, you know, government security certifications. So we will talk about common criteria. We will talk about FIPS. Uh, we will touch briefly FedRAMP. Then, of course, it's not only about you know security, but you have the other compliance work. Again, we will show something like VPAD, USGV6, maybe more. Then, of course, you can take a look on this from not only this, you know, like commercial versus government certifications, but also like a service or process certifications compared to product certifications where you certify a product. Sometimes it's, you know, com kind of like combined. I will tell you more about this at, you know, FedRAMP because for to have FedRAMP, you need to have FIPS. So even FedRAMP is more like this service oriented certifications or even not certifications like audit then you need to have this product certifications underlying that deployment. So this is for different certifications. And yeah, the talk is, uh, subtitle was, you know, global overview. As I said, compliance is now required everywhere. So these are just, you know, few countries. I would probably be able to fill in this map with all different, you know, acronyms. So. For example, in US or you know, North America, it's usually like FIPS, CC, FedRAMP, uh, in Australia, there is IREP and other regulations. In EU, we will talk more about this with the EU CC, the Cyber Security Act, Cyber Resilience Act. Uh, I could probably also put, like, say, Asia, with, you know, South Korea, I know they, they do CC a lot. And everywhere. So the map will be getting, you know, fuller and fuller over time. And it's becoming, and of course, you can imagine that if, you know, EU is going to do something different to US, do you have to do both? Yes, you probably have to do both. Then, you know, Asia, hey, we have our own standard, you know, you have to do it too. And that's very common that, you know, these standards conflicts in, you know, many ways. So it's going to be interesting and it's becoming worse than ever. So let's, you know, hey. So let's quickly tab, you know, touch, you know, these, you know, commercial certifications. Um, not, you know, expert in these, you know, commercial certifications, but one of the, you know, biggest things uh, recently is the ISO 2700 family. So there are, you know, uh, several standards, the 2701, 2717, 2718. So it's basically an international standard to manage information. Security is the original 2701. And uh, for the 17 and 18, it actually adds something more to this. So it's more about, you know, the cloud service providers. And the 18 adds the privacy and the data privacy uh, to management to the cloud. So it's pretty common almost everywhere. Even, you know, here in Czech Republic, there are several companies who can, you know, do the ISO 2700 for you. So this is one of the, you know, the big commercial, and it's not a product certification, it's more like, you know, this, you know, service slash process certification. Then the SOC, the service organization control, so this is uh, the voluntary one again, more commercial by the American Institute of Certified Public Account Accountants, and they are like the five areas this, you know, SOC is looking into, it's so security, availability, Processing integrity, confidentiality, and privacy. So these are like the five, you know, major, you know, uh, areas with more details. Uh, as I said, I'm not, you know, the commercial guy. So if you would, you know, like to know more about, you know, these certifications, please, you know, reach out to me, and I can, you know, connect you to the right people who has, you know, more understanding of this, you know, kind of, you know, certifications. But I will move to. <laughs> my realm, so you can see I'm now smiling because it's uh, what I know. And as I said, I can talk about this for like weeks and uh, it will not be enough because it's pretty, you know, difficult topic. So I will start uh, with common criteria. 
I really like this one because it's called common. It should be like, as I, you know, there was this, you know, global map. It's like, yeah, we have a common criteria certification, so that means it's going to be common. No, it's not common at all. US is doing something, Europe is doing something, different requirements, uh, the mutual recognition, there are, you know, some issues uh, and so on. So basically, common criteria should be that international standard, the big one, as a framework for the computer security certifications. We are already you now facing some like a division in this, you know, common criteria thing. So I personally call common criteria like, like a split criteria because one thing where the split is, there are so-called two ways of, you know, how to do the certifications. One is the EAL, the Evaluated Assurance Level, kind of like with the, sec with the custom security target. And there's also so-called protection profile based common criteria evaluation. What does it mean? As you can see, I will try to, is this thing, these are these, you know, SFRs and SF SARs, the security functional requirements. So basically for this, you know, evaluated assurance level, you take these, you know, functional requirements. It's like, you know, uh, these, you know, ciphers are used, uh, TLS is used in this, you know, way, uh, secure boot exists uh, and is tested for secure boot, uh, whatever. So these are the SFRs, uh, the SARs are assurance that, for example, you follow the processes that nobody can, you know, go with your badge, you know, get into your building, swipe it, get in into the building, do some coding, commit it, then you release it. So basically the, the EAL is like this custom security target where you, you know, try to pick from a big database of these, you know, SFRs and try to do something that's meaningful based like on the, let's say, uh, thread model, some, you know, like uh, assumptions, you know, how, you know, this, you know, could be, you know, affected and so on. So, and you build your own EAL, certificate, security target. I will talk, I will show you a security target later. But protection profile way is doing it different way. It's basically like a template from these SFRs, for example, for operating systems. And there is like a big list of these, you know, SFRs with, you know, actual testing how these, you know, should be tested. And uh, you have to follow it strictly. That means in this EAL, if, if you realize you don't make one of, you know, these FFRs, if it's not something that would probably, you know, make that government angry, you just, you know, remove it. We don't care about it. It's, it's probably not, you know, that secure. So just, you know, remove it. With protection profile, you need to make that, you know, like 100% pass of what's in the protection profile and what needs to be tested. Basically, what you can do, for example, we do certifications with NIAP, so it's in USA. NIAP only recognizes the protection profile certifications, so if there is, for example, for operating system, there is a protection profile. But for some like other, you know, let's say, you have containers, there is no containers protection profile, so the only option is, you know, to go to Europe, and Europe, in Europe, we still do EAL. Or other option is like, where is even like the virtualization protection profile, but if you don't fulfill it, you go to Europe, and Europe is going to be okay. Yes, don't worry, we can, you know, get you a stamp, even you don't have everything from the protection profile. Then there are, you know, two main documents, or the main document is security target that actually you know, lists how your product you know, fulfills these requirements. I will show you later how this looks like. And then important thing is this you know, target of evaluation. That's basically, you can't certify everything. You need to you know, make that you know, target of evaluations as small as possible because then it's easier to pass the evaluation. For example, the nice example is like there. One friend, you know, told me about one of the, you know, CC certification where it's about, you know, the webcam, some kind of like that remote webcam. And the target of evaluation is like, yes, the webcam is part of the target of evaluation, but it can't be connected to internet. <laughs> that's, you know, it's easier, you know, to certify something that's not an internet, connected on internet, but if it's a webcam, uh, is it useful? I don't think so. So. Basically, when you do you know, a lot of you know, this testing, uh, there is a lot of documentation that has to be written, and uh, basically, this is you know, how common criteria works. 
if you want to do common criteria, first what you need is you are the vendor. You need to hire an accredited lab. That's some you know company that's accredited by the government that they can you know do the testing and then after they you know finish testing, write the documentation, they send it to the certification authority. Uh, from this, you know, like labs, what you can, you know, we can hire AdSec, you can hire Intertech, Acumen, Lightship, these are all, all labs we work with and go summer. Then you have different, you know, national schemes. So that means NIAP, a BSI in Germany. I have a nice story about this one later, Oxys in Italy. And there is this, you know, plan to make this obsolete to some extent and have just like one big European scheme. If it will happen, I don't know. Then, you know, another funny thing I told you about, I call this, you know, certification split criteria. There is some kind of like a common criteria recognition agreement. So you can see these are the certificate authorizing, authorizing, authorizing members and the certificates consuming members. These, these countries, you know, try to recognize these, you know, certificates uh, so you don't have to do it in every single country. Of course, there are buts. Different countries have uh, different requirements on what is, uh, what requirements they have. And also this CCRA is now very limited. I told you about this EAL, so EAL has seven levels. But now you can do, for example, EAL4 plus, you know, floor remediation. And you want it recognized by other country? No, it won't be recognized because the EAL4 will be, for example, recognized in Germany. But in any other country, it will be recognized up to EAL level two. So it basically doesn't matter if you do, you know, this higher, you know, assurance level, because it's not going to be recognized internationally. And trust me, you don't want to do anything that's above EAL2, because well, EAL4 means someone will come, you know, to your side, and they'll be doing this, you know, this, you know, audit, like I told you about the badges. Then they hear, okay, so you have another office? Yeah, we want to visit that, you know, another office. Yeah, in another office. Yeah, you have servers in, Another server room, yeah, we want to see the you know, physical server you ship your software from. So then you can have like, you know, I don't know, five side visits everywhere, especially for companies like Red Hat. We are a global company, we have offices everywhere. And, oh, and then they realize, okay, you have remote people, they are working from home. It's like, no, you can't you know, visit anyone at home because, well, it's impossible. So this happens. And uh, I can show you how do you know where you can find more information? So let's try this way. Yeah, so there is this, you know, common criteria, portal.org. It's the standard, you know, government kind of, a, you know, website. It should be redesigned soon. And basically, if you are interested in, you know, certified products, you just, you know, go to the common criteria portal and you can see it's, you know, uh, split into categories. So, for example, let's go to operating systems, and you will see that they are, you know, different operating systems uh, certified. But for us, we do this, you know, NIAP. I told you, you need to be on some, you know, list. For NIAP, for US, it's called product compliant list. If you are not on this list, you have bad luck. So make sure you, you will get there. And basically this is the same, same one just for, just for US. You can see, for example, RHEL 8.2. If you click on it, you will see the certificate, the security target, that's the document I told you about. Uh, interesting document is this, you know, administrative guide that actually explains how you should configure your product to be in the you know evaluated configuration so it's a target of evaluation again everyone you know tries to limit this to the smallest footprint and do some you know additional hardening and so on so this is how cc looks like and let's let's continue now yeah i can see a lot of you know fips people in this room so there's another standard it's called fips 140-2, now it's 140-3. So it's a Federal Information Processing Standard Publication uh, 140. Uh, now we have this, you know, 140-3 version. It's uh, pretty, you know, recent. Uh, 
formal it's the North American standard, but it has now the ISO, so they try to you know, make it ISO standard. Trust me, it was so difficult to get this you know, ISO standard, the PDF copy. It took us you know, several months to get a copy. It was probably better when it wasn't standard at all. Uh, and this is all about the validation of cryptography. So, Basically, you validate these called, you know, cryptographic modules through this, you know, modules validations, validation program. It's under NIST. It's like a uh, U.S. Metrology Institute kind of thing. I was at one talk, and they told me, or actually, in the talk, that person said, "Hey, we are NIST. We know how to measure steel. We are the guys who measure steels." And then someone, you know, came to us and told us, "Hey, you need to, you know, measure software." So they are like fighting within this, you know, what they should do and how do they should do things. And basically what you certify is not like a product as well, but you certify that, you know, cryptographical, you know, primitives or cipher suits that are in that, in that, uh, for example, library or some hardware module like YubiKey, whatever it is. I will jump to this. One of the, you know, that things that FIPS is slow, it's challenging if you go because of you know, many requirements. Uh, it could be you know, difficult on both engineering side and financial side, so it's definitely not cheap from the you know, like investment perspective. Uh, just you know, to give you how slow FIPS 140-3 is, so in the past, I think like it's, it's mid-June, so in this you know, almost six months, NIST was able to issue only one FIPS 100-3 certificate, and they have another like 146 in the queue. So ba basically, I believe I will retire before you know we will receive all certificates we need. So that's one of you know the challenges there. Then there is a document called security policy that basically you know explains you know how you should use that module in the compliant way. That means you know what you know API you need to use, what uh, algorithms are actually you know approved, and they're, they're tested. And uh, at, in Red Hat, we validate five cryptographic modules. That means OpenSSL, NSS, Kernel Crypto API, GNU TLS, and libgcrypt. And we try to revalidate often. We tried in the past to do it with every minor release, but. Then I told you, like it could be, it, it could take you know one year to receive a certificate, and then the life cycle of the minor release is six months. It, you know, it doesn't make much sense you know to spend money on, on that. And I will tell you more about how slow this thing is, but I have a special offering for you. So if you want you know fast FIPS certificate, talk to me, and I can give you a certificate within a few weeks. I can. And now let's jump to something like that builds on top of it. You can see that we are adding, adding things. There is like this big, big thing for basic any, you know, cloud deployment or cloud service in the US, FedRAMP. FedRAMP is the must that US government will not talk to you and will not, you know, buy your cloud service without having FedRAMP. It's the Federal Risk and Authorization Management Program. So it's a U.S. government program to uh, comply that you know that there is this you know, standardized approach to security assessment authorizations. Continuous monitoring is a big big part of that of cloud products and services. That's basically it. FedRAMP. There are several levels. You can have it you know tailored. You can have FedRAMP medium and FedRAMP high. Basically, my understanding is if you don't have high, it's uh, useless to some extent because everyone wants the highest security. It's always you know, nice you know, to have the highest. Third. Then you know, there is this you know, two ways how to do it. One is like this you know, agency ATO. That means you will you know, find some you know, US government agency, and they will be you know, willing to go through this process with you. Basically, in the end, they, it's going to be approved to, for use in this agency. And if you would like, you know, to use this, you know, or some other, you know, U.S. government agency would like to use your product, they would need to do your 
do own assessment on top of you know that you know this other agency did for you. Then you have this you know another JEP route, this joint joint authorization board. If this you know JEP approves your you know FedRAMP, then e any agency can use it. So it's basically way you know better you know to go go for this you know JEP, but it's you know more difficult. It takes more time and. Uh, so usually, you know, what, what people do, they start with some agency, they try to, you know, to get the process running, uh, get ready, get the agency authorization, and then they go for, for this, you know, jab. Uh, instead of lab, these, you know, companies who do it for you are called 3PAO. It sounds like from Star Wars. It's not C3PAO, but for whatever reason, they liked it. And this is that important part as I said, we are building things on top of each other. FIPS is the requirement. It kind of like makes sense. Like we have a standard for cryptography in US government, so we should you know, use it instead of like, you know, forcing you to do something else that might be again in conflict, you know, with you know, what you do. Oh, I will just you know, quickly scan through this. You know, other certifications, one is the VPAD, it's for accessibility. Uh, mandated for this, you know, Section 508 Rehabilitation Act in the U.S. There is international version, and it's based on WCAG 2.0 standard. Then another thing is like USG v6. It's the testing that your network device or OS, whatever it is, is compliant to IPv6. I believe actually, you know, Czech government also, you know, like ask for IPv6 support, but nobody tests it in the U.S. Yes, they do. They, you need a stamp. Yes, this my product you know, works in IPv6. And now I talked to the lab and they told me, hey, we have actually a new test. Now th there is a testing like it, it works for real in IPv6 only network. So it's going to be fun. <laughs> and yeah, what to expect in you? Yeah, I have a question. Who likes open source in this room? Not that many hands as I expected. <laughs> I'm surprised. I, I'm leaving. <laughs> yeah. So, what's going to happen in Europe? <laughs> no open source. No more. <laughs> Sorry. So, this is you know like just you know some you know newspaper you know titles I you know, was able to get from like last two months. This is the Python Foundation warns EU the Cyber Resilience Act will you know sink open source. Yeah. So, what's going on in Europe? There are two things. The main, main thing is like the EU Cybersecurity Act. Under this, this act, this you know, EU CC, that should be the you know, one standardized uh, scheme for common criteria in Europe. The EU CS is for cloud services. So basically, EU is building own common criteria based schemes. The EU CC is almost approved. The EU CS, it's not yet approved. There was this you know, private. Uh, draft it leaked, and after it leaked, so it caused you know like a lot, lot of you know fuss in the cloud service providers community. So we will see how this will work. But this you know EU Cyber Resilience Act. I really like this subtitle. The road to hell is paved with good intentions. It actually makes perfect sense. You know that what we use in Europe, whatever it is, hardware, network, hardware, device, whatever it is, software is resilient to cybersecurity attacks. But the main problem here is like it puts you know too much liability on especially you know open source projects and how it could you know threaten open source project is that there is extension for non commercial activities. That they, you can say yes, open source it's non commercial, but even like any you know these you know foundations like Python Software Foundation they always you know, need to get some, some money. So the question is like, is it you know, extent or not? So for example, the uh, Python Software Foundation, they say that they might you know, turn off the PyPy repositories in Europe because they can't be accountable for you know, what's in these repositories. They can't be you know, fined. I, even you know, at some you know, point, at some conference, I've seen that if you don't like your CEO, make you know, big, you know, security, you know, breach in your product, and he will, you know, go to jail. That's one of, you know, the proposals. Well, you'll see, you know. So Europe, it's going to be interesting if read about it. 
if you are open source enthusiast, you know, talk to your you know MEPs, your favorite MEPs, and explain them that this can you know pass in this way because it would threaten open source. Yeah, so we are slightly over time now. So I will you know quickly you know show you this you know this is the you know, timeline and we are last talk. So so this is you know how long it can it can take. You can see that you know it could be like year, two years, three years. So basically like all the work that you need to do. One interesting thing about NIAB is like they are super strict. You need to finish within 180 days. If you don't finish within 180 days, you fail your certification. Okay. So yeah, just you know, one last slide before we will go to, to QA is these are the tips I promised you. One thing is like get ready, be prepared, but expect unexpectable. At any time, some you know change in the standard can come. They are pretty frequent standard changes. The standards are strict, but often very subjective to who reads it. So one person can read in way another way. So there's you know one big thing, and of course vulnerabilities. All these standards hate vulnerabilities in the process. For example, for CC and NIAP CC, there is a rule that there can be any known vulnerability at the time the product receives certificate. This is impossible. Like there is always you know some vulnerability somewhere. So yes, and in, and in the window of 30 days. It's almost impossible to make it. Uh, maybe one last tip, and I like this one. Be honest with your lab, with the government. It's usually you know, nice. So one of the replies I got recently when I explained to one of the governor, government guy something, he was like, instead, many vendors are acting like embarrassed teenagers trying to pretend they don't have acne but not by not talking about it. So be transparent, but also be careful because you don't want to know sometimes disclose too much. And yeah. Yeah, so for the answer, does compliance lead to better security? That's no clear answer. It you know, gives you a better culture. It adds complexity. So it could you know, actually cause additional issues. And if you have time, I will show you this you know, research by the Masaryk University. I can see one guy from the Masaryk University here and we can talk about it later. So are certifications useful? Yes. Should you have it? Yes. But you know, be careful. It can you know, take time and it can be expensive. So that's all I have. Any questions? Uh, okay, so the question is like for Europe, is it going to be the process based or more checklist based? It's Europe, so I expect it's going to be more on the you know, process side because Europe really likes processes. So, yeah, US version is more like this, you know, checklist. Like you need to test this, 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 this. If you pass, you are go okay. In Europe, they will, you know, more be interested in going through this, you know, checklist. Uh, usually for Every you know, certification, you need to have some periodic recertification. But the validity of certificates could be for, like, like, like for example, NIAP is two years, uh, FIPS is five years, BSI is five years, so it depends country by country. Okay. Any other question? Okay, so the question is if customers, you know, requires the common criteria certification and if they will use that, you know, how it's, you know, describe how they should use that product. It depends. <laughs> there are customers who care only about, or maybe not customers, like people who care about the stamp. So if it has the stamp, they can, you know, s you can sell to the government and government might be okay with just that stamp. There are customers who will read you know that maybe security target, uh, security policy, letter by letter, and if something is not what they like, they will tell you no, it's not enough for us. Especially this, you know, question is when you know, for example, you have this, you know, certificate on version that has CVEs. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So, 
I have to respond to them that they should use that, you know, certified version. If you know that remark, but you should be secure. So, <laughs> there, there is, yeah, I can't, I can't answer you because it really depends. Yeah, you have to recertify, but again, it takes several months. There will be another set of CVEs. <laughs> so I can see no more questions. So yeah, thank you for listening, and I hope I... <laughs> I hope it wasn't that depressive as it might have.
So hello, uh, I'm Lukáš Doktor uh, from Red Hat, from Vert Team, and today I'd like to talk a bit about bisection and not just for Git. Uh, so first, I'll, uh, I'm not sure like how much familiar are you with Git bisect? Uh, who here is familiar with it? Like half, half. Cool. Uh, that's a great, uh, great beginning. Uh, so I'll do some short uh, introduction for those who are not that familiar with it. Uh, then I'll give you like our usage and things that we were solving and may be reused. I, I'm trying to be really practical here. And then we'll move to places where Git bisect actually didn't work for us and why we actually in the end had to create something new, uh, but pretty much inspired by Git bisect. Um, so bisection, what it is, uh, in short, you, it uses uh, interval halving uh, to quickly find a way where things changed. Uh, in Git terminology, you have a good commit or and uh, a bad commit, and uh, you want to quickly <coughs> find out which which commit in between caused the, uh, caused the issue. So you start in the middle. There is a cut. So you start in the middle, and if the result is same as here, you jump to the right into the middle of the range. Uh, if it's the same as uh, on the bad side, then you jump to the middle into the left. Uh, bear with me. It's not exactly. Great on the picture, but plus minus. Uh, and when you, you you keep jumping until you find two commit apart, where one is good, one is bad, and return the first bad commit. By the way, bad doesn't mean it's bad. It just means it has the same output as this one, uh, uh, as this one, and not as this one. Okay. Uh, very quickly, you uh, on Git, which is a subversion system. I, I mean, I guess you're familiar with that. Uh, you, you can, uh, on a Git repository, start a bisection. Since then, you can tag a certain commit as good, bad, or skipped. Uh, skip is very important. I'll talk on, about it on the next slide. Uh, and once you specify one bad and one good commit, uh, Git bisect will automatically start checking out the commits that it thinks you should check next. Uh, afterwards, you can manually set that, okay, this one is good, this one is bad, and you know, keep jumping until Git is happy and tells you, okay, this is your first bad commit. Alternatively, you can use Git bisect run, uh, which, uh, where you can just hand it over a script or a command line. Uh, it will execute that script on each revision it thinks needs to be checked out. Uh, and based on the return code, it either assumes it's a good result, it's a bad result, there is a skip written code of 125, and everything above 128, including, means a critical failure, which means it interrupts. So don't be scared. Like if, if something interrupts immediately and you don't know why, it's probably because it returned minus one, for example, but because it's above 128. And you need to, you can uh, address the issue and uh, resume the bisection <coughs> from, from there. Uh, afterwards, you can use git bisect lock to see whether it's sensible, because sometimes git can wander off and uh, git lock is uh, useful for that. I mentioned skip is very important. This is because uh, bisection is a fast method to converge, which means, uh, take this example, uh, when you start on this commit and immediately this one fails, you leave out this part and you never touch it, because it was bad, right? You can skip this, never look at it again, uh, which means you jump here and here and return this as to be the first bad commit. In reality, if this was not related failure, it was, for example, a setup issue and not, not a real failure of the real test case, uh, instead what you could do is you can skip the commit. You can say, okay, I wasn't able to test this one commit. Uh, what Git does is it jumps very close, tries that commit if it works, it jumps to the right, you know, to the right, to the left, and finds the first, uh, first bad commit. So it's important, uh, you can use it for, for example, setup issues or for uncertain issues. Like uh, let's say you have a certainty level and you say, okay, I, I'm really not certain whether it's failed or passed. Skip that. Worst case, you can just uh, bisect it again without that. The simple workflow <coughs> looks pretty much like that. We will need that in the second part of the presentation. So you, you start a bisection, you can give it a bad commit and good commit, and then just run a bisection. Where the script can look somehow like this, it could be just a simple wrapper, 
uh, where you don't need to check out the commit because Git does that for you. I mean, automatically you can assume you will always be on the commit that, uh, that you are testing. But what you need to do is, for example, deploy your application. Why? Because uh, Git doesn't know anything about how to deploy your application. So, uh, some people, so sometimes people just forget about this and you can see how easily you can just skip this commit if, if this fails. Unless it's expect expected, then you can just return, for example, one. And then you run your test suite. You don't need to read this uh, slide, just, forgot, uh, just uh, focus on the colors. Uh, the red lines means lines that you manually enter. Yellow lines are uh, the out is the output of by sector, which tells you, okay, I'm now on this commit, I, I have those, those many revisions left to test, etc. So you can see how it's progressing, for example, if it takes too long. And then you have blue output, which uh, is the output of the script. So you can see that I have like, it tries one commit and there is some failure, one commit failure there, I execute actually false and then I execute true. You can perhaps guess what, how it ends up, right? And in the end, what Git, Git tells us, okay, there are only skipped commits left to test. What it means? I had actually skipped commits. I, have a, I had a good commit, then I had a couple of skipped commits, and I had a bad commit. So Git won't test those skipped commits again. Why? Because they are skipped, and it's on you to decide like which out of three, or out of those three commits uh, were uh, the first failure. So pretty useful. Good thing, like note about uh, merge commits. It works. Uh, it descends them pretty well, so you no need to uh, care about that part. Everything works uh, seamlessly. Git bisect log again. No need to read that uh, now, but uh, it just it is there and it's available. Now, if you remember, I mentioned I'm from Red Hat, from Vert team, and actually the project I'm working on is the performance QMU CI, and. Uh, it's called CI, except uh, each build takes eight to 12 hours, which means I cannot really afford running a CI, which means per commit basis. Uh, but I'm faking it pretty well. Nobody actually noticed it uh, because I'm running daily jobs and sometimes weekly jobs. And in case of failure, I just uh, rerun the same test, but with limited set of tests uh, using Git bisect to speed up the, uh, the process. There were three little issues with that, uh, and uh, I solved that in, uh, in the Czech script, and I think you can inspire by it, that's why I'm here. Uh, first problem was, uh, I mentioned performance testing. So it's not a feature testing, which means I don't have like good, bad. I just have one throughput and other throughput. So how to deal with that? You'll see on the next slide. Uh, then reproducibility is an issue. Even though we use usually five uh, samples to, uh, and use the middle one to improve the reliability, it's still not that reliable. So I usually use two out of three modes, but if the reliability is, uh, reliability is under 50%, we can, for example, switch to does it fail in three consequent uh, runs, etc. Helps pretty much uh, and can be in the, uh, implemented on the same place. Uh, second thing we do is uh, related to the good and bad uh, part, because we are actually reusing the already assessed results to further improve uh, the uh, like next assessment. And last but not least, uh, not just with perf testing, but uh, sometimes you may want to plot some uh, some outputs, and it's good to have them sorted according to Git log and not according how it was jumping with with Git bisect. It's pretty simple, but maybe not that obvious, so I'm including it here as well. So this uh, is a part of like slightly simplified part of, of this file from our project. Uh, and it basically shows how we, how we drive the execution. Again, you already seen that uh, on my slides before, except we don't specify the revisions here. We just check out the good revision. Then we run our check script, telling it this will be the good baseline. That's important, you will see uh, how it's treated on the next slide. And the result of this uh, is we get two directories. Like directory one is called good one, directory two is called good two. And in there you would find uh, JSON results uh, with multiple throughputs or you know whatever uh, is currently measured. Then we tell Git that this one was actually good one. 
we check out the bad commit, do the same, except we tell the check script that this will be the bad baseline, and it creates bad one, bad two. Again, with JSON results. Tell the git that this is bad, which means we are ready to start a to run a bisection. We run the bisection, this time telling it, okay, don't just run this, uh, the test, but also uh, check whether they were closer to good or closer to bad. And afterwards, generating a report. So, this is the bisect script. Don't try to, uh, to check which uh, language is it. It's, it's like simplified uh, to fit into slide better. But what we do is we execute run perf, which is the tool we use for <coughs> testing that generates current results using this suffix. And if it's good or bad, which means we're generating the baseline, we simply just run it again with, uh, with the post, uh, suffix of two, generating current result two, and afterwards we just move the results, which means we use the current result and move it to the name good or bad using the same suffix. So all files or, or directories that, that are called current result, we just move them to good one two or bad one two. That's it. So that, that's the baselines, okay. Uh, next, we, ex we run the check part, which means we are not in this branch, so we just skip this one, right? So we still execute the run perf, get the current result one, and then we ex execute a tool called diff perf that understands the uh, directory output, so it, it looks at all directories called good and g and bad and b and creates two groups of results. And it tries to assess whether the current result one is closer to here or closer to there. That was the first implementation. Now we are actually using uh, standard deviations uh, to assess which is more probable, but uh, works the same way. I mean, you can, you can in just inspire by places where, where you, can, uh, you can do that. After, uh, and yeah, the return code is uh, zero or one, closer to good, closer to bad. So that's the first questions, like how, how do we check whether it's good or bad, we just look at which is probable, which is more probable. Is it like more likely to be good or more likely to be bad? Then we execute run perf for the second time. You remember, two out of three mode. Get the return two. If they match, which means we're done. No need to do anything else because two out of three, why would you uh, execute the third one if you already know that two of them are matching? Uh, but if they are not matching, we need to execute run perf for the third time, base our return code on, on this one, because if you already have one good, one bad, the third one cannot have the third state, which means it will be closer to one of those. And afterwards, we move the, return, uh, move the results, but this time, the name will be the index, like a global index, like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, whatever, one million one. And we suffix it with B for bad results and G for good results. This is very important because we need to distinguish which are goods and which are bads and need them sorted uh, for the report. And the suffix is also important because here you may have noticed that I don't look at uh, only for good results but also for anything suffix with G, which means in the next run I will include all those results that were assessed as good. That includes those results that did not originally look like good ones, which means in the next step, even though they previously were assessed as bad ones, can be in the group of good results and further you know, move the good results slightly to, to, to bad results. This worked well for us and significantly improved the bisection unless uh, we had an error at the beginning. If you have error in the beginning, you can just re rerun that, uh, that again, but if, if you don't, as we go, we further improve the like, standard jittery that is like, acceptable for us. And afterwards, we exit based on the return code. In the end, I mentioned we are generating the results. So again, it's very simple. You can either use git log and try to match which commit uh, belongs to which your, of your results. And you know, it's kind of tedious, especially with merge commits where you can like, have those commits like, in a weird order. But you can just stop and think, and you know, if, if you start here, and on good result, you jump to the right, into the middle, so you're not jumping over, 
anything. Uh, and on bad results, you jump to the left. What you can do is you can just take all good results, leave out the bad ones, and let them sort it as they go, like first, fourth, and fifth. Then you take all bad results, leave out the good ones, and because you're jumping to the left, you need to reverse the order, so you, can, you, you, take, you take them in, in reverse order, which means you get third bad, second bad, and then you have the bad result. It's as simple as that, and the result is like, again, no need to understand everything. The main uh, thing you can see here is we are not jumping from left to right, which means we have all those commits that uh, were good, and there are all those commits that were bad. And you, like, four tests, not important uh, for this presentation. I'm just demonstrating that it works and it really like draws the line. So that would be the introduction to Git Bisect and some goodies for you if, if you already are using it. Anyway, where Git Bisect didn't work for us is mainly downstream. And it's mainly because we don't have a Git to bisect over. We just have a list of nightly builds revisions. And it's solvable. I mean, imagine like after two weeks finding out that something is wrong. Sure, you can spawn a job and you know run 14 times to find out that okay, those two, th th this nightly build actually caused the regression. If it's enough, that's good. But we usually we can usually see like for example 20, 30 pack packages that were updated, and sometimes you can guess which one caused it. But sometimes there are so many changes that you can't really say who is responsible for for the failure. So. What we would do is we would just uh, provision the old restore, try to install a package, you know, one by one. Okay, works, doesn't work. In the end, you find out that this is our sentence, so you can rerun it again. Then you find out that uh, you need multiple packages together to actually get this failure, like you need QMU and a libvirt change in order to reproduce. And it's ca quite chaotic. Uh, for years, even before uh, PerfCI, I was looking for a tool, and if you know of any Git, uh, any tool that would allow something similar, like Git bisect, but not on, uh, on Git, I would love to hear about it, but I failed to find one. So I just said, okay, enough. I have to do something about it, and I did that. And by working on it, I mentioned we have usually multiple packages, and they are independent. So I don't need to just uh, bisect whether this uh, package is uh, important, but I also like need the combinations. So I said, it would be nice if I can, you know, bisect over multiple independent access. And, you know, since I'm reinventing the wheel, let's, let's uh, add it as well. And here you can see the usage is pretty much similar. I, I mean, why, why would I reinvent that, right? I just uh, reuse what uh, Git already does. So uh, the command line is similar, except you need to specify all the arguments yourself. We have some uh, helpers, but... Uh, for, for this, let, let's, uh, let's try that. And you can see that this time I used uh, the same commit range and in the previous example, but on top I added two more axes. I said, okay, but we, we changed multiple things, not just uh, the gate revision, but in our CI, we were so brave that we changed revision and you know, some complexity and some uh, test suite, for example. And we change that all simultaneously so we don't know what of those uh, things uh, actually caused uh, the regression. We need to tweak our, uh, our script a bit because Bisector doesn't know anything about Git. I mean, it's an independent project. It uses a list of strings. So uh, you need to check out the commit and skip if it doesn't work. You need, still need to deploy your project. And then you need to run the project, and maybe you want to pass those extra two axes as two extra arguments, right? So let's see how it's going to work. Again, it's no need to read things. It's just read. You need to specify all the commits. That's the only difference. Uh, then you get a summary, which I find pretty nice, because you have multiple axes, so it's not always obvious how things will look like in the end. So you get the summary. Uh, if you are happy with that, you just run the bisection and you can see again some yellow and green uh, and blue uh, outputs that are you know changing changing we have more access so more variants and in the end it will tell you okay first bad commit is this one unfortunately we don't uh, we don't list all the skipped ones uh, to be delivered and it tells you that we ended up in nine steps and the failure was caused only by the access zero 
If you remember, we had three axes, so the first and second axes were useless. They didn't change anything because they don't do anything. Uh, and only the first axis, so the git revision mattered in this example. The looks look slightly different. I can like, compare it here. I just uh, shrink the shells here. So this is the git log. Uh, this is our log. Uh, I mean, you would probably guess why. It's because if you use arbitrary strings, things can be pretty long, and you wouldn't actually guess anything from that. Uh, and second, we use multiple axes, which means uh, you know escaping that, so we understand which revision that was is hard. So we just use serial ID of, I mean, index of uh, of that item and uh, separate it by minuses. So what do we what do we have support currently for? Uh, for the arguments, common separated list. That's pretty simple. We do have a support for Python-like range. Uh, more importantly, like we don't use that, but what we use is the URL thing, which is very simple HTTP parser, but it works well with Koji or Brew if you're familiar with that. Uh, you can just uh, you have a, list, a page where you have all the brew builds and you can say, okay, I'm interested on, or in all revisions between this build and this build and it, it will give you uh, links to the brew builds. And you can easily consume it in your test suite, install, install this, this brew build and you know, use it. So this is the, what we use 90% of the time and the rest of the 10% is the beaker, uh, beaker helper which uh, gives you a distro revision. So we have, uh, if you use Beaker, pro provided you use Beaker, uh, you, you say you have this nightly build, this nightly build, and I want all the builds between because I'm lazy and I don't want to copy and paste the names. Now for variant, uh, for arguments, I already showed you this part, right? We run the, the suite and it, it automatically injected uh, all the access like keep changing the, the values of, of those arguments, like first, second, and third, like the positional arguments. Alternatively, if you don't want to use run and you want to do it manually, you can use uh, bisector args uh, to get all arguments or args with an index uh, of the access you are, uh, ac you are interested in and it will give you the value, the current value. After you check out to a different version, it, it will give you a different value again. Alternatively, if you just need a wrapper, so why would you write for a wrapper? You can use, uh, you use your templating mechanism and you know, use the check run instead. Last but not least, we have uh, the multiple access thing, which is uh, interesting, uh, but I don't think it's uh, the best way, but it's systematical, which means it works for me. Uh, imagine a situation where you have, a, you have actually eight kernel changes, eight liver changes, eight QMA changes, and eight lib BLKIO changes. What a coincidence. Uh, so you know that on index 0000, zero, zero, zero you have uh, the good versions, right? You know that those are tested, so you don't test it. It's like you believe the user. Then you have a bad revision, which is the, the last of combination they actually gave you, right? The seven, 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 seven. So what do you need, uh, ex like what do you need extra, uh, unlike in git bisect, you have multiple axes. So you actually need to know whether the current axis is useful. I mean, whether you, you want to actually bisect it. So to save time, you, you start with all bads, then check out the first axis and say, okay, let's, let's try whether this axis actually affects something. So we'll, in here, you can see that previously 777 was bad. Now, 0777 is good. So there is something happening on the, on the kernel front. So you check out the third one, fifth one, fourth one, and you now know that the fourth one is the first bad, which means the 4777 is bad. We can build on that. So we switch to the axis one, do the same. Again, it's a good one, which means, yes, Libvirt is also like a suspect. So we bisect, uh, bisect Libvirt and find out that yes, we have the first bad uh, uh, on index five. So we can check out the next axis. So like four, five, oh, seven and see nothing changed. It's still bad, which means this axis is actually irrelevant. No matter what you do, I mean, maybe somewhere in the middle it would work. You don't know, but it's likely that if before it worked, and now it doesn't, 
uh, nothing changed. So we can skip this one and not investigate it at all. That's like a slight speed optimization. Then you need to check out the next axis. Uh, and, and again, you're using the first bet, which is in this case zero. Uh, and uh, you find out that the seventh is the first bet here. So what, and the output, because you don't have any further access to investigate, the 4507 is the first combination that is bad. What does it mean? In Git, it's simple. Like, like you get a single commit or multiple commits, provided there's, there are skips. Uh, what it means is that if you use uh, <coughs> kernel libvirt kmu uh, at libblko with 3507, it will work well. 4407, it will work well. 4506, it will work well. But 4507 is the first bad combination, which means first, second, and third, and fourth axis, like the kernel, libvirt, and libblko changes are needed together. Note, uh, when, I was actually, when I actually started with bisector, I used different approach, and this kind of failures were pretty hard to find by the, uh, that way. I mean, they, were, they didn't look that nicely, uh, but all kind of failure worked well. So if your workflow is likely to use all kind of failures, feel free to contact me and we can bring it back. But it was just prolonging the uh, bisection, so I'm, I'm happy with this one because in RCI, this is the only thing we are, uh, we are looking for, for. So the key takeaways are Git bisect is cool. If you're on Git, don't even think about anything else. It's, it's cool. It's, I mean, don't, don't use anything else. Git, Git, Git bisect is fine. Uh, but maybe uh, you can inspire by some of our goodies that, that I provided you here. If you're not on Git, or if you want to, for example, bisect multiple submodules, because they tend to break as well, you may check out our project. We can add the Git provisional so you don't need to specify all the revisions in between. And uh, it can help you with bisecting over multiple arrays, or just simply over things that are not uh, Git revisions, like uh, nightly builds or, uh, or your images. It could survive that, probably. Just know that it's like early beta stage, which is good and bad because you can join and help me and improve the tool. I know that skips are you know, not that well implemented at this point, but uh, in terms of good and bad uh, results, it works pretty stable and we are using it uh, in our uh, pipelines. So, any questions? Yes? This is on you. This is a very simple project. Like it does POSIX like. Like you don't do anything you don't are not supposed to do. What Git bisect does, uh, or oh, oh, sorry, what bisector does is uh, it will just give you okay. Use this string. In our case, it's uh, for example the brew, brew build like link to to that kernel. What you do afterwards is on you, and we are storing information in uh, in hidden files so you can reboot the machine freely if if you want to. So it's on your check script, what, what do you want to do, basically. Okay. And yeah, the question was whether I can reboot the machine and... Okay, I'm mentioning it now. Okay, there was another question there, or no? No, no, one slice. Okay, so green tree. Mm -hmm. and then it goes down again, which should be classified as a problem. So how do you clear up your like, historical results to avoid this? You know, if you ever uh -huh. hear anything, you, will, you might not notice that it went up and then down shortly afterwards. Uh -huh. so how do you clear the history? So first question was uh, whether we store all the information, what was good and bad. Yes, we do, because if you have, for example, sparse access, Sometimes you don't need to test that again because it's still the same. Uh, and besides, we need to uh, show the user the git log. Or git, I'm, I'm keep calling it git log. It's bisect log, but it's the same uh, log. So we are storing that information. 
And second question was, uh, what happens like when we are bisecting uh, uh, like improvement and then following by a regression? Uh, if you uh, if you don't catch it, which means you are here and you are here and you don't you don't see anything, you just don't know anything because it's it's bisection. You you don't test that, right? How would you know that it happened? But if there is like slight imp like if you have uh, if you have certain level certain level and in between there is uh, a spike, then again it's like slightly outside of the scope of this presentation. But what we do is we start the bisection. And this will be actually so unprobable that it will uh, probably be this one. Uh, I mean, we, we were trying to do the skips things, but uh, we haven't had time to do that yet. But so it would be best to skip those, obviously. But uh, we are not doing it at this moment. And one more thing: uh, we previously and sometimes, like we, we have like uh, really oscillating uh, values that, that doesn't that <coughs> the probability doesn't work we just use the near nearest uh, nearest neighbor okay. and so obviously this one will be closer to that one <laughs> but I mean worst case uh, what we usually do I mean that's what, why you have git log or bisect log uh, for because you can see that okay from here it looks some somehow odd so you can rerun with a s shorter range which is what you should probably do with the best Okay, I think there was. Uh, I have a question about the uh, bisect script, uh, skip, uh, a different, uh, uh, how to say, uh, uh, for example, when my test is about the binary, uh, can I skip the uh, docs commits? Uh, because the count docs commits uh, will not uh, cause, will not cause mm -hmm. Uh, like to skip it in a, skip them in advance. Yes, because uh, commits like uh, because you know because you know that okay. So d if I understood the question correctly, uh, you you have uh, uh, some so Git revision right like revisions and you know that some range should be skipped because you know that they can't be tested right. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, with Git bisect you can do that because uh, before you start the bisection and even if you start the bisection you can always use git checkout to check out a certain commit and you can say okay git uh, bisect bad uh, uh, git bisect uh, skip sorry and then you can check out the other one and get, do that the same basically you create a for loop over your uh, your skip commits and uh, after you finish it will again like the git bisect skip the last git bisect skip will uh, let the bisect uh, to check out the commit that will be, uh, should be tested next. Uh, with bisector, unfortunately, uh, not at this moment. So git bisect, yes, we don't at this moment. Feel free to commit, <laughs> commit that. Uh, by the way, we have, uh, it's Python project, so you can just uh, import the project and use it in your project as well if you're interested. You don't need to use the uh, command line. For it or by script. Any other questions? Okay, there. What are some use cases for this apart from log detection? Right? Like, because this, this can be used for other properties as well. Mm -hmm. Yes, I, I thought about multiple like different use cases. Like for example, I to test it I just you know try for example booting the biggest machine with different kind of sizes for of RAM. It behaves nicely. <laughs> uh, so yeah, it, it could be used for some kind of tasks as well. But I mean, you name it. <laughs> yes? I forgot to repeat the questions, I know. <laughs> so yeah, the question was whether it can be used for something else, and yes, there are you know, certain ways, like for example, in tuning, you can, you can uh, search for different arguments, although we are jumping from one axis to another, so it may not be optimal for that case. But again, open source on GitHub, so <laughs> you, can, you can contribute. Contribute that. Like different modes are welcome. Anything else? 
כן.
All right. All right uh, hi, everyone. Sorry about that. We had some uh, technical difficulties. Uh, classic Mac. Uh, but welcome to this talk. Uh, thanks for coming to uh, Security Talk. I know that can be depressing. I'll try my best to keep it lighthearted. But today I have the light and fluffy topic of why I think the internet is broken um, and basically how the modern supply chain has essentially created some of these problems. So just to start with, a little bit about me. I'm from New Zealand, if you can't pick where uh, my accent's from. I live now in the Netherlands. I work in DevRel for a company called GitGuardian, which is based out of Paris. Um, you can find me anywhere under the handles Advocate Mac. I'm also the host of a security podcast. My mum says it's her favorite podcast, and everyone here should subscribe. Uh, it's called The Security Repo. Uh, OK, so I want to start at an obvious place, uh, which is a 1960s cigarette commercial. Um, but this is here, it's from a company called Lucky Strikes, and, and basically what happened is research came out that undisputedly proved what everyone already knew, and that was that cigarettes were bad for you. So what did the cigarette companies do? Well, instead of trying to maybe make a better product, instead of trying to improve it, make it more healthy, they came up with clever marketing slogans. One of it was, it's toasted. And basically, what this implied was that Lucky Strike cigarettes were toasted, therefore they were healthier for you. And you have all these kind of things that they protects you against irritation, and doctors recommend this because it's toasted. Uh, but has anyone here ever tried an untoasted cigarette? Anyone had wet tobacco before? Right? They don't exist. <laughs> A brave hand. <laughs> um, so the, the, the point is, is that saying it's toasted was purely just a distraction away from what it was. Um, and this was repeated in a lot of their campaigns. So what does this have to do with security and the internet? Uh, is, well, basically, we've gotten to a point now where the internet is toasted. We create a whole bunch of marketing to distra distract us from the fact that we're really building everything on something that is quite insecure. And I want to run through really the software supply chain, how that's moved onto the internet, and what this has done to affect security uh, and make everything really quite vulnerable. So the first question is exactly how is, what is an example, a concrete example of how we have created this toasted environment for the internet? And we call it the cloud. Right? Like, what is the cloud? The cloud is essentially a server room, a data. It's exactly how we were doing it before we invented the term the cloud. But it makes it seem more secure. It makes it seem less physical. It doesn't mean, it makes it seem like it's not a server room that people have access to, that cleaners need to come into, that people maintain, that has all your data on it. No, it's the cloud. It's a way of making the internet toasted and really kind of moving away along some of the security concerns that we have and, and really how we build everything. Uh, so what exactly is, you know, this cloud? Um, and it's exactly what it was before we invented it. These are server rooms, these are computers, these are managed by other people. So if we take statements that we often see on uh, security uh, data sheets or on FAQs, they'll say stuff like, we securely store our data in the cloud. But what does this actually mean? Uh, it basically means we outsource security to someone else's computer. Um, that's essentially what this is saying. There's some formatting issues, but uh, hopefully they won't, won't be too bad. Um, but that, that's how it, this is how we've become toasted, right? This is really what we're doing. But now, we're moving everything into the cloud. So yes, for a long time we've been doing web applications, uh, but now we're moving our development environments to the cloud. We're moving our testing environments to the cloud. And maybe you could say that you have some of this as being self-hosted, but it's still remotely accessible. It's still in the cloud. Um, and we're all okay with just kind of pretending that this is actually physical data that we don't even know where it is most of the time, um, but someone else is managing it for us. So a little bit of a, of a, of a brief introduction to hone in my point, and then I want to get into some more concrete examples and stop talking about cigarettes. Um, but if we look at like, the history of the internet, 1965 was when it was first conceived, 1990 was when it started to become mainstream. Most of the security protocols that we build everything on today were invented in this period. So asymmetric encryption, 
the, the, basically the, the fundamentals of, of how we secure everything was built in this period. There is no way that they would have been able to imagine in 1990 how we would use the internet today. Or well, perhaps some people did, um, some visionaries, but I think generally it has exploded to a point much bigger than what we anticipated. And it was in 2008 where this started to become a problem, and this was the first time cloud started to be using mainstream. Uh, Dell tried to a trademark it. Now, they actually failed in that, so they couldn't, but this is kind of really, you could say 2008 was the point where we all started talking about the mystic mystical cloud uh, that we have today. All right, so why does, why does all this matter? Why does it matter that we, we don't really understand what the cloud is? What, what is the big deal? And for me, the big deal is the software supply chain, how we build, deliver, ship, and manage our software. So we're probably familiar with the supply chain in cars, and if you're not familiar with the software supply chain, it's quite relatable in a lot of areas. You have your raw components, so these may be your dependencies, your open source packages, your frameworks, what you build everything on. You have your assembly lines, so now we have you know, our IDEs, our source controlled. We have our testing lines, maybe we're using Jenkins, Circle CI, other pipelines to test it. And then we're doing our shipping and packaging. The reality today is that all of this is gone onto the cloud, it's all remote, it's all interconnected, and it's, and it's really quite confusing. So it's not just the fact that we're storing our applications in this cloud, we're actually putting the whole software supply chain in there, and that has been the biggest gift that we could have given malicious actors uh, and adversaries, because this has completely changed the economic game uh, that they're playing in terms of how to try and attack you. So if we look at uh, Hackonomics 1 and 1, so how do the bad guys operate? So we think of them as hackers in basements, still hoodies on, maybe a few people here. But they're more likely today uh, uh, like organizations, like malicious organizations. They have overheads. They have employees. These employees have sick days and vacation days. They really operate like businesses now. And like all businesses, they have to operate within constraints of risk-reward uh, equations in economics. So we have a victim here. It's going to cost money to try and target that victim, to do reconnaissance on them, to try and fish their employees, to try and do physical security. That's going to cost money. At some point, if their security is good enough, then that might not be worth it, so they will abandon that. And that protected a lot of, especially smaller businesses, uh, from these malicious actors. They, the risk-reward wasn't quite there. But now, with the supply chain all moving into the cloud, with everything based on the internet, we can actually target components in that supply chain. And that means that we can end up with hundreds, potentially thousands of victims by targeting one area which of course means that we can invest much more resources into that. And this is why security and attacks and with how we operate in the internet, with the cloud, it's getting much more sophisticated, much more advanced and much harder to defend against. So if we look at a simplified version of the software supply chain, this is from Salsa, which is a, a project run by Google. And I think for developers, this is pretty understandable. We have a developer here, they write some stuff, we build it, we bring in some dependencies, they get shipped out, and then someone uses it. That all makes sense, and we can extrapolate this to a large company. All parts of this supply chain, because they're all interconnected, because they're available in the cloud, are attackable uh, to this. So what I want to talk, do is I want to run through, I don't have time to explain how everything is attackable. But I want to focus on a couple of points and give real world concrete examples of how these have been attacked um, and, and why. So I'm going to focus on the source, the build, and dependencies. And we'll start here with our dependencies. So we have our application. But the modern application, uh, we, we use a lot of dependencies. Most of our application is written by other people in the open source community. This is really powerful and has enabled us to do things beyond what we could have imagined. So we have our application and then we have our open source dependencies. That makes sense. 
right? But then those dependencies also have dependencies, and those dependencies have dependencies, and I'll stop there because it will get too small, but you get the idea. We could go on for a long time here. In fact, sometimes we can go back to about 30 layers uh, of dependencies that happen. There's another type of dependencies that's really predominant now that we often uh, neglect, and that's our third-party services. So these are also part of our application's dependencies. If we're using Stripe for credit card processing, Algolia for search, Okta to manage our authentication, all of these are part of our application. And all of these ones in particular are interconnected. They, they connect to each other using secrets, um, and they really give that the attackers lots of opportunities to target our organization. Now, this looks quite clear, because I can see these are dependent to this, and these are dependent to that. I can manage with that. But the reality looks much more like this, because we have dependencies that are dependent on each other. We have our third-party services that are also dependent on our open source dependencies. And it's impossible to try and figure out this web of what we call dependency hell. And then we have something that can happen, like this little box down here, as an open source dependencies, let's just call this log4j or log4shell. Um, you know, and then you get downstream effects, effects in some of your dependencies over here, and then your application has this massive vulnerability that you didn't even know you had. You never picked to use that. You never, you never added that into your list. That kind of just appeared there uh, through your dependencies. And that's the reality with uh, dependencies. So, uh, this is a, a statistic. I see, I don't actually know what the actual number is. I see some, or 85, 90, 95. I just picked the biggest number, to be honest. Um, you know, 95% of our code isn't our own. It's written by these dependencies that we have, these open source. Um, uh, but we have this thing called uh, dependency bias, where we trust it. Because we know that as developers, we have some crappy coding practices. I may skip. I have secrets.txt on my desktop. But surely the guys maintaining the open source dependencies, they don't do that. Uh, well, they do. They do. They're human, right? It's not that they're bad. They're just human. And we all make mistakes. So, uh, and this creates a problem because attackers now understand our software more than we do. Because they invest their time into understanding where these vulnerabilities are. So you've probably seen this before. I hate sharing it because it's been shared to death, but it's so good that I can't not. So this is here, like the modern infrastructure. You have all this stuff, and then you have down the bottom here uh, a project some random person in Nebraska has been thanklessly maintaining since 2003. This is so accurate. In fact, that person in Nebraska actually has a name. There's under hundreds of them, but one of them is this guy called Fischel Solman. We like Fischel. He represents a really important part of the open source community uh, that we have. And he has been thanklessly maintaining a really popular open source package for a long time. Uh, that package was called UA Parser. So it's on Node. It does something really simple. It just lets you know what devices your users are, are interacting with your application with, right? So uh, basically, you know, is it mobile or what operating system? So you can see this is a perfect candidate for a dependent, an open source tool, because I don't want to have to write that myself. Fischl's done a great job. Now, if we're looking, we're not silly. We're going to make sure that we have good dependencies in our application. So what do we have? We've got 10 million weekly downloads. That's pretty good. That's a lot. 56 versions, good, good version history, and lots of other things are dependent on it. So here we have an example of there's no way this wouldn't pass a smell test. I would use this in a heartbeat. Uh, but that doesn't mean that it's completely secure uh, because we trust these dependencies more than our own. It's essentially kind of a toasted situation. So, so then what ended up happening? So this got posted on a, Rus a Russian hacker forum. It's basically, hey, I have an account. It's got 7 million uh, installations per week. It's on NPN. There's no 2FA on the account. We can change the password if we want. And this is what it's kind of good for. And this is how much he wants bidding in 1K increments. So you probably figured out who, uh, whose account this is referring to. Um, and this was the, the account for that UA parser. And this is what they added in. They added in some malicious lines. Someone bought access to this account. And they turned this package ma malicious. What was it doing? 
nothing terribly crazy. It was doing some crypto mining, and then they was trying to steal some credentials as well on certain, uh, certain types of users. So this is just one example of how these dependencies can get made malicious. So, so how did this actually happen? Well, Fischel was fished, uh, didn't have 2FA. Two, two he was able to get back the account and is maintaining it again. And I want to stress this is absolutely nothing against, against Fischel because without people like him, this whole thing would fall apart. Um, but it just goes to show how vulnerable we can be to something that uh, really is completely out of our control. Because this is all interconnected, because it so, so quickly, uh, it quickly happens, um, and people are still using the malicious versions of this package uh, even today. Um, there's another one, I won't go into it too much, event stream. This one was a little bit interesting because uh, event stream, uh, again, like popular, had lots of dependencies, passes the smell check. Uh, what ended up happening is, what often happens is that people create these dependencies, these open source projects, uh, because it's functioning of something for them in their work. And then their work may change and it's not. So then they stop maintaining it. So then what often happens is people of the community come in to take over that, which is great. But those members of the community aren't always best intentioned. So in this case, someone came along and said, I'll take over the event stream. It was a long-term maintainer of this project. Um, but little did we all know that that was malicious from the start. He wasn't silly, though. He or she wasn't silly because they knew that if they did something to event stream, too many, people would find out. People would, would, would say that this looks suspicious. So what he did, he or she did, added uh, another dependency called flat map stream. And this is what they turned malicious in the end. So that it was obscured by another layer. Um, so another area here of how our dependencies can, can, can really kind of cause trouble. So uh, I want to move on now from away from dependencies to another fun topic. I want to talk about our source code. Because it used to be that we would write our source code on our laptops, we're tested on our local production, but now our IDEs are increasingly going into the cloud as well, and we're, we've, 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 shifted, we've shifted this whole process, or at least we're in the process of doing cloud IDEs um, and uh, doing our coding with various online AI tools uh, that are terrifying, and, but that's a different talk. Uh, so source code is actually everywhere. A lot of people will think that I have private source code. It's behind authentication. So I don't need to worry about if my source code has credentials or other stuff in it. Source code is extremely leaky. It has a terrible habit of becoming out in public in lots of wonderful and weird ways. Um, tomorrow I'm giving a talk that's going to focus more on source code specifically and all the wacky things that it can do. Uh, but if we just talk about one element of this, for the sake of this talk. I want to talk about GitHub. Because GitHub is something that you could even say to me, GitHub's not part of my software supply chain. My company uses GitLab. We do not use GitHub at all. But your developers do. So even it's part of your supply chain kind of by default, um, which kind of can create quite a bit of a problem because it is a blind spot in your, in your supply chain. So some stats on GitHub. Over a billion commits were made last year. Uh, 94 million active developers last year, according to GitHub, and 85 million new public repositories. This is just public information, so not looking at private stuff. Um, so huge amounts of information are, are, are out there. Um, and with huge amounts of information comes huge amounts of opportunities for adversaries. So the company that I work for, GitGuardian, uh, we're, we specialize in, in detecting secrets. Uh, in source code, amongst other things. But we decided to do a project and scan all of these billion commits. So anything that was made public last year on GitHub, uh, we scanned it for, uh, for credentials. Um, and we'll do a quick quiz to see uh, how many trends. But this is, how, how we did that is the same way attackers do it. And it's not really a supply chain attack. It's more of an abuse because we're not when we're attacking something, we're, we're using it in ways that are unintended. But we can use GitHub in ways that are intended, but still uh, do it for malicious purposes. So this is how many credentials we found on GitHub last year, 10 million secrets, um, just, just in one year. And these are all public. 
And most of these we can validate. So if you leak an AWS key, we'll check with AWS to see if it's a valid key. So these aren't just random high entropy strings. So this is a huge amount of information uh, that is just sitting out there in the cloud that is publicly available. Here's some of the credentials that we found. So uh, data storage, so access to databases. Cloud providers, this is about 2 million cloud provider keys that were active that we found uh, last year in public spaces on, on GitHub. Uh, so this is really quite scary. So how do adversaries, how do we uh, actually find this? Well, we're just using GitHub in an intended way. GitHub has an API, like lots of things have APIs, and anything that has an API, you can potentially abuse it. Maybe not completely misuse it, but change it away. So if you go to this address, anyone can go to this address, it will give you a public ledger of everything that's happening in GitHub right now. Um, and I'm talking about GitHub, but this is for lots and lots of different things when we've moved our supply chain onto the internet. Uh, and what we can do is we can monitor this in real time. So here's all the events that happen on this uh, API, and we can just filter out to come of them. So the public event, this is when a private repository goes public, bringing with it all of its history. So you did something a year ago, and you've committed over it. It's out there in public now. Um, and also the push events. So as an adversary, even if GitHub's not being used by your organization, I can monitor your employees I can try and find if some of them's actually pushed out uh, a secret, uh, and I can use that then against you. So this is particularly scary because this is source code that you didn't even know was out there in public that could potentially contain information about your organization. And there's plenty of attacks that happened for this. I just want to give one example very quickly. Toyota. Toyota has a mobile application called T-Connect. It's kind of important. It can start your car. Um, and to do this, they were working with a contractor. Contractor accidentally made this code public on, on GitHub. I don't know if Toyota uses GitHub or not. I'm just going to pretend that they don't, so that they were completely unaware that this was happening. And anyway, they wouldn't have been aware in any case that this code was public on GitHub. Inside that code were credentials to databases, at adversaries were able to find them, and then gain access to the databases that contained all the information of those customers using T-Connect. And then they were then able to launch phishing campaigns against them and sell that data on to other people. So this is how your supply chain uh, and how the fact that we have everything out there in the internet, in the cloud, uh, can be affected in the, where we were just talking about source code. And there's lots of other ways. I said at the start, source code is really bad at staying uh, private. These are all the companies last year that had their source code involuntarily open sourced, I like to say. Um, and if we take just a look at one of those, Twitch, they had their entire code base leaked publicly on a torrent. We scanned it and found 6,000 secrets inside there, including 194 AWS keys. How did this happen? How did their source code get leaked? For, a, for only, for less than a day, there was a misconfiguration on their Git servers where it allowed public access. Someone found it in that time and downloaded the whole thing. Uh, so just a very simple mistake. But that's what we're dealing with now. Um, and that's the kind of security implications that come with bringing everything onto the internet. OK, so the very last one, I'm running out of time. Um, so we'll, I'll have to go quickly. But the build process, right? This is a now moved into the internet as well, which can create problems. So I want to talk about one of these. This is CodeCov. CodeCov sits in your CI CD pipelines, continuous integration, continuous deployment. It's basically where you test your application. CodeCov was a little app that did something very specific. It tests how much code coverage you have. It tests how much of your application is being tested. So it doesn't do anything critical. Um, not, not that we might think. But what ended up happening? Well, how CodeCov's application was run was via a Docker image. Inside that Docker image, there was a leaked credential. That credential gave access to, I think it was a Microsoft storage bucket that contained code that enabled the attackers to manipulate that code. And they did something uh, quite, quite clever. They turned CodeCov malicious by writing one line of code that said, anytime someone uses CodeCov, I want you to take all of the environment variables, all of the code that they're using, and I want you to send them to me. Um, and so that's what they did. So the attackers were able then to move into different organizations uh, that were using CodeCov. Now, those organizations did nothing wrong by using CodeCov, but now they're part of a breach. 
This is the line of code. It was line 525 of about 2,000, so it was pretty well hidden in there, and just said, send us these environment variables. I don't pick on companies very often that have breaches, but I'll pick on one very quickly. HashiCorp was uh, captured in this. Lots of companies were, but HashiCorp was one of them. HashiCorp creates a product called Vault. It's the best secrets manager on the market. HashiCorp invented the term secret sprawl, and their whole premise of Vault is that with Vault, you never need to put secrets in your repositories. Because of this, the attackers got into their repositories and they had to rotate a bunch of secrets that they left in there. If HashiCorp has secrets in their code repositories, no one has any hope. Uh, and CircleCI is a more recent one. This follows a very similar path. A developer's machine was compromised, a session cookie was stolen, and then basically everyone's secrets were stolen from there. Um, so, you know, it's, the, these things are bad. So that's a little, a little taste of how that build process can, uh, can be compromised. And of course, we could go on further and further. There's plenty more examples, but we're limited by time uh, here today. So, can we make the software supply chain healthy? Can we build a healthy cigarette here? Uh, and the answer is yes. So a lot of doom and gloom, um, but we, we do have options here. We do have options. We don't just have to pretend that it is toasted, but it requires some fundamental shifts in, what, in, in kind of how we operate. So what can we do better? Some of it we're already doing, and I'm kind of, I'm, 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 po I'm positive in the direction. But we need to move away from secrets. A lot of everything and elevation that attackers get is from leaked credentials. So moving away from using API keys, going into centralized trust, using dynamic secrets, uh, better understanding the composition of our software, so things like an SBOM is a really good start. Uh, so we actually get visibility into the dependencies so we, when they do get leaked. Uh, infrastructure should, should, should default to private. One of the things that frustrates me, Hal, is that to make things easier on developers to get started faster, everything is kind of by default open. So uh, Amazon S3 buckets recently changed their policy, but it used to be quite hard to make it private. Uh, so we need to move away from kind of making things just arbitrarily easy and making it more secure. Um, MFA, this is moving in the right direction. GitHub's made good grounds on this. So has NPN and other areas. And Security education needs to be a pillar of developer training. Uh, now, I'm out of time. I, I believe I'm going to, and I, because I want to take some questions, but here are some very quick things that you can do um, if you want to harden your supply chain, if you want to make it more healthy and get away from just toasting it. One thing is that in a lot of supply chain attacks, you don't know that you've been attacked. They sit in there for months, literally months, waiting to do it. Honey pots, and honey tokens are a great way to do this. I have a workshop tomorrow on how to make honey tokens completely uh, yourself. These are really low cost, in fact, probably no cost, and they're basically just a bait for attackers to try and exploit them. So if you want to come to that, it's tomorrow, I think, at 10. Uh, we need to get better at managing secrets. There's lots of levels to this. These are the top level, but I always say that whatever gets you out of hard coding your credentials in Git, let's start there and let's move our way up. Uh, secret scanning, so GG Shield is, uh, is a tool that I'm connected to, so I'm ridiculously biased, so just bear that in mind. But there are other tools that are open source to help you detect secrets. Um, SCA for dependency scanning, plenty of tools out here to software composition analysis to help you analyze vulnerabilities that you have in your dependencies. Uh, so these are things that we can do. These are getting better and better and also some open source uh, tooling to help us start on our S-bombs. And then finally, some other areas, zero trust, added additional layers of, uh, of threat, segment your environments, and lastly, change your mindset to assume that you're gonna be breached. Know that your supply chain is toasted, know that the, in the internet is broken in its current, current form, and when you ch make that mindset, then you can actually start implementing uh, good policies. So I've gone over time, but hopefully I wasn't talking too fast. Uh, but yeah, thank you all, and I'd be happy to take some questions if you, if you have any of them now. Yeah. yeah.
That's a, that's a good question. So I'm always about the fact that uh, uh, we should absolutely, uh, open source should be a job and we should fund it. I think organizations should, should, be, should be funding that and there should be dedication to, to, go, in, to go into there. Uh, so I think that's a good start. Um, getting more of the, the crowdsourcing uh, platforms, places like GitHub have made a start, but I think we should do more on that. But if we can, there's a lot of people that want to work on open source full time that can't because obviously uh, if you live in San Francisco, then it's not going to pay the bills. Um, but uh, there's, I think, we, I think we, we definitely can. If we can improve on that, that's a really worthy investment for security because that means that they can actually focus on uh, doing this. So I'm probably not the answer that you were looking for, but that, that's, I think that's where, I, where I'm kind of passionate is about is trying to get more funding into these areas and make this uh, a really respected uh, job that actually can, can, can pay so that we can. Uh, the whole, it seems crazy to me that all the internet is based on this and, and most of these people are just completely unpaid. Like, it, like everything's so uh, strung to it. Uh, but anyway, a rant for another day. <laughs> Any other questions? Well, thank you all for uh, coming here, and uh, perhaps I'll see you at the, the party later today. Thanks.
We're good to go? Perfect. So, good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. Um, everybody still awake, more or less? Um, let, let's see if we can uh, make this kind of scary enough in terms of failures uh, to keep everybody awake. Um, so the topic is, why is it always DNS, TLS, and bad configs? Which um, hopefully makes sense to everybody who is here. Otherwise, at some point, you might say, ah, yeah, I kind of remember that pattern. Because my, in my mind, how that looks like is, um, I'm not sure if you remember Harry Potter, but there was this scene when McGonagall was asking, like, why is it always the three of you when something happens? And that's pretty much where I see DNS, TLS, and bad config sitting there. And maybe they're just a bit of a side effect when something bad is happening, but that's kind of the common trend that, that you see in IT, that whenever there is an outage or something is broken, it's one of these three is not far, or maybe all of them combined, just like in Harry Potter. So um, I was looking at example for DNS, um, and I took an example from Akamai where they said like, well, we made the DNS bad configuration and everything disappeared. And I'm, I have my own anecdote for that. Um, and I'll ask at the end who recognizes themselves in that. So uh, a while ago at one of my previous jobs, um, we were moving DNS servers. And we were moving, moving I think, back then from Gandhi to AWS. Um, and we had different names. And every domain name has its own set of DNS servers. Um, but I made the stupid mistake and I copied the DNS server of the first entry for all of the DNS servers. And I think the time to live for our DNS servers was 24 hours. So as you can imagine, at first everything works perfectly. And we did that, I think, on Friday evening or Saturday morning. So, <laughs> so, it's, um, so it's kind of like when not much, ha much is happening. And then on Sunday, we woke up and we could basically watch how our stuff was disappearing from the internet once the, the TTL was propagating in terms of DNS. And then we. You can only watch because the TTL is 24 hours. So <coughs> um, then we fixed it and waited for it to reappear. Um, so that was kind of like my story of how DNS can be tricky, especially with the time to live. It's like sometimes you can just helplessly watch um, and don't make stupid copy paste errors. Um, does anybody have a similar story of DNS that they did something similar? OK, couple of hands, yeah. that's. I guess how, how you learn and how stuff happens. Um, and then TLS is another one of these classics. Um, who never had a TLS ex certificate expire on one of their production systems? There's just very few hands going up um, because it's, it's a very a recurring thing. And I could count or have countless examples for where it happened. One of my favorite ones is that Gradle plugins had a TLS, um, well, it, took, it expired, unsurprising, in November 21. And there was this uh, discourse thread around it. And what was funny is that exactly one year later, on November 22, they had the same issue again. <laughs> so that, and, and we'll see what will happen in November of this year. Um, so, so, so maybe there was some learning at some point or or it's, maybe it's just user-driven. I think there was this old um, saying of, about Microsoft that Microsoft doesn't test software. They release it and wait for you to report bugs. And this is kind of like the same thing with DLS. You can basically not monitor it, and you just wait for users uh, to report them. And maybe that's their approach here. And then you have bad configurations. Um, there was the one big Facebook outage where everything disappeared. Um, which was a while ago. And looking at you, most of you look old enough to remember Facebook, because when you talk to students nowadays, nobody uses or knows Facebook anymore, basically. But for the old generation, Facebook is still a thing. And it, it was kind of like a, a big thing when it disappeared. And DNS was kind of like the thing that was seen first that disappeared. But it was, in the end, a bad configuration, where I think they had a health check that was checking something, and that check was wrong. And then it stopped uh, advertising the PGP routes, and then everything just disappeared. And again, it took quite a while to, to fix that. And allegedly, because everything at Facebook is driven by APIs and the Facebook <laughs> platform, um, I think that the legend has it that the access to the server room 
was also controlled by something that depended on that DNS lookup and they, they dropped the, the DNS um, entry basically and allegedly they had to chainsaw their way into the server room to fix it um, but I'm not sure if that is an urban legend or really happened but it, it sounds very believable that bad configurations can have those effects. <coughs> um, the funny thing is Cloudflare is always very good about writing these blog posts and they had a, an explainer about the Facebook outage back then. Um, the funny thing is not so long after they, they had a, their own outage around that where they had, were trying to fix a long running stability thing um, and that took down everything in their network. And uh, the unfortunate thing for them was that they made the change and everything looked good. It's almost like the TTL story, but then they have a couple of core components which they call spine, which serve most traffic, and they triggered a bug that was only there in the spine. So they rolled it out on the smaller regions and everything looked like it was working. And once it hit that spine, like the, the busiest um, the locations, then everything started dropping. And only then did they detect it, roll it back, and fix it and figure that out. Um, so coming back to Harry Potter, um, there is this thing um, that they call the, the Horcrux. And I, I think DNS, TLS, and bad configurations are, are almost like the Horcrux um, of IT. Um, they, the things that are sitting there and we can't live without them, but we also have to live with them to some degree. Um, so how do you take out the Horcrux? Or what was the solution in Harry Potter? Yeah, you basically fight, I don't know, fire with fire, or you had something to, to fight them. And in the, the case of Harry Potter, um, you had this magic tooth uh, from the snake, I think, that you could use. Um, unfortunately, we don't have the magic tooth of snakes. So my, my take is that the, the magic tooth that we have and that we should maybe use more is, or our health checks to fix stuff like that. Um, and I'll, I'll give you a quick overview of of how I think or how my mental model is. We can have a discussion afterwards if you agree or disagree or think it should be done differently. Um, but I think by having health checks, so basically, uh, is this thing up and is it running? Um, and if you structure and combine them the right way, you can actually detect things a lot quicker um, than just waiting on your users. I mean, waiting on your users to shout is also a, a way of alerting, uh, but maybe it's not the way you want to be alerted. Um, so you could structure it in a way that you have some health checks outside of your system to check it from the outside. You have it on the network, and you have it potentially even on the host for health checks. And as you build those and see kind of like where stuff is failing, you can pinpoint the problem relatively quickly and easily. Um, so from outside the network, it's kind of a made up example, but let's say we're hosting on AWS and I put my health check on DigitalOcean so I can check from the outside is, for example, the DNS lookup working? Is the upload, uplink of AWS there or can I even reach that provider from DigitalOcean or some other region? Um, did I configure the firewall correctly on the outside to my application or am I dropping the, the traffic there? Is my load balancer active and serving traffic correctly? Is the service itself running and how is the latency so I can also compare the latency to on the inside of the network? And with these signals, I have a, a decent overview from the outside. It's more like the user's perspective where I can say like stuff is failing or not failing. Doesn't tell me yet so much about the insights. Once I'm, I'm in the network, I could, for example, test across availability zones. Um, that I have in one availability zone so my health check and I then check that the network within the cloud provider is working as expected because sometimes the network drops there um, because whatever router or switch exploded on their side. Um, did I configure the, the firewall correctly on the inside? Um, you could have TLS checks for valid certificates here or on the outside even. Um, I can check if the service is available here and how is the latency. And for example, the last two points in comparison to the previous slide already give you a good indicator. If you can only reach the service on the inside of the provider, then it's probably something to the provider that is causing the issue. Or if the latency here is much lower than on the outside, then it's kind of like an uplink problem potentially. Um, whereas if it's working within the network's provider, then at least you know, is it the cloud provider to the outside or is it in my service? You could also have like the service check on the instance itself so you can check on the instance, can I reach my, my service? 
For example, if you have a proxy in front of it, can I reach the service without the proxy? So maybe the proxy is down. So you can easily pinpoint and see like, oh, my app is fine, but it's not reachable because it's the proxy. And having these checks can pinpoint quite easily where that is. Um, you can again see the latency. Is it like the, the, the latency of the application on localhost fast? So it's a network issue or it's somewhere for, or it's a service issue when the service is slow in general. You could also check, for example, is my database up and did I configure the firewall on the database server correctly that that connection is also working in, the, in terms of health check. Um, so you can check from different angles where stuff is failing and then hopefully figure out quite quickly why things are in the right state or in the wrong state. So one thing I didn't do so far is I didn't introduce myself, um, which I always kept for, uh, for later because I'm, I don't think I'm so important or so interesting. But why am I talking about that? I work for Elastic, the company behind Elasticsearch. We, we have like health checks like that and we also use them a lot internally. And that's kind of like where this entire idea of a talk came from. So how we look at health checks or what we can do is we have a component that can do health checks, which we call Heartbeat, which is the worst name of things in the world because everything is called Heartbeat. And for example, for Linux services, if you call something Heartbeat, you have five other things there called Heartbeat. So we, we, shouldn't, we should have picked a different name, but that's kind of like what we were doing. And here this is showing very simply like how you could have these different checks implemented um, where, for example, I check with ICMP is the, the host available in general. And I just ping it um, every five seconds, for example, with a cron syntax. Um, and I, I run a TCP check against my database to check is MySQL and Postgres reachable. This one is only TCP because it doesn't speak HTTP. Or is my, my status page on my, my website available? And I check that every five seconds to, to see if those are up. And just signals like that are very cheap to run. Like if you do that every five seconds or 30 minutes or whatever, um, you don't need to keep the data for very long, but they do give you a very quick overview of how things behave. Um, I'll show you the thing live um, in a bit. Um, you could make your health checks a bit um, smarter and go deeper. For example, here I have something that where I can add something and I can do a post um, where I actually post whatever data there, and I'm expecting a 200 back, and the next page after that should say is saved. Um, so you can actually simulate flows to some degree and do that. Um, just to show you that um, quickly live, I, do you want to see the code first or the outcome? Code? Yeah, it's, all, it's always code, right? Is that large enough for you to read? Yes, kind of? Um, OK, so um, I kept it very simple. So I'm, I'm taking DEFCON CZ every 10 seconds, um, and I, I want to test that page. I also take the HTTPS page to see is it reachable through HTTPS and is the certificate um, valid. Um, and then it actually turns out um, that this is only a redirect at this point and you're actually being taken to defconf info. Um, and I take that page, wherever my cursor is. Um, I check that every sec 10 seconds. Um, I expect a 200 back here. Um, and you can also, for example, in the body, you can say, it should have Bruno and community conference, uh, but I don't want to have the term promotion on there, otherwise my, my page will fail. And then I, <coughs> sorry. Um, I'm also adding a bit of metadata. Basically, I check, say, like, where I'm, where I'm running this from. Um, and at the, at, the very, at the very bottom, um, I also say where I'm running this from. So this is running on, on my laptop. And we could draw it out on a map. So we could, if you have multiple pinger locations, you could see stuff like that and compare latency and everything. Um, so how does that look like? Is that also large enough for everybody to see? Um, I, so we can actually switch that to the last 15 minutes where this was running and everything worked. Um, we could also switch it to the last, I don't know, two hours or so because then I was trying out stuff and things were failing. So we can also see things failing. Um, these are some of the monitors that I've configured. So for example, we have the HTTP and HTTPS, DEFCON, CZ. 
and they are okay. It also shows me when the DLS certificates are expiring. Um, we also have a dedicated page for that here where you could see um, from this check, we basically picked up the DLS certificate and this one is three days old and this one is 29 days old and it's valid until, well, we have some more months so we don't need to be too worried. But you could then just slap an alert on top of those and get say like 15 days before the, they expire, you get an email and you, you should probably start replacing those if it's not working automatically. In the uptime, um, we could look into one of those here, for example, here. Um, it tells me that this is working so far and it's up and it's running from my philip at defconf cz um, node. Um, we can actually go into the alert, see over time, so at some point I, I changed the name because I think philip at was easier to <laughs> understand than defconf again in the context. You can see how the, the latency for the response times developed over time. I'm not sure why they're spiking a bit here, but it's conference Wi-Fi after all, so I'm positively surprised that it's working so stably. Um, the other thing that you really see here that by default a redirect is considered successful in my tests. So for example, if I change that to expect a 200, my test would fail. Um, I'm not recording the, the body here, but you could also record the, the body, but I mean, the. The 203 bytes uh, of the redirect itself are not super interesting. Um, the one with the body is, well, here I had it misconfigured because I had it without the www dot, which is another redirect that is set up, uh, but I expected the 200 to come back. Um, so you can put it together the, the right way. And if you, I don't know, if we scroll down here, you can see down here, we got a 302 back, but we were expecting a 200, so it was, initially failing and, well, the HTML was basically, this is a redirect um, and it worked as expected in terms of testing um, that it failed here, but then I fixed my test and since then those have all been green and just test as they should. Um, okay. One other thing that is interesting in that context is synthetic monitoring. Um, I guess everybody has seen health checks and is doing health checks one way or another. Um, is anybody doing synthetic monitoring or synthetics one? Okay, so synthetics are, the, the basic idea is you are simulating the browser and you do more action. And then sometimes um, I get the comment that, oh, this is a new fancy name for something that we've been doing for decades, um, or some people have been doing, they just never knew what to call it. Uh, but using or simulating the end user is, is not exactly a new thing, though synthetic monitoring is a concept that as a term, I guess, is not as old. And the way how most people or many people are implementing it is Playwright. Has anybody used Playwright before? It's, um, it's a way, to write JavaScript code basically to, to test your pages. Um, what it looks like is something like this. Um, so you could um, import Playwright and then you say, um, go to whatever page um, and then on that page, click a button or expect there is a, a new to-do element placeholder and then expect, I don't know, what needs to be done um, thing. So you can really simulate the, the user and the idea of synthetic monitoring is basically you don't just want to get a 200 back, but you want to simulate the flow of your users. So if you, let's say you're a web shop and the most important flow in your, in your web shop is somebody puts something into the, the, the cart and then checks out and that's the most important flow. And if you break that, you don't want your users to tell you that you have broken two days ago the, 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 the checkout process, but you want something to continuously run through those main steps to be sure whatever changes, that is still working. So that is kind of like the idea of synthetics, that rather than waiting on your users to shout something is broken, you have the most important flows, you constantly test those like every, bless you, um, every five minutes or so, you test those yourself. So no matter what database is down or what you deploy, that main flow is always working and operational for you. Um, I'll show you that in action in a moment. Um, so you can either write the code to do that and it looks something like this, so you can write that. Many people will say, we don't want to write 
check, click that button and search if there is an ID with that name and extract that value. Um, so there is also a, a way to basically um, record you clicking around in the browser and it will just extract the rules. Um, and there are multiple implementations of doing that. I think Playwright is one of the more active or well-maintained things right now. It's mostly driven by Microsoft, um, but Playwright is quite widely used in that browser simulation testing environment, and you can use that. So I have, without writing much code or anything, I have enabled two monitors. So I, I'm just checking DevConf info um, from two different locations. So I'm running this, this from Germany and the US. And I guess you can already see, I assume the data center where this site is running is in the US because the latency there is much lower than, <coughs> sorry, um, from Europe. Um, and then, I mean, we, we could add, add as many flows as we wanted to. But here um, you see, this is the site tested from these di two different locations. And you can see um, how the, the test looks like. We can actually go to that monitor, see if these were all the iterations um, that we ran on that page. Um, I'm basically only going to the, to the main page and display that right now to keep it very simple. So you could edit the monitor and then you can either upload the script, you can write whatever steps you would want to have in here. Um, so we could also change that to www dot, which is the right one. And then, I don't know, we could go to CZ directly, and then I can run this test. This will take a moment until the test runs through. Um, so you can simulate it right away, and once you're satisfied with the changes you have made, you can save it and then store that. Um, okay, this looks good. Um, I'll update my monitor. Um, the next run will will do that. Um, but I actually wanted to get back in here. Um, you can see basically a screenshot every time we ran this. And what is actually also nice is you can see all the simple steps. So for example, if you have 20 steps in your workflow, it will take a, a screenshot and show you how long did it take to do each one of these steps. And you could do all of this, see all of the steps here. Um, you can also see then in terms of weight of the page, like the DEF CONF page, like what are uh, the dependencies and what are you loading. Um, so how fat is the page? Where did you spend your time? And it also knows the main Google metrics like large content full paint, um, et cetera. So it can extract all of that from the flow that you have shown. Um, and it will tell you um, well the weight and the timing and how long all of that took. Um, so it does make testing, or it takes testing quite a bit further than just like checking if it, the server is returning a 200. Uh, but you can get to the, the outcomes of so to wrap up, um, the two main concepts I think here are the health checks, which are cheap, fast, and give you a good overview. And they don't need a lot of data. So everybody's talking nowadays of observability. Observability is normally quite expensive. I think a rule of thumb that many people have around observability is that 10% of your entire infrastructure cost should go into observability because that's like, full instrumentation and monitoring everything will take that much overhead um, in terms of like storing the data, extracting it, processing it. Health checks in comparison are very small and cheap to run and can give you decent value. They don't normally are very good at telling you why something broke, but they're very much on this classic monitoring side to tell you something is broken and you should take a look at that. And that is kind of like the addition. You can then once you know something is broken, you can look at logs, metrics, traces, whatever other information you have collected. But there's a first step. The health checks are often a good indicator something is wrong and you want to fix something in your system. Um, once you want to go further and you have like these main user flows, flows established that you always want to test that are more complex than just a 200 return, then you could do something like synthetics where you play through the same steps um, also maybe compare it to a week ago, it took one minute to run through this, now it takes um, one and a half minutes. You probably deployed some code that is slower, you have some calls that are, are taking longer. So you can use that for checking your own, so checking correctness, but also checking speed and kind of like drift in development and what has changed over time. Um, 
and that's it. Now it's time for everybody's questions and your own horror stories if you want to. Any questions? Do we support only Playwright? Um, so in, in our product where we have kind of like embedded all of this, yes, we only do support Playwright at now, right now. Though for example, I mean, Elastic is also more of a, a platform. So if you, if you have anything else and that spits out logs, ideally JSON or something like that, you could just throw it in and then build your own visualizations. You won't have like as fancy dashboards that are pre-built because that's kind of like tightly packaged together. Uh, so yeah, we have picked Playwright. What, what were you thinking in terms of alternatives to Playwright? Selenium, Selenium. okay, yes. So I, I think Selenium is kind of like the the first or classic one that started a long time ago. Yes, so, um, I mean, the uh, Playwright is kind of client-side as well, or it can be. So you can, so I ran that in a centralized way from, from a cloud instance, but you can have your own runners wherever you want with Playwright as well. So I think while, while there are some differences between Selenium and Playwright, um, it's I would say a very similar type of tool. It's just like the, the syntax and implementation is, is different. Um, I think Selenium is how old? 10, 15 years at this point? Yeah, which is not too, I mean, it's part of the success that it has survived so long. But I think there are some things that are, I don't know, more cutting edge or hipper around Playwright uh, that change, which is not to dis detract from Selenium. It's, I think, still, I always say it's the, the Jenkins of, of client-side testing. And then people are never sure if to, to take that as a praise or insult around Jenkins, but um, that's a different discussion. <laughs> you also use Jenkins. Well, it's tried and tested, and I can also say from our side, um, getting off of Jenkins is a very big task once you are heavily invested into it, but that's also another discussion. Um, any other comments or questions? What is my favorite Harry Potter movie? <laughs> um, that is slightly unexpected now. I think I, I personally enjoy the later, darker ones more. I feel like there is a very strong progression for people that grew up with them, that the first ones are more like kid-like and the later ones got more adult or darker. And I was maybe a bit too old for them, but so I enjoy the, the later ones more. Yeah? Do we have any stories that, so any, any uncommon stories you mean for testing? How do you clean up statistics from So there, yeah, so that's actually a, a good point. So I, I think there are two components to that as well. So the, the synthetics are more like we simulate the user and we, we gather all their information. We, we do have another component to gather like the, what the end user is doing. It's I think normally called RUM, not the drink, but real-time user monitoring, which is like a JavaScript snippet that is injected into the browser. And then you can basically see what users are doing and there you can kind of like follow their weird behavior and learn what they've been up to, whereas this is much more the proactive monitoring we, where we build some scenario to, to run through it. Did that kind of make sense? Ah, sorry, it was about skewing. Sorry, I, ah, okay. Yeah, so the, the thing about the skewing is um, you should have a, a special header normally or something like that to filter out the data. Also, like when you do the, the flow to, to put it in the shopping cart, that you have a secret parameter that you pass and that is like, this is a test order and it will never hit the system. Uh, I don't think um, we, we had any occurrences where that went wrong, though I've also heard stories where people, yeah, where testing was basically taking down the system or faking, doing lots of fake orders because they, 
they forgot to, or somebody removed the check that this is a test order, um, which is kind of like a classic, but I, I'm not sure there's a, a solution for that, but unle unlike writing, or you can only write a very big comment like, please, this is important, otherwise bad things will happen. Um, but yeah, normally um, you should have a dedicated header or something like that, that your system can figure it out, and then you just filter it out. And what you even might want to do, for example, when, when we often set up like things like that, or for example with Jolokia, like some health checks, um, we would have a rule whenever we ingest even logs that we drop those logs because they're just noise. Um, so, so we normally try to, to have a, a feature flag because you don't want to see the, the logs and traces and anything of those test users anyway. It's, it's just garbage that your system would in, incorporate. Or it depends on how you treat it. Or you could just collect it and then put it in a separate bucket basically and filter it out. But yeah, you want to mark those. Um, I think it, that's also, for example, for tracing and open telemetry, that's also the recommendation to always have a dedicated header. And then you can just filter on the header um, to, to get rid of those. Sorry, I didn't get the question right at first. Anything else, or is it beer o'clock? So, sorry? It's always beer o'clock, yes. Um, it is always beer o'clock. Um, thanks a lot for staying so long. Um, I'll see you at the social event later on. Thank you.